Hello, my dear students. I welcome you all to this I welcome rapid revision series. So, as a part of your rapid revision series, the today's revision series will be about the general medicine, which of which is one of the very very important and scoring subject for your FMG exam. So I will try to revise the entire general medicine in a very crisp manner. And once the revision series is once the revision session is over, I will be also sending you the material or I'll be attaching the PDF under the description section. So I am myself Dr. Rajesh Gubba. So I am the general medicine educator and I have been teaching the FMG graduates since almost 10 years. So with my vast experience on the general medicine, I will try to revise those particular topics which are very very important for your exam. Okay, right. So first and foremost, yes, very good afternoon everyone. First and foremost, yeah, the very important thing uh, to be noticed is about the decision related to the internship on the FMGs, that is foreign medical graduates. So I deeply condemn the decision of the decision makers who has made the internship for two years for the foreign medical graduates. So I am very painful about this particular decision which has been made by the decision makers. So from my side, I urge or I request the decision makers to revise this particular decision of the internship related to the foreign medical graduate student. So having said this, now let me just tell you what are the revision topics which we are about to discuss now. So these are all the topics which I will be revising now. First and foremost, you need to know in the starting of the session, what is that we are about to start the discussion with? Yes, a very good afternoon everyone. Yeah, I will just confine myself only to the important topics itself. And each particular topic that is cardiology, endocrinology, neurology, pulmonology, connective tissue disorders, nephrology and gastroenterology. So I will take like one hour for each chapter. Each chapter I will take one hour. Now, first starting with the cardiology. So, in this revision series, what is very very important that you need to know is, ye humko pata karna, ye pata rehna hai ki, which topics to revise, right? Which topics to emphasize more, that is very very important. So, in the first topic, that is the cardiology, the one which I am about to revise is the following topics in the cardiology. That is the heart failure, cardiomyopathies, heart sounds, jugular venous pulse, cardiac murmurs, arterial pulse, valvular heart diseases, pericardial disorders, hypertension and infective endocarditis. So the first topic for the revision in the general medicine will be related to the cardiology and within the cardiology the first topic will be related to the heart failure. So we will try to revise together. We will try to revise together. Don't worry about the material. Immediately after the session is over, I will attach this PDF in the description section. And you will be having this session even in a recorded format as well. So, having said this brief introduction, let us start about the revision in the cardiology. And that too, the first important topic that is the heart failure. Okay. So now, uh, in the recent uh, exams, you might have observed that the clinical based questions and as well as image based questions have been taken a forward step in the questionnaire. So, I have tried to make out this revision series in a mixed manner like the single liner questions will be there, clinical based questions will be there, image based question will be there and as well as some of the very very important uh, single liners also will be there in this session. So, Taking the entire perspective of how the questions will be asked, I have designed this particular revision series. So having said this, let us start with the first question. Okay. So, right. The first question is, 
a 56 year old man with history of the coronary artery disease and documented ejection fraction of 40% by echocardiography presents for further management. At this visit, the patient denies having shortness of breath, dyspnea on exertion, orthopnea or lower extremity edema. He has never been admitted to the hospital for congestive heart failure. So, Amer according to American Heart Association, this particular patient is in which stage of the heart failure is the question. Right. So, this is the first important clinical question of the revision session. So, the options are stage A, B, C and D. So, I will just wait for 10 seconds if there is anyone to answer the question very quickly. Okay. So, the first answer is by Irfan. So, he says uh, stage A. Right. Now, let us just try to discuss the stages of the heart failure first. In the heart failure, what we need to know is the stages. Now, okay, so we have the mixed answers. Right, great, great. So, some of you have answered it correctly. So, like there are totally four stages of heart failure. So, what are these four stages of heart failure? That is stage A, B, C and as well as D. Now, what is stage A? Stage A is that the individual is at risk of heart failure, but there is no structural disease that is very, very important. Whereas stage B, the individual is at risk of heart failure. The individual is also having structural disease, but there are no clinical features of the heart failure. Stage C is that along with the structural heart disease, the individual will also have the symptoms of the heart failure. Whereas stage D is refractory. It's an advanced stage of the heart failure. So these are the stages of the heart failure. So taking these points into consideration, right? So which particular stage our patient belongs to? So agar aap dekhe to, patient ka kya hai? Like there are no clinical manifestations. Denies the shortness of breath. Kali problem kya hai patient ko? Problem hai ki ejection fraction baut kam hai. Normal ejection fraction kitna hai? 55 to 70 percent. Patient ka ejection fraction kitna hai? 40 percent. And dusra problem hai ki patient ko coronary artery disease hai. Bole to, the patient is having some structural heart disease. Magar symptoms hai kya? Symptoms kuch bhi nahi hai. So when symptoms are not there, only structural disease is there. So this particular patient belongs to stage B of the heart failure. So this is the first important clinical question. Having said this, you need to know some of the single liners. What is the most common cause of the right heart failure? Right. So, is there anyone to answer this question first? Most common cause of the right heart failure. So, most common cause of right heart failure is the left heart failure. Very good, Jinesh. So, the most common cause of right heart failure is the left heart failure. Then, what is the most common cause of the acute core pulmonary? The most common cause of acute core pulmonary, what is this? Most common cause of acute core pulmonary? That is massive pulmonary embolism. That is the most common cause of the acute core pulmonary. Then, dusra question hai ki, most common cause of chronic core pulmonary kya hoga? What will be the answer for this? The most common cause of chronic core pulmonary will be chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. So, etiology wise, this is one very, very important. And next thing you need to know is, how do we classify this heart failure? See, we classify this heart failure based on the ejection fraction. Kaysay classify kar sakte hum? We classify that based on the ejection fraction. So, that is heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. Aur dusra hoga, heart failure with Reduced ejection fraction. Then normal ejection fraction kitna hoga? Normal ejection fraction hai ki 55 to 70 percent. Then preserved ejection fraction bole to kya hai? It is that where there is heart failure but ejection fraction is preserved. That means it is a diastolic heart failure. Then dusra hoga heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. Reduced ejection fraction bole to ejection fraction kam hoga. Kitna hoga? It will be less than 40%. Right? So, this will be your 
systolic heart failure right this will be your systolic heart failure and i will tell you some of the important etiologies fir heart failure with preserved ejection fraction jo hai kis wajah se ho sakta hai right ek hoga hypertrophic cardiomyopathy right one etiology is hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and the other etiology is restrictive cardiomyopathy fir heart failure with reduced ejection fraction kya hoga that will be your dilated cardiomyopathy and even your coronary artery disease तो दीज आर दार्ट फेलियर विथ रेड्यूज डिजेक्शन फ्रैक्शन दूसरा क्वेश्चन है कि आपको लाइक वॉट इज द अर्लीएस्ट मैनिफेस्टेशन ऑफ द हार्ट फेलियर एनी वन ऑफ यू वॉट इज द अर्लीएस्ट मैनिफेस्टेशन ऑफ द लेफ्ट हार्ट फेलियर सो इज देर एनी वन हु कैन आंसर दिस क्वेश्चन अर्लीएस्ट मैनिफेस्टेशन ऑफ लेफ्ट हार्ट फेलियर राइट तो अर्लीएस्ट मैनिफेस्टेशन ऑफ लेफ्ट हार्ट फेलियर होगा लाइक पेशेंट वेन एवर ही इज स्लीपिंग अचानक बीच में लाइक ही गेट्स अप विद दिस नियर तो उसको हम क्या बोल सकते हैं वॉट डू वी कॉल दैट वी कॉल दिस एज पेरोक्सिसमल नॉक्टर्नल डिस्निया तो द अर्लीएस्ट मैनिफेस्टेशन ऑफ लेफ्ट आर्ट फेलियर विल बी पेरोक्सिसमल नॉक्टर्नल डिस्निया राइट एक वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट थिंग इन द वेरी गुड सम ऑफ यू आर आंसरिंग इट करेक्टली आई एप्रिशिएट दैट and the next important thing in the heart failure you need to know is how do we classify the cvrt of dyspnea we classify the cvrt of dyspnea based on nyha that is new york heart association right that is new york heart association classification sir isme questions kya puchega aapko nyha mein kya kya parameters hum we will just look into what are the parameters which we look into in nyha nyha bole to it is not just only for dyspnea nyha bole to right it tells you about the fatigue it tells you about the palpitations it also tells you about the dyspnea so nyha classification ratta marna is very very important very very important because the same question on nyha has been asked even in your recent inict exam as well so class 1 nyha bole to kya hai no limitation of the physical activity agar ordinary physical activity karne ke samay mein patient ko kuch bhi problem nahi rahega but whenever the individual does the same activity on exertion exertional activity karne ke samay mein the individual will have the dyspnea फिर क्लास टू क्या होगा स्लाइट लिमिटेशन ऑफ द फिजिकल एक्टिविटी अदरवाइज द पेशेंट इज कंफर्टेबल एट रेस्ट बट डूइंग ऑर्डिनरी एक्टिविटी द इंडिविजुअल विल हैव फटीक पैल्पिटेशन एंड डिस्मी फिर क्लास थ्री क्या होगा क्लास थ्री होगा लेस देन ऑर्डिनरी एक्टिविटी राइट क्लास थ्री होगा लेस देन ऑर्डिनरी एक्टिविटी so on doing less than ordinary activity agar symptoms develop hoa patients ko then it is called class 3 nyha then class 4 nyha kya hai the individual will have symptoms at rest kuch bhi nahi kar sakte patient class 4 mein class 4 even at rest the individual will have dyspnea the individual will have palpitations the individual will have fatigue that is your class 4 nyha so in this after having discussed about the left heart failure you need to know what is the earliest manifestation of right heart failure so is there anyone to answer what is the earliest manifestation of right heart failure right so who will be the first person to answer that yes who will be the first person to answer that na 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 a liver congestion nahi hoga so the earliest manifestation of right heart failure is raised jvp right raised jvp so increase in the jugular venous pulse is the earliest manifestation of right heart failure dusra question puchte hain aapko heart failure mein what is the respiratory pattern in congestive heart failure this is one very very important question so heart failure mein the type of respiratory uh, manifestation or the breathing that you will have is the chain strokes breathing kya hai what is this chain strokes breathing chain strokes breathing bole to the individual will have a rapid breathing followed by that there will be apnea 
and again there will be rapid breathing again there will be apnea that is what is called as the chain stokes breathing it is characteristically seen in congestive heart failure right फिर दूसरा क्वेश्चन क्या है अनदर वेरी वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट क्वेश्चन इन द कंजेस्टिव हार्ट फेलियर है कि नेम ऑफ द क्राइटेरिया नेम ऑफ द क्राइटेरिया फॉर कंजेस्टिव हार्ट फेलियर द नेम ऑफ द क्राइटेरिया फॉर कंजेस्टिव हार्ट फेलियर इज प्रैमिंग हेम्स क्राइटेरिया राइट नेम ऑफ द क्राइटेरिया है कि प्रैमिंग हेम्स क्राइटेरिया दैट कैन बी आज एज ए क्वेश्चन फॉर यू द नेक्स्ट इंपॉर्टेंट इज द इन्वेस्टिगेशन कैसे इन्वेस्टिगेट करना है ये पेशेंट को तो वन यू कैन डू चेस्ट एक्सरे चेस्ट एक्सरे में क्या दिखेगा आपको तो व्हाट विल बी द फर्स्ट मैनिफेस्टेशन ओके दिस विल बी द फर्स्ट मैनिफेस्टेशन वेयर यू विल हैव अपर लोब वेन डिस्टेंशन यू सी दिस दिस इज व्हाट इज योर अपर लोब वेन डिस्टेंशन अपर लोब वेन डिस्टेंशन होने के बाद द फ्लूड विल एंटर इन द इंटरसीशन उस वजह से हमको क्या दिखेगा that will be curly b lines so you get to see the curly b lines then uske baad interstitium se the fluid will enter into the alveoli thereby you get this back wing appearance uske baad the patient will develop the pleural effusion so this is about the chest x ray findings in patients with the heart failure so which is that which will tell you that there is increased pulmonary venous pressure that is option c so you see the sequence number 1 upper lobe vein distension uske baad curly b lines uske baad back wing appearance that is perihilar edema then uske baad lastly the pleural effusion so this will be the chest x ray findings in patients with a congestive heart failure then the next important question hoga aapko cardiac biomarker kya hai congestive heart failure mein most sensitive cardiac biomarker right so is there anyone who can answer this question most sensitive cardiac biomarker kya hoga patient mein heart failure patient mein very good very good so it is your nt pro bnp excellent that is nt pro bnp that is the cardiac biomarker fir uske baad hoga what is the treatment राइट सो अक्यूट लेफ्ट वेंटिकुलर फेलियर में ड्रग ऑफ चॉइस क्या है व्हाट इज द ड्रग ऑफ चॉइस फॉर अक्यूट लेफ्ट वेंटिकुलर फेलियर व्हाट विल बी दैट तो अक्यूट लेफ्ट वेंटिकुलर फेलियर में अक्यूट पल्मोनरी एडिमा है पूरा लंग्स पानी से भरा हुआ है सो फिर क्या देना है हम व्हाट वी शुड गिव वी शुड गिव वेरी गुड सो द ड्रग ऑफ चॉइस विल बी द फ्यूरोसमाइड राइट ड्रग ऑफ चॉइस विल बी फ्यूरोसमाइड ठीक है फिर what are the other treatment options pehle like what is the first thing that you need to do connect the patient to the oxygen then the drug of choice will be your diuretics fir morphine dene ke wajah se advantage kya hoga morphine dene ke advantage jo hai it will reduce the preload and vasodilators kya dena you should give nitroglycerin nitroglycerin ka advantage kya hai nitroglycerin jo hai ये प्रीलोड भी कम करेगा और ये जो है आफ्टर लोड भी कम करेगा दैट इज द एडवांटेज ऑफ योर नाइट्रोग्लिसरीन मगर नाइट्रोग्लिसरीन देने के समय में एक चीज माइंड uh, में याद रखना है कि वेन एवर यू आर गिविंग नाइट्रोग्लिसरीन द सिस्टोलिक ब्लड प्रेशर शुड बी मोर देन 90 मिलीमीटर्स ऑफ मेरक्यूरी दिस इज वेरी वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट देन आइनोट्रोपिक एजेंट्स कब देना है वेन एवर द इंडिविजुअल डेवलप कार्डियोजेनिक शॉक then you should give inotropic agents like norepinephrine then dobutamine or dobutamine dena hai so this will be the treatment for acute heart failure fir chronic heart failure mein treatment kya hoga chronic heart failure mein jab like whenever you find that the entire fluid is out of the lung the individual is completely cleared of your pulmonary edema then in such case the drugs that you need to give is beta blockers then ac inhibitors or angiotensin receptor blockers then aldosterone antagonists so these are the drugs which will improve the mortality in patients with the heart failure magar beta blockers dene ke samay mein ye ek cheez yaad rakhna hai ki agar patient is in uh, 
क्लास फोर डिस्मिया देन डोंट गिव बीटा ब्लॉकर्स ओके एंड बीटा ब्लॉकर्स देने के समय में यू हैव टू स्टार्ट विद लो डोज एंड देन यू हैव टू स्टेप अप द डोज ये चीज ये माइंड में याद रखना बीटा ब्लॉकर्स देने के समय में देन राइट दिस इज वेरी वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट क्वेश्चन प्रीफर ड्रग फॉर हार्ट फेल्यूर विथ रेड्यूज डिजेक्शन फ्रैक्शन ये पक्का क्वेश्चन है राइट प्लीज जस्ट कीप दिस एज अ स्टार मार्क राइट सो प्लीज कीप दिस एज अ स्टार मार्क एंड रिवाइज इवन बिफोर द एग्जाम एज वेल तो प्रीफर ड्रग क्या होगा हार्ट फेल्यूर विथ रेड्यूज डिजेक्शन फ्रैक्शन में एनी वन ऑफ यू राइट वेरी गुड एक्सेलेंट सुपर That is angiotensin receptor blocker neprilysin inhibitor. क्या होगा angiotensin receptor blocker जो है valsartan. फिर neprilysin inhibitor क्या है neprilysin inhibitor जो है that is secubitril. ये combination का advantage क्या है? ये combination का जो advantage है that will improve the ejection fraction. That is the advantage of this particular army angiotensin receptor blocker. Neprilizing inhibitor, ठीक है ये हो गया आपका हार्ट फेल्यूर का क्विक रिविजन दस मिनट में पूरा खत्म राइट नाउ सो आर यू ऑल कंफर्टेबल विद द सेशन विच इज गोइंग ऑन ये क्विकली रेस्पॉन्ड मी ऑन द चैट बॉक्स इज एवरीथिंग फाइन चलो ठीक है वेरी गुड सुपर राइट देन ओके हार्ट फेल्यूर होने के बाद द नेक्स्ट टॉपिक इज कार्डियोमोपैथी राइट सो कार्डियोमोपैथी में एक हो गया आपका डायलेटेड कार्डियोमोपैथी रिस्ट्रिक्टिव कार्डियोमोपैथी हाइपरट्रोफिक कार्डियोमोपैथी तो ये तीन कार्डियोमोपैथी पांच पांच मिनट में मैं पूरा डिस्कस करता हूं राइट द फर्स्ट वन इज द डायलेटेड कार्डियोमोपैथी सो यू सी दिस क्वेश्चन ट्वेंटी फोर ईयर मेल पेशेंट प्रेजेंटेड विथ हिस्ट्री ऑफ ए टैक्सी ऑफ गेट विथ रॉमबर्ग साइन positive and dysmetria he also complains of dyspnea on exertion echo findings kya hoy like ejection fraction is 30% and dilated chambers what would be the etiology cerebellar ataxia fredrick's ataxia subacute combined degeneration of the spinal cord then selenium deficiency so kya hoga what will be the answer for this question right 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 so okay एक स्टूडेंट ने करेक्ट आंसर किया है इसका दट इज द फ्रेडरिक्स सो नाउ डायलेटेड चेम्बर्स आर देर एंड देर इज ऑल्सो द फीचर्स ऑफ सेरिबेलर लीजन राइट सो यू विल सी दैट इन केस ऑफ स्पाइनो सेरिबेलर अटैक्सिया दैट इज नथिंग बट फ्रेडरिक्स अटैक्सिया दिस इज वन ऑफ द कॉमन कॉज फॉर योर डायलेटेड कार्डियोमोपैथी सो दूसरा क्वेश्चन है कि मोस्ट कॉमन टॉक्सिन क्या होगा डायलेटेड कार्डियोमोपैथी कॉज करने के लिए मोस्ट कॉमन टॉक्सिन क्या है मोस्ट कॉमन टॉक्सिन जो है वेरी गुड दैट इज अल्कोहल अल्कोहल जो है मोस्ट कॉमन टॉक्सिन ठीक है देन उसके बाद लाइक व्हाट आर द इंफ्लेमेटरी कॉजेस फॉर डायलेटेड कार्डियोमोपैथी Inflammatory causes जो है mainly autoimmune diseases. Anyone want to answer what are the inflammatory causes? That includes systemic lupus erythematosus. दूसरा होगा systemic sclerosis. दूसरा होगा dermatomyositis. These are the inflammatory causes for dilated cardiomyopathy. The next is the nutritional causes. So ये revision session है, right? I am not teaching you any basics here. रिविजन सेशन में फटाफट पांच मिनट में एक एक टॉपिक होना है ठीक है राइट सो न्यूट्रिशनल कॉजेस क्या है न्यूट्रिशनल कॉजेस जो है वन इज योर बी वन डेफिशियंसी एंड एज वेल एज द सेलिनियम डेफिशियंसी ठीक है राइट एंडोक्राइन कॉजेस क्या है डायलेटेड कार्डियोमोपैथी कॉज करने के लिए ये होगा डायबिटीज मिलिटस दूसरा होगा थाइरॉइड डिजॉर्डर्स थाइरॉइड डिजॉर्डर्स क्या है बोथ हाइपोथाइरोडिज्म एंड हाइपर थाइरोडिज्म के वजह से डायलेटेड कार्डियोमोपैथी होने का चांसेस है देन द नेक्स्ट इंपॉर्टेंट इज द हिमेटोलॉजिकल कॉजेस हिमेटोलॉजिकल कॉजेस क्या है डायलेटेड कार्डियोमोपैथी कॉज करने के लिए राइट दैट इज दैट हिमेटोलॉजिकल कंडीशन वेर यू हैव प्रियापिज्म वेर डू यू हैव प्रियापिज्म यू हैव दैट इन केस ऑफ सिकिल सेल डिजीज राइट इन सिकिल सेल अनिमिया Right, you will have development of dilated cardiomyopathy. Okay, right. 
उसके बाद होगा टॉक्सिन टॉक्सिन में ऑलरेडी बोला है दैट इज एल्कोहल दूसरा टॉक्सिन क्या होगा ड्रग ऑफ अब्यूज ये क्या है ड्रग ऑफ अब्यूज कोकेन इंटॉक्सिकेशन वी कॉल डायलेटेड कार्डियोमेट्री उसके अलावा वी हैव ऑल्सो सम कीमोथेरेपिटिक ड्रग्स लाइक अड्रियामाइसिन ट्रांसड्यूजूमैप साइक्लोफॉस्फोमाइट दीज आर द अदर टॉक्सिन विच विल कॉज डायलेटेड कार्डियोमेट्री ठीक है देन उसके बाद हो गया आपका इनफिल्ट्रेटिव कॉजेस क्या है वो इनफिल्ट्रेटिव कॉजेस इनफिल्ट्रेटिव कॉजेस जो है हीमोक्रोमैटोसिस तो हीमोक्रोमैटोसिस जो है इट नॉट ओनली कॉजेस डायलेटेड कार्डियोमैपथी हीमोक्रोमैटोसिस विल आल्सो कॉज रिस्ट्रिक्टिव कार्डियोमैपथी सो प्लीज रिमेंबर द इनफिल्ट्रेटिव कॉजेस देन ओके वन क्वेश्चन फ्रॉम वन ऑफ माय ब्रदर दैट सर ये ये जो है ये बस है क्या राइट ट्रस्ट मी जस्ट फॉलो माई सेशन अंटिल द एंड ये पूरा बस हो जाएगा फ्रॉम दिस सेशन वॉट एवर यू आर गोइंग टू स्पेंड मी ऑलमोस्ट लाइक सेवन टू एट आवर्स और एट टू नाइन आवर्स दैट विल गिव यू पच्चीस मार्क्स ट्वेंटी फाइव मार्क्स डेफिनेटली यू विल गेट फ्रॉम दिस सेशन आई विल हंड्रेड परसेंट गारंटी यू जस्ट फॉलो अंटिल एंड ओके राइट देन ओके तो नाउ दिस विल बी अबाउट यूर राइट सो दिस द नेक्स्ट इंपॉर्टेंट इज क्लिनिकल फीचर्स क्या होगा इसमें ये ये जो हार्ट फेल्योर कर रहे तो डिस्निया होगा एंड हाउ विल यू डायग्नोज दिस डायलेटेड कार्डियोमैपथी पहले है कि कार्डियोमेगैली राइट सो चेस्ट एक्सरे में कार्डियोमेगैली का क्राइटेरिया क्या होगा राइट यस चिनु माय ब्रदर इट इज बोथ इवन नीट पीजी को भी यूज होगा और एफ को भी यूज होगा राइट यस जमाल गुड आफ्टरनून वेरी गुड सो क्राइटेरिया जो है कार्डियोथोरासिक रेशियो शुड बी मोर देन पॉइंट फाइव राइट सो कार्डियोथोरासिक रेशियो जो है दैट शुड बी मोर देन पॉइंट फाइव ओके दैट विल बी देयर इन द डायलेटेड कार्डियोमैपथी नेक्स्ट कमिंग टू द ट्रीटमेंट एंड फर्स्ट लाइन इन्वेस्टिगेशन क्या है डायलेटेड कार्डियोमैपथी में फर्स्ट लाइन इन्वेस्टिगेशन जो है दैट विल बी टू डी को वेरी सिंपल टू डी को में क्या दिखेगा टू डी को में डायलेटेड चेंबर्स दिखेगा टू डी को में इजेक्शन फ्रैक्शन कैलकुलेट कर सकते हैं फिर इजेक्शन फ्रैक्शन क्या होगा डायलेटेड कार्डियोमैपथी में इजेक्शन फ्रैक्शन कम रहता है दैट इज हार्ट फेलियर विथ रेड्यूज इजेक्शन फ्रैक्शन कितना इजेक्शन फ्रैक्शन रहता इट विल बी लेस देन फोर्टी परसेंट राइट इट विल बी लेस देन फोर्टी परसेंट ओके राइट देन द नेक्स्ट इंपॉर्टेंट इज द ट्रीटमेंट पार्ट विच ऑफ द फॉलोइंग ड्रग इज नॉट गिवेन इन डायलेटेड कार्डियोमैपथी राइट फटाफट राइट सो आई वॉन्ट द आंसर फ्रॉम यू Yes, yes. Even functional MR and functional TR is also seen. Very good. Right. Fada fad bolna hai. Very good. Excellent. Superb. Right. So, jab bhi agar ejection fraction kam hai patient me, calcium channel blocker nahi dena. Very, very important point. You should not give calcium channel blocker. Calcium channel blocker dene ke uh, agar uh, calcium channel blocker de diya patient ko, kya hoga? और इजेक्शन फ्रैक्शन और कम करेगा कैल्शियम चैनल ब्लॉकर्स तो इसलिए कैल्शियम चैनल ब्लॉकर्स डायलेटेड कार्डियोमैपथी पेशेंट्स को नहीं देना ठीक है इज इट क्लियर कैल्शियम चैनल ब्लॉकर्स डोंट गिव इन पेशेंट्स विद रेड्यूस इजेक्शन फ्रैक्शन राइट ओके द नेक्स्ट इंपॉर्टेंट इज एन इमेज बेस्ड क्वेश्चन इंडिकेशन ऑफ दिस डिवाइस इन डायलेटेड कार्डियोमैपथी विद लेफ्ट बंडल ब्रांच ब्लॉक पेशेंट्स फर्स्ट ऑफ ऑल ये डिवाइस क्या है क्या आइडेंटिफाई करना आपने पहले हमको बोलो लाइक व्हाट इज दिस डिवाइस ऑल ऑफ यू व्हाट इज दिस डिवाइस यस नरसिम्हा यू कैन गिव बीटा ब्लॉकर्स बीटा ब्लॉकर्स दे सकते हैं मगर बीटा ब्लॉकर्स कब नहीं देना है अगर बीटा अगर पेशेंट्स क्लास फोर एनवाईएचए है इफ द पेशेंट इज इन क्लास फोर एनवाईएचए देन डोंट गिव बीटा ब्लॉकर्स ठीक है नाई बच्चो नाई माई डियर स्टूडेंट इट इज नॉट पेस इट इज नॉट पेस अरे भाई साहब जमाल ये 
ये किंडर गार्डन का क्वेश्चन नहीं है ये पेस मेकर नहीं है दिस इज नॉट पेस मेकर दिस इज नॉट डिफिब्रिलेटर राइट सो वॉट इज दिस दिस इज यूर टी आर टी कार्डियक रिसिंक्रोनाइजेशन थेरेपी राइट वॉट इज दिस दिस इज सी आर टी कार्डियक रिसिंक्रोनाइजेशन थेरेपी सो सर कैसे पता करना है हाउ टू आइडेंटिफाई इट इज सी आर टी इन सी आर टी यू विल हैव थ्री लीड्स राइट सी आर टी में कितना लीड्स आएगा थ्री लीड्स आएगा एक हो गया राइट right एट्रियम में दूसरा हो गया राइट right वेंट्रिकल में तीसरा हो गया लेटरल वॉल ऑफ द लेफ्ट वेंट्रिकल में तीसरा लीड रहेगा ठीक है राइट नाउ आई विल जस्ट शो यू इन द एक्सरे आल्सो, राइट एक हो गया राइट right एट्रियम दूसरा हो गया राइट right वेंट्रिकल तीसरा हो गया लेटरल वॉल ऑफ द लेफ्ट वेंट्रिकल ये कार्डिया रिसिंक्रोनाइजेशन थेरेपी जो है We place that in refractory cases of dilated cardiomyopathy. Dilated cardiomyopathy patients को छह महीने medical management देना है You have to give six months of medical management. In spite of uh, medical management, if the patient does not respond, then you have to put the patient on CRT, cardiac resynchronization therapy. फिर ये indications क्या है इस cardiac resynchronization therapy करने का मतलब क्या है This will improve the ejection fraction of the patient. तो वॉट इज द इंडिकेशन इंडिकेशन जो है पेशेंट विथ डायलेटेड कार्डियोमैपथी विथ वाइड क्यू आर एस कॉम्प्लेक्स कितना वाइड क्यू आर एस कॉम्प्लेक्स है ना मोर देन वन ट्वेंटी मिली सेकेंड राइट मोर देन वन ट्वेंटी मिली सेकेंड आप बोल सकते सर लेफ्ट बंडल ब्रांच ब्लॉक में वाइड क्यू आर एस कॉम्प्लेक्स जरूर रहेगा बट इन केस ऑफ एल बी 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 पेशेंट the qrs duration should be more than 150 millisecond if no lbbb if lbbb is not there in the ecg then in such case the qrs complex should be more than 120 milliseconds humne like very preferably i was in lbbb so lbbb left bundle branch block qrs complex will be wide but in dcmp what is the indication for crt it should be more than 150 milliseconds अगर एल बी 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 नहीं है देन क्यू आर एस कॉम्प्लेक्स शुड बी मोर देन वन ट्वेंटी मिली सेकेंड आई होप आई एम वेरी क्लियर विद दिस क्वेश्चन अगर कुछ भी डाउट है इस क्वेश्चन के ऊपर देन यू कैन आस्क मी डेफिनेटली आई विल आंसर यू राइट राइट सो वॉट इज दिस दिस इज सी आर टी कार्डिया रिसिंक्रोनाइजेशन थेरेपी ठीक है अगर ये क्वेश्चन क्लियर हो गया देन वी विल मूव ऑन टू द नेक्स्ट राइट नेक्स्ट टॉपिक जो है पेरीपाटम कार्डियोमैपथी पेरीपाटम कार्डियोमैपथी का मतलब क्या है डेफिनेशन इट सेल्फ इज अ वेरी वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट क्वेश्चन पेरीपाटम कार्डियोमैपथी जो है डेवलपमेंट ऑफ डायलेटेड कार्डियोमैपथी इन ए प्रेग्नेंट फीमेल राइट प्रेग्नेंट फीमेल बोले तो किस महीने में इज इट लाइक फर्स्ट महीने सेकेंड महीने थर्ड महीने नो 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 development of dilated cardiomyopathy in the last month of pregnancy right in the last month of pregnancy or within 6 months right within 6 months of delivery then we use the word peripartum cardiomyopathy aur dusra criteria bahut important criteria jo hai There should be absence of demonstrable cause for the heart failure. ये क्या है? That is, ये pregnant female में ये female जो who has developed this dilated cardiomyopathy in last month of pregnancy or within six months of delivery, there should be no pre-existing cardiac disease. Right? There should be no pre-existing cardiac disease. That is very very important to call it as peripartum cardiomyopathy. Agar pre-existing cardiac disease hai, then it is not peripartum cardiomyopathy, right? So definition itself is a multiple choice question for you. ठीक है, right? फिर treatment क्या देना है ये patients को? What is the treatment for this peripartum cardiomyopathy? We should give beta blocker. Which beta blocker is good enough? That is sotalol. Sotalol is acceptable. राइट सो इट इज वेरी मच इफेक्टिव 
उसके अलावा क्या ड्रग्स देना है बीटा ब्लॉकर्स के अलावा द सेम ट्रीटमेंट वॉट एवर वी गिव इन डायलेटेड कार्डियोमैपी एक ही चीज विच विच ड्रग्स यू विल नॉट गिव इन डायलेटेड कार्डियोमैपैथी आई हैव गिवन यू द लिस्ट ऑफ ड्रग्स जस्ट नाउ One particular drug drug which you you are giving giving in 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 dilated cardiomyopathy, you cannot give in peripartum cardiomyopathy. cannot oh, peripartum What 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 is 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 that? 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 No 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 calcium channel blockers to definitely nahi dena hai. No, okay. Na, 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 na. See, yes, one student has answered it correctly. That is AC inhibitors. So yes, patients को beta blockers दे सकते हैं diuretics दे सकते हैं हाइड्रालजीन दे सकते और नाइट्रेट दे सकते मगर एस इनिबिटर्स नहीं देना नाउ यू शुड आंसर दिस क्वेश्चन एस इनिबिटर्स को नहीं दे सकते व्हाई वी कैन नॉट गिव एस इनिबिटर्स इन अ प्रेग्नेंट फीमेल यस कृतिका यस यस आई एल स्पीक इंग्लिश एज वेल यस टेरेटोजेनिक बिकॉज एस इनिबिटर्स आर टेरेटोजेनिक दैट विल कॉज रीनल ए जेनेसिस Hmm, that will cause renal agenesis. That is the reason why you should not give AC inhibitors in case of peripartum cardiomyopathy. Right, right, Mukesh, Mukesh ji, I will okay, I will speak in English and as well as mixed it with Hindi. Okay, very good. Now then we we'll move on to the next important form of next important form of cardiomyopathy. Dusra hoga taco subo cardiomyopathy. What is this Takosubo cardiomyopathy? Any one of you? Yes. What is Takosubo cardiomyopathy? Na 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 na. Irfan, it is not toxic. Ye hoga apka dilated cardiomyopathy. It is a form of dilated cardiomyopathy. Dusra naam kya hai? What are the other names for this Takosubo cardiomyopathy? Dusra naam jo hai, it is also called stress cardiomyopathy. Why? Because it occurs whenever the individual is under severe stress. Where there is massive release of catecholamines, then it is also called apical ballooning syndrome. This why they say these patients go apical ballooning syndrome. Bol te hain because it is the apex of the heart which is ballooned out. That is why it is called apical ballooning syndrome. Then the other name is broken heart syndrome. See the apex which is ballooned out. Jo bhi apex balloon ho gaya, there is very high chance that it can thuk, it can rupture. अगर रपच्चर हो गए तो उसको क्या बोलते हैं हम ब्रोकन हार्ट सिंड्रोम फिर दूसरा नाम जो है टाकोसुबो कार्डियोमैपथी किस वजह से टाकोसुबो बोलते हैं हम दैट इज बिकॉज जापान में एक ऑब्जेक्ट यूज करते इन जापान वी यूज एन ऑब्जेक्ट टू कैच दिस ऑक्टोपस वो ऑब्जेक्ट का नाम क्या है वो ऑब्जेक्ट का नाम है टाकोसुबो ये जो भी एपेक्स बलून आउट हो गया it is looking similar to that of takosubo that is the reason why it is called takosubo cardiomyopathy theek hai ye takosubo cardiomyopathy ka criteria kya hai the criteria is the meios criteria four important criteria zarur yaad rakhna very you should remember all these four criteria number 1 2d echo will be showing apical hypokinesia number 2 absence of coronary artery occlusion by thrombus when you do a coronary angiogram the coronary should be absolutely clear ecg st segment elevation troponin elevated very important absence of pheochromocytoma kyu because pheochromocytoma also there is massive release of catecholamines in that way you should rule out pheochromocytoma because in takosubo kya hoga massive release of catecholamines hoga फ्योक्रोमोसाइटोमा में क्या होगा मैसिव रिलीज ऑफ कैटेकोलोमाइंस दोनों सेम है ए क्या नो 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 बोथ आर नॉट सेम बोथ आर डिफरेंट तो देयर शुड बी एब्सेंस ऑफ द फ्योक्रोमोसाइटो सो दिस इज व्हाट इज योर मॉडिफाइड मेयोस क्राइटेरिया फोर आउट ऑफ फोर शुड बी देयर फिर लाइक व्हाट इज द ट्रीटमेंट इन केस ऑफ टाकोसुबो कार्डियोमायोपैथी द ट्रीटमेंट इज वी गिव एस्पिरिन एंड देन द सेम थिंग बीटा ब्लॉकर्स एस इनहिबिटर्स एवरीथिंग वी गिव but only thing is if the patient with takosubo cardiomyopathy if they develop cardiogenic shock then you have to put the patient on iabp intra aortic balloon pump theek okay? hai right ek cheez yaad rakhna one important thing you should remember if there is cardiogenic shock norepinephrine de sakte hai no dopamine de sakte hai kya no dobutamine de sakte hai kya no 
right? So if there is cardiogenic shock, please don't give norepinephrine, dopamine, dobutamine. Why? Because the tacosubo cardiomyopathy is developed by massive catecholamine release. And again, upon that, if you give these drugs, that will further worsen the condition, right? That will further worsen the condition. Okay? So that is about your dilated cardiomyopathy. The next important form of cardiomyopathy is hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Right? So, a question they call image based question. All are true regarding the specimen shown except asymmetrical septal hypertrophy, left ventricular outer tract obstruction, diamond shaped cavity of the left ventricle, diastolic dysfunction. Except what is the wrong statement here? What is the wrong statement here? Right, very good, Narsima. So, diamond shaped cavity nahi rehta. What is this? This is a specimen of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So, in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, what will be the shape of the LV? Very good, Irfan. That will be banana shaped LV. Right, banana shaped cavity rehta, not diamond shaped cavity. Diastolic dysfunction, right? left ventricular outflow obstruction, right? and asymmetrical septal hypertrophy also will be there. Right? So, what is the definition of your hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy? One important thing, ye jo hypertrophy jo hai, whatever this hypertrophy is there, this particular hypertrophy thickness, this thickness should be more than 1.5 cm. And this particular thickness, it need not be only in the septum. This particular thickness can be there even at the apex. If it is at the apex, we call it as apical hypertrophy. Right? If it is at the apex, we call it as apical hypertrophy. If it is at the septum, it will... See, agar hypertrophy, if it is there at the septum, what it will do? It will obstruct the outflow. This way, say... Ye patients ko hum hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy bol sakte. Right? So, hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy mein banana shaped left ventricular lumen. Per ye apical hypertrophy mein what will be the shape of the LV lumen? Agar apical hypertrophy hai patient ko, then it will be the ace of spades. Right? It will be ace of spades. Okay? Right, what will be the, yes, mutation. Right, jaldi bolo, what mutation is most common in patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy? Very, very important question. Yes, very good. That is beta myosin gene mutation. Okay, and one more thing that they may ask you is, on which chromosome? It is present on chromosome 14. What type of inheritance? Inheritance jo hai, autosomal dominant type of inheritance. Then apart from this beta myosin, what are the other proteins which are defective? The other proteins which are defective is troponin T, myosin binding protein C. These are the other proteins which are being defective. Okay? Right. Presentation kya hoga? Clinically, how do they present? Right? Very bura baat hai ki, most common presentation is sudden cardiac death. They directly present with sudden cardiac death on doing some exertional activity. Right? So, that is the asymptomatic presentation. Okay? So, uh, I don't know how many of you have gone through the news. One news is uh, recently, I think uh, it was yesterday or day before yesterday, uh, Bangalore, mein, uh, there is one individual who had affair with the domestic helper and he was having intercourse with the domestic help and with that excessive excitation he had a sudden cardiac death autopsy kiye to hocm nikal gaya right so on exertion the individual can have sudden cardiac death okay agar symptomatic hai agar symptomatic hai patient then what will be the symptom the most common symptom jo hai, right, most common symptom jo hai, dyspnea. And what is the important auscultatory finding? So, along with S1 and S2, 
राइट अलोंग विथ एस वन एंड एस टू एनी एडिशनल साउंड आपको सुनेगा क्या डू यू लिजन एनी अदर एडिशनल हार्ट साउंड अपार्ट फ्रॉम एस वन एंड एस टू इन एच ओ सी एम येस वॉट इज दैट दैट इज यूर एस फोर राइट अपार्ट फ्रॉम दिस यू ऑल्सो लिजन ए मर्मर वॉट इज दैट मर्मर दैट विल बी इजेक्शन सिस्टॉलिक मर्मर राइट दैट विल बी द इजेक्शन सिस्टॉलिक मर्मर ओके देन नेक्स्ट इज वॉट विल बी द फर्स्ट लाइन इन्वेस्टिगेशन फर्स्ट लाइन इन्वेस्टिगेशन जो है दैट विल बी टू डी को कंफर्मेटरी डायग्नोसिस जो है द कंफर्मेटरी डायग्नोसिस इज बाई कार्डियक एम आर आई right that is by cardiac mri that will confirm the diagnosis right then what will the ecg show ecg in patients with the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy right that will show you features of left ventricular hypertrophy right features of left ventricular hypertrophy that will be there on the ecg left ventricular hypertrophy ka criteria kya hai wo jo criteria hai सोकोलोलियोन क्राइटेरिया राइट सो सोकोलियोन क्राइटेरिया ओके एंड आई हैव सीन मेनी ऑफ द स्टूडेंट्स दैट दे विल रिमेंबर दिस क्राइटेरिया एज सनिलियोनिक क्राइटेरिया रिमेंबर इट इज नॉट सनिलियोन क्राइटेरिया इट इज सोकोलोलियोन क्राइटेरिया ठीक है सर न्यूमोनिक लाइक इट इज वेरी इजी टू रिमेंबर दैट इज व्हाई आई जस्ट रिमेंबर बट एग्जाम में सोकोलोलियोन क्राइटेरिया टिक करना है टोकोलियोन क्राइटेरिया क्या है वॉट इज दैट दैट इज एस वी वन प्लस आर वी फाइव और आर वी सिक्स इट इज मोर देन थर्टी फाइव एम एम राइट मोर देन थर्टी फाइव एम एम दैट शुड बी योर सोकोलियोन क्राइटेरिया विच इज सजेस्टिव ऑफ योर लेफ्ट वेंटिकुलर हाइपरट्रोफी विच इज सजेस्टिव ऑफ योर लेफ्ट वेंटिकुलर हाइपरट्रोफी ठीक है no 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 please don't remember it as sanilioni criteria it is sokololion criteria okay right next you see the treatment so you see the clinical scenario 9 month old child of a diabetic mother presents with tachycardia and hepatomegaly echocardiography showed normal morphology and asymmetrical septal hypertrophy which of the following you will give to treat this particular child digoxin furosemide Propranolol, isoptin. What will you give? So, what is very important here? That is asymmetrical septal hypertrophy. So, the drug of choice will be beta blocker. Hmm? Drug of choice will be beta blocker. And that too, which beta blocker we can give? That is propranolol. Agar beta blockers ka kuch bhi contraindications hai, then the alternative drug will be calcium channel blocker. That is verapamil. Right? That is verapamil. Okay. right and next important thing you need to know is there are some drugs which are contraindicated in hocm what are those drugs which are contraindicated in hocm digitalis mat dena sympathomimetic amines no nitrates no diuretics no why because when you give these drugs they will decrease the lv lumen and they will increase the obstruction that is the reason why these drugs are contraindicated then ye ho gaya aapka hypertrophic cardiomyopathy then next important is the restrictive cardiomyopathy restrictive cardiomyopathy like what exactly is the definition ye jo hai this is the one which will cause diastolic dysfunction theek okay? hai and there will be abnormal material which accumulates within the myocardium and thereby the myocardium becomes stiff right it becomes so stiff that it will resist the ventricles will resist the normal filling during diastole the heart cannot relax properly so it will be heart failure with preserved ejection fraction right very good what is the most common etiology causing restrictive cardiomyopathy right everyone remembers amyloidosis मगर उधर क्वेश्चन क्या पूछेगा आपको विच टाइप ऑफ अमाइलॉइडोसिस ए ए एल ए बीटा ओके सम ए ए अमाइलॉइडोसिस ओके ए तो ऑलरेडी मैं पूछ लिया राइट ये नाउ यू टेल मी नाइन 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 ए बीटा नहीं है ए ए नहीं है 
that will be al amyloidosis light chain type of amyloidosis that is the most common cause for restrictive cardiomyopathy everyone remembers amyloidosis udhar googly kya hoga which sub type of amyloidosis that will be al type of amyloidosis theek hai dusra what is the other important etiology causing restrictive cardiomyopathy ek storage disorder hai what is that storage disorder that is febreze disease ye febreze disease jo hai it is a lysosomal storage disorder right it is lysosomal storage disorder okay now what is the question here question puchega aapko enzymatic deficiency kya hai febreze mein anyone can answer this question febreze mein enzymatic deficiency kya hai any one of you right so we have one student very good very good now everyone is answering that is alpha galactosidase a deficiency राइट अल्फा गैलेक्टोसाइडेज ए डेफिशिएंसी ये डेफिशिएंसी की वजह से क्या होगा व्हाट विल हैपन बिकॉज़ ऑफ दिस डेफिशिएंसी देयर विल बी एक्सेसिव अक्यूमुलेशन ऑफ अ फैट व्हाट इज दैट पर्टिकुलर फैट व्हिच विल गेट अक्यूमुलेटेड ग्लोबोट्रायोसिल सिरामाइड राइट ग्लोबोट्रायोसिल सिरामाइड दैट विल अक्यूमुलेट एंड दैट विल बी रिस्पांसिबल फॉर द डेवलपमेंट ऑफ रिस्ट्रिक्टिव कार्डियोमायोपैथी ठीक है प्लीज आंसर दिस क्वेश्चन what is the antibody in this condition causing restrictive cardiomyopathy anti smith anti centromere anti topo isomerase anti dsdn first of all please tell me what is the diagnosis diagnosis kya hoga this will be this will be scleroderma right you can see the skin it is very tight skin and you can see the mouth she is unable to open the mouth where will you get that you will get that in scleroderma scleroderma is two types ek hoga localized scleroderma dusra hoga systemic scleroderma and in which type of scleroderma you will have restrictive cardiomyopathy in systemic scleroderma in systemic scleroderma you will have development of restrictive cardiomyopathy now i have said you the clue now tell me the answer systemic scleroderma very good that will be anti topo isomerase ye jo anti centromere jo hai that is in localized scleroderma right whereas anti topo isomerase that will be in the diffuse scleroderma theek hai so the answer is anti topo isomerase next next question the next question is what is the adverse effect of the drug used for the treatment in the following condition causing restrictive cardiomyopathy peptic ulcer weight loss distal muscle weakness dementia first of all please tell me the diagnosis what is the diagnosis of this etiology causing restrictive cardiomyopathy yes fatafat bolna right so you can observe here एक क्या है इधर व्हाट इज द अबनॉर्मैलिटी यू आर मेकिंग आउट हियर बायोलैटरल हाइलार लिम्फेडिनोपैथी है बायोलैटरल हाइलार लिम्फेडिनोपैथी किस कंडीशंस में होगा वेरी कॉमन कंडीशन इज सार्कोइडोसिस तो सार्कोइडोसिस इज वन ऑफ द इटियोलॉजी व्हिच विल कॉज द रिस्ट्रिक्टिव कार्डियोमायोपैथी ये दो स्टेप प्रोसेस है नहीं ये दो स्टेप नहीं तीन स्टेप क्वेश्चन है ये ये तीन स्टेप क्या है पहले यू शुड डायग्नोज व्हाट इज द इटियोलॉजी सार्कोइडोसिस सेकेंड स्टेप जो है वॉट इज द ड्रग ऑफ चॉइस फॉर सार्कोइडोसिस स्टीरोड मैंने क्या पूछा वॉट इज द एडवर्स इफेक्ट ऑफ द ड्रग यूज फॉर ट्रीटमेंट इन द फॉलोइंग कंडीशन कॉजिंग रिस्ट्रिक्टिव कार्डियोमैपथी तो स्टीरोड से एडवर्स इफेक्ट क्या है दैट विल बी योर पेप्टिकल्स दैट विल बी पेप्टिकल्स एंड वेट लॉस नहीं होगा ये पेशेंट्स में वेट गेन होगा स्टीरोड्स की वजह से Our distal muscle weakness is not common. Proximal muscle weakness is common, and dementia develop नहीं होगा. Psychosis develop होगा. Steroids ज़्यादा होने के वजह से. ठीक है? So ये जो answer है, that is peptic ulcer. Then, in these patients, right? In these patients with restrictive cardiomyopathy, thromboembolic complications are common. Right? Why? Because these patients with restrictive cardiomyopathy, 
दे विल डेवलप एट्रियल फिब्रिलेशन तो एट्रियल फिब्रिलेशन की वजह से ट्रॉम्बो एम्बोलिक कॉम्प्लिकेशन आर वेरी वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट देन वेरी वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट इन द रिस्ट्रिक्टिव कार्डियोमोपैथी इज अबाउट द जेवीपी सो देर विल बी एलिवेटेड जेवीपी स्मॉल साइन विल बी प्रेजेंट इन रिस्ट्रिक्टिव कार्डियोमोपैथी एक्स एंड वाई डिसेंट ओके एक्स एंड वाई डिसेंट विल बी एक्सैजरेटेड दैट विल बी जेवीपी फाइंडिंग्स इन पेशेंट्स विद द रिस्ट्रिक्टिव कार्डियोमोपैथी देन हाउ विल यू डायग्नोज रिस्ट्रिक्टिव कार्डियोमोपैथी यस फर्स्ट लाइन इन्वेस्टिगेशन जो है दैट विल बी टू डी इको देन व्हाट विल द ईसीजी शो ईसीजी इन केस ऑफ रिस्ट्रिक्टिव कार्डियोमोपैथी that will show you that there is low voltage complexes right what do you mean by low voltage complexes the amplitude of the qrs complex will be less than 10 mm in the limb leads less than 5 mm in the chest leads that is called low voltage complexes you will have that in restrictive cardiomyopathy and what is the first line investigation i have taught you first line investigation will be 2d echo right now what is that you will observe in the 2d echo you will have this particular dotted appearance right you will have this particular dotted appearance in the 2d echo agar dotted appearance hai that means it is an infiltration what is that that is your amyloidosis right that will be amyloidosis okay so that will be echocardiogram okay Then, or we call this dotted appearance को हम दूसरा टर्मिनोलॉजी uh, क्या यूज कर सकते हैं पेक्ल्ड पैटर्न वी कॉल दिस एजेक्ल्ड पैटर्न एंड द रिमेनिंग ऑल विल बी सेम दैट इज देर विल बी हार्ट फेल्यूर विद प्रिजर्व इजेक्शन फ्रैक्शन डायस्टोलिक डिसफंक्शन विल बी देर एंड योर एट्रियल डायलिटेशन विल बी देर ओके योर एट्रिया इज अब नॉर्मली डायलिटेड वाई बिकॉज योर डायस्टोलिक प्रेशर ऑफ द वेंट्रिक्स आर इंक्रीज your atrial distension will be there then how will you treat these patients with the restrictive cardiomyopathy ultimately these patients will develop the features of heart failure so you need to give the diuretics and i said you these individuals they also have thromboembolic complications so because of this thromboembolic complications we give anticoagulants like low molecular weight heparin or oral anticoagulants that you can give is warfarin can be given in patients with the restrictive cardiomyopathy One important question है कि digoxin use कर सकते हैं क्या restrictive cardiomyopathy में any one of you because atrial fibrillation है sir मैं digoxin देता हूँ digoxin दे सकते हैं क्या RCMP patients में any one of you very good there should you should not give digoxin why why we should not give digoxin why we should not give digoxin that is because digoxin will precipitate arrhythmias that is the reason why don't give digoxin okay so that is about your cardiomyopathy right so we have discussed dilated we have discussed hypertrophic we have discussed restrictive cardiomyopathy as well yes all of you are you comfortable until now yes uh, harjit uh, arrhythmias ppt i will send you and even i will discuss arrhythmia separately all of you are you comfortable is everything going on well do you want any changes to be done right theek hai if everyone is comfortable acha acha understood harjit yes it precipitates arrhythmias got it theek hai now the next important topic is the heart sounds right answer this question which is the location of herbs point during auscultation the next topic will be heart sounds yeah this particular video will be available even after the class hmm? this particular video will be available even after the class very good super right so herbs point is third left intercostal space okay so like let us just assume this is one second and this will be third okay so third left intercostal space will be the herbs point and this herbs point it is the best site for auscultating which heart sound 
any one of you yes which particular heart sound you can listen best at the herbs point any one of you that is the second heart sound right second heart sound is heard best at the herbs point okay right then having discussed about the heart sounds that is areas of auscultation what are the various areas of auscultation a stands for aortic area p stands for pulmonary area aortic area where exactly is it it is present in the second right intercostal space adjacent to the sternum pulmonary area left second intercostal space adjacent to the sternum herbs point that is third left intercostal space adjacent to the sternum tricuspid area that is fourth left intercostal space adjacent to the sternum mitral area it corresponds to the apex mitral area it corresponds to the apex right one important question that they will ask you is during which phase of cardiac cycle you listen this heart sounds s1 yes which phase of the cardiac cycle you will listen this first heart sound any one of you please first heart sound is heard during yes anyone isovolumetric contraction phase what about s2 what about s2 it is heard during isovolumetric relaxation phase okay what about s3 s yeah isovolumetric relaxation or during protodiastole anything is fine anything is correct s3 is heard during which phase that is first rapid filling right that is first rapid filling and s4 is heard during which phase of the cardiac cycle that will be second rapid filling that is due to atrial contraction right that is due to atrial contraction okay right फटाफट से हम ऑल द हार्ट साउंड्स को कंपेयर करेंगे हम ठीक है राइट लेट अस कंपेयर ऑल द हार्ट साउंड्स नाउ इफ यू टेक द कैरेक्टर फर्स्ट हार्ट साउंड इज अ हाई पिचड साउंड सेकंड इज आल्सो हाई पिचड साउंड वेयर एज योर थर्ड एंड फोर्थ दे आर लो पिचड साउंड्स ड्यूरेशन क्या होगा फर्स्ट हार्ट साउंड का ड्यूरेशन क्या है जो है 0.14 सेकंड एंड सेकंड हार्ट साउंड इट इज 0.11 सेकंड and third and fourth it is 0.10 second frequency the okay the question that will be asked is the heart sound with highest frequency that will be the second heart sound 50 hertz fir first heart sound ka frequency kitna hai 50 25 to 45 and the remaining will be less than 20 question kya puchega aapko the one with highest frequency so what will be the cause राइट फर्स्ट आर्ट साउंड का जो कॉज है दैट इज वाइब्रेशन विच आर जनरेटेड विद इन माइट्रल एंड ट्राइकस्पीड वैल्व ओके वाइब्रेशन विच आर जनरेटेड इन माइट्रल एंड ट्राइकस्पीड वैल्व वेर एज सेकेंड हार्ट साउंड इट इज ड्यू टू क्लोजर ऑफ आयोटिक एंड एज वेल एज पलमनरी वैल्व थर्ड हार्ट साउंड इट इज ड्यू टू रैपिड वेंट्रिक्यूलर फिलिंग दैट टू फर्स्ट रैपिड फिलिंग एंड फोर्थ हार्ट साउंड इट इज सेकेंड रैपिड ventricular filling right timings already i have said you isovolumetric contraction phase isovolumetric relaxation phase first rapid filling second rapid filling right uske baad how do you listen this first heart sound is heard with diaphragm second heart sound it is heard with diaphragm why jo bhi high pitched sounds that you will listen them with diaphragm agar low pitched sounds hai then you will listen that with a bell okay low pitched sounds you will listen that with a bell right and one important question is regarding the second heart sound second heart sound thoda important hai wide split s2 occurs in any one of you wide split s2 occurs in very good you have two answers do answers hai aapko एक होगा वेंट्रिकुलर सेप्टल डिफेक्ट सेकंड होगा एट्रियल सेप्टल डिफेक्ट तो वाइड स्प्लिट एस टू अक्कर सिंह बी एस डी एंड एज वेल एज ई एस डी नाउ लेट मी टेल यू ऑल द कंडीशन वेर यूल है 
वाइट स्प्लिट एस टू किस वजह से हो सकता है एक होगा दैट इज बिकॉज ऑफ अर्ली ए टू और बिकॉज ऑफ डिलेड पी टू यू कैन हैव वाइट स्प्लिट एस टू सो अर्ली ए टू यू विल हैव दैट इन एम आर यू विल हैव दैट इन वी एस डी डिलेड पी टू यू हैव दैट इन एट्रियल सेप्टल डिफेक्ट यू हैव दैट इन पलमनरी एम्बोलिज्म right and you also have that in pulmonary hypertension and you also have that in right bundle branch block you will also have that in left ventricular ectopic beats and you will also have that in left ventricular paced beats so these are all the conditions where you will have wide split wide split has to Either early A2 ke wajay se ho sakta ya delayed P2 ke wajay se ho sakta. It can be due to early A2 or delayed P2. Next, very very important question. Agar heart sound, second heart sound ke upar agar question poochna hai. If the question is asked on second heart sound, please keep this in your mind. Causes of wide fixed split are all except. The question asked except. Very good, Narsima. The answer is VSD. So VSD, you will not have wide fixed split. You will have wide variable split. Right? You will have wide variable split. Okay. Right. Next question. S two is best appreciated in. S two is best appreciated in. Just now we have answered it. S2 is best appreciated in the herbs point. What is herbs point? That is third left intercostal space. That is the herbs point. Okay. Next. Next question is third heart sound is best heard with. Option A is bell. Option B is your head. Option C is the diaphragm. Option D is tubing. Third heart sound is best heard with. any one of you very good that is heard with the bell of the stethoscope because it's low pitched sound okay next question third heart sound is best heard at what is the area of auscultation where you will listen this best yes no 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 not at the herbs point not at the herbs point third heart sound jo hai it is heard best at the apex what is apex apex is nothing but your mitral area so in the mitral area you will listen third heart sound as best next physiological s3 is heard in all except physiological s3 is heard in all except very good barad sumo fighters Sumo fighters, you cannot listen S3 because S3 जो है low pitched sound है. Sumo fighters कैसे रहेगा? Obese ये low pitched sound. Obese individuals, you can you listen that? Nine. The remaining all you will have this physiological S3. Then what are the causes for pathological S3? Causes for pathological S3: right ventricular failure, left ventricular failure. Any condition causing right ventricular failure and left ventricular failure, right? And even your ischemic heart diseases, even your valvular heart diseases like MR and AR. So these are all the conditions where you will have pathological S. Then next coming to the fourth heart sound. Fourth heart sound is what it is. If it is heard, if it is heard. it is always pathological you don't have physiological s4 at all then what are the conditions where you will have this pathological s4 and if at all if you are listening you will listen that at the apex right you will listen that at the apex right and why is this due to forceful atrial contraction where will you have that forceful atrial contraction right this is the pneumonic pneumonic is what hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy the word h stands for hocm or hypertension o stands for obstruction other than hocm that is aortic stenosis 
pulmonary stenosis. The word C stands for cardiac cramp. The word M stands for myocardial infarct. So these are your four important heart sounds. Heart sounds are not over without discussing the added sounds. Right? The added sounds are ejection click, opening snap, pericardial knock, tumor flop. Okay. Where will you have this ejection click? Any one of you please? Any one of you? Where will you listen this ejection click? Ejection click you will have, you will listen that in aortic stenosis and pulmonary stenosis and it is a high pitched sound. Opening snap. Where will you listen this? You will listen this in mitral stenosis and tricuspid stenosis and this is also a high pitched sound. Pericardial knock. Pericardial knock, you will listen that in constrictive pericarditis and that is also a high pitched sound. Tumor plop, tumor plop, you will listen that in atrial myxoma. In atrial myxoma, you will listen the tumor plop. Tumor plop, high pitched sound hai kya? No, 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 no. It is a low pitched sound. So, among all these, which is the low pitched sound? Tumor plop. And next important is your ejection click jo hai a systolic sound hai. The remaining all are your diastolic sound. Dekho, how many questions are there in this table? There are almost 10 questions which can be asked in this particular table itself. Okay. So, this table is very very important related to your added sound. Ye ho gaya aapka hard sounds ka discussion. First, second, third, fourth and added sounds. Then, next important topic kya hai? JVP. Jugular venous pulsation. Jugular venous pulsations mein there are five important waves. A wave that is due to atrial contraction. C wave that is due to bulging of the cusp into right atria. X wave that is due to atrial relaxation. V wave that is due to venous filling. Y wave that is due to atrial emptying. You know what will be the questions that will be asked? Questions is that they will try to correlate with the cardiac cycle. A wave, which phase of the cardiac cycle? A wave is what? Atrial contraction. Atria contract hone ke samay mein ventricle kya kar rahe? Ventricle is in a phase of end diastole. Right? Mechanical event is atrial contraction. T wave. That is tricuspid valve bulging into the right atrium. What is your ventricle doing? Ventricle is in early phase of the systole. Then X wave. X wave is what? Atrial relaxation. Atria relax hone ke samay mein ventricle kya kar rahe? That it is in the mid part of the systole. Then, then V wave. V wave is what? Venous filling. Venous filling hone ke samay mein atria ventricle kya kar rahe? That it is in the late part of the systole. Y wave is what? Y wave is the atrial emptying. Atria empty hone ke samay mein ventricle kya kar rahe? Ventricle is in early diastole. This table is very very important. Hmm? This table is very very important. Okay? Then, now let me discuss abnormalities of the waves right so abnormalities of the waves is the abnormalities of the a wave right so in which condition the a wave is absent any one of you please this conditions may atrial a wave is absent very good abai that is atrial fibrillation then in which condition you will have a giant a wave giant a wave you will have that in case of right atrial myxoma. You have that in tricuspid stenosis. You have that in pulmonary hypertension. Next important thing is canon A wave. Where will you have canon A wave? Canon A wave, you will have that in complete heart block. You will have that in case of junctional rhythm. Right? So these are the conditions where you will have canon A wave. Okay? Right. After abnormalities of the A wave, next thing is abnormalities of the X wave. 
सो एक्स वेव का अबनॉर्मैलिटीज क्या है एक्स वेव इज एक्सरेटेड इन विच कंडीशन एक्स वेव कैन बी एक्सरेटेड दट इज इन रेस्ट्रिक्टिव कार्डियोमैपथी कंस्ट्रिक्टिव पेरिकार्डाइटिस एंड देन कार्डियक टैम्पोनी these are the conditions where the x wave is exaggerated what are the condition where x wave is reversed x wave is reversed in tricuspid regurgitation these are the abnormalities of x wave what are the abnormalities of the v wave v wave is increased where is the v wave increased that is in tricuspid regurgitation and lastly abnormalities of the y wave so what are the conditions where the y wave is absent that is in case of cardiac tamponade where is that you have early y wave early y wave you have that in tricuspid regurgitation where will you have exaggerated y wave exaggerated y wave you have that in restrictive cardiomyopathy and constrictive pericarditis and where is that you will have slow y descent that you will have in tricuspid stenosis these are the abnormalities of the wave ye yaad rakhna hai kya yes you have to remember all these abnormalities anything can be asked last important point about jvp is kusmol sign kusmol respiration right what is kusmol sign kusmol sign is increase in the jugular venous volume on inspiration right where will you have this you will have this in all the conditions which will cause the right heart failure you will have this in constrictive pericarditis you will have this in restrictive cardiomyopathy is it present in cardiac tamponade no cardiac tamponade may a small sign is absent very very important point next coming to the kusmol's respiration Yes, Kusmol's respiration. Any one of you? Diabetic ketoacidosis, right? You will have Kusmol's respiration in diabetic ketoacidosis. Okay, so that is about your JVP. In five ten minutes, the entire JVP is done. Right. Now, so as of now, is everything fine? Do you want any changes to be done? i see some of the students falling down why the number is reduced any changes that has to be done from my side theek okay. hai all fine right now next next important topic is the arterial pulse hmm? arterial pulse you should know pulse mein what are the questions that will be asked for you so in the pulse the question that they will ask you is the abnormal characters of the pulse first important is pulses paradoxes any one of you pulses paradoxes where will you have which cardiac condition you will have pulses paradoxes you will have that in cardiac tamponade right and occasionally in constrictive pericarditis occasionally constrictive pericarditis pulses alternance any one of you pulses alternance pulses alternance you will have that in severe left ventricular failure where will you have electrical alternance any one of you please which condition you will have electrical alternance yes electrical alternance kis conditions mein rahega electrical alternance jo hai it is the ecg finding electrical alternance is not a pulse it is a ecg finding anyone i am waiting for the answer very good narsimha in case of massive pericardial effusion you will have this electrical alternance theek okay? hai then pulses parvus et tardis where will you have pulses parvus et tardis very important that is in aortic stenosis what is pulses parvus et tardis it is a slow rising pulse with late peaking that is called pulses parvus et tardis pulses bigeminous ye to answer karna hai pulses bigeminous any one of you please because pulses bigeminous it is due to a drug toxicity anyone 
which particular drug toxicity will cause ventricular bijamine it is an integration with pharmacology and medicine very good narsima that will be digoxin toxicity digoxin toxicity may you will get pulses by gemenes then the other important character of the pulse is the water hammer pulse where will you have water hammer pulse you will have that in aortic regurgitation there are many other conditions even in mr you can have this water hammer pulse but which important cardiac condition that is ar then next is dichrotic pulse where will you have dichrotic pulse dichrotic pulse you have that in case of dilated cardiomyopathy lastly where will you have pulses bisphereens any one of you pulses bisphereens very good that you will have in hoc hmm? that you will have in hoc that is about the pulses bisphereen okay right now we'll move that is over that is about the characters of the pulse next important question is about the murmurs murmurs is a very very important topic murmur ka without revising murmurs don't go to the exam don't go to the exam without revising the murmurs okay right so yes which condition following murmur is seen aortic regurgitation asd transposition of the great arteries branched pulmonary artery stenosis फटाफट एनी वन ऑफ यू आई एम नॉट गेटिंग वेरी गुड अभाई अभाई हेज आंसर्ड इट दैट इज इन केस फर्स्ट ऑफ ऑल वॉट मार्मर इज दिस दिस इज ए कंटिन्यूस मार्मर वाई इज इट कॉल्ड कंटिन्यूस मार्मर बिकॉज थ्रू आउट द कार्डियक साइकिल स्टार्टिंग फ्रॉम एस वन पासिंग थ्रू यूर एस टू अगेन एंडिंग एट एन एस वन तो थ्रू आउट द कार्डियक साइकिल मरमर है इसलिए इसको कंटिन्यूस मरमर बोलते हैं हम वॉट आर द इंपॉर्टेंट कंडीशन कॉजिंग कार्डियक मरमर सॉरी कंटिन्यूस मरमर पेटेंट डॉक्टर आर्टीरियोसिस रपच्चर्ड साइनस ऑफ वेल सालवा एवी फिस्टुला विच इज वेरी वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट कंडीशन देन वीनस हम देन यू विल हैव इन प्रेगनेंसी दैट इज मैमरी सॉफुल then branched pulmonary stenosis right branched pulmonary stenosis then any other condition yes we also have this over the occlusions that is carotid artery occlusion renal occlusion coarctation of aorta coronary occlusion femoral occlusion all these you have the continuous murmurs okay right then continuous murmur discussion hone ke baad Yes, please identify this murmur. ये two step process है. पहले murmur identify करना, उसके बाद which condition you will have this murmur is very very important. Yes, please identify the murmur. The murmur is okay. Very good, Jinesh. But what is this murmur? This murmur, it is a pan-systolic murmur. because it is present in between s1 and s2 and that too throughout the systole pura systole mein ye disturbance hai fir isko kya bol sakte hum pan systolic murmur pan systolic murmur kis conditions mein rahega you will have that in case of vsd you will have that in mr you will have that in tr right so the answer is vsd theek hai then next important is yes identify this murmur and in which condition you will have this identify this murmur in which condition you will have this so what is this my uh, what is this murmur my dear students first of all ye murmur jo hai very good shashi that is late systolic murmur right because you have a peaking in the late part of the systole so which condition you will have late systolic murmurs you will have that in mvps and as well as the tvps so the answer is a theek hai right the next important is yes first of all please identify this murmur and tell me in which condition you will not have this murmur the question jo pucha hai except identify the murmur very good 
it is a mid systolic murmur which is also called ejection systolic murmur which all conditions you will have this mid systolic murmurs as mid systolic murmur ps mid systolic murmur hocm mid systolic murmur but not in case of ts ts what is a murmur ts mein murmur kya hoga that will be mid diastolic murmur so tricuspid stenosis mein you will have the mid diastolic murmur theek hai next so continuous murmurs done systolic murmurs done what is that we are left out with we are left out with the diastolic murmurs early diastolic murmur is seen in early diastolic murmur is seen in so early diastolic murmur it is seen in ar and as well as pr so the answer is aortic regurgitation then the next important is the mid diastolic murmurs where will you listen this mid diastolic murmurs you will listen that in ms and as well as ts so we are done with the systolic diastolic and continuous murmur you know what is the next important thing next important thing jo hai named murmurs named murmurs is a very very important area for the questions okay now carry coombs murmur any one of you where will you listen the carry coombs murmur carry coombs murmur you will listen that in acute rheumatic fever acute rheumatic fever mein you will have this carry coombs murmur why because of acute mitral regurgitation austin flint murmur where will you listen and carry coombs murmur not only in acute rheumatic fever you also listen that in vsd and you also listen that even in pd theek hai austin flint murmur very good that is in aortic regurgitation next important is graham steels murmur where will you listen this graham steels murmur you will listen this graham steels murmur in pulmonary hypertension causing pulmonary regurgitation pulmonary hypertension causing pulmonary regurgitation then retents murmur you will have that in case of complete heart block dox murmur you will have that in left anterior descending artery stenosis mill wheel murmur you will have that in air emboli then lastly gibson's murmur where will you listen gibson's murmur that is pda patent ductus arteriosus so named murmurs very very important area for your questions theek hai murmur ka topic khatam ho gaya the next important is the valvular heart disease so valvular heart diseases mein the first is mitral stenosis yes murmurs is it done all of you can you remember now all the murmurs continuous systolic diastolic named murmurs theek hai then coming to the see uh, your uh, led stenosis you will have diastolic murmur hmm, dox murmur it is a diastolic murmur right whenever there is led stenosis when will the uh, heart receive the blood the heart will receive the blood during diastole so during diastole if there is any stenosis of left anterior descending artery there will be a murmur that will be produced during diastole that is what is your dox murmur theek hai narsima right okay now the next is area of mitral orifice very simple and easy question that is 4 to 6 cm square now depending upon the valve area i'll show you a table don't get confused by the entire bulk of the table what is important in that i'll tell you right so isme important points jo hai when will you call it as very severe mitral stenosis very severe mitral stenosis is that when the valve area is less than 1 cm square when will you call it as severe mitral stenosis when the valve area is less than or equal to 1.5 cm square when will you call progressive mitral stenosis when the valve area is more than or equal to 1.5 cm square then mitral stenosis ka important etiology kya hoga what is the important etiology causing mitral stenosis that will be rheumatic fever rheumatic fever is the most common cause for mitral stenosis the remaining all other etiology you can see that mitral annular calcification 
parachute mitral valve or congenital mitral stenosis systemic lupus erythematosus and rheumatoid arthritis and storage disorder that is mucopolysaccharidosis that is hurler syndrome but most common cause jo hai rheumatic fever theek hai then auscultation is very very important in ms first start sound kaise rahega that will be loud do you have soft s1 in ms yes where will you have soft s1 in ms agar mitral stenosis if it is calcified then you will have soft s bit then how will be s2 s2 the p2 will be loud additional heart sound kya hai what is the additional heart sound in mitral stenosis between s2 and s1 that is called diastolic phase between s2 and s1 you will listen a mid diastolic murmur and in early part of the diastole you will listen an opening snap and in late part of the diastole you will have pre systolic accentuation this will be the auscultation in case of ms then after this why this p2 will be loud why this p2 will be loud p2 will be loud because mitral stenosis patients ka ek important complication hai ki pulmonary hypertension because of pulmonary hypertension the p2 will be loud then what are the complications of mitral stenosis mitral stenosis complications are atrial fibrillation dysphagia wheeze and ortner syndrome ortner syndrome is the question any one of you what is ortner syndrome ortner syndrome is the question any one of you what is ortner syndrome ortner syndrome is there will be compression of recurrent laryngeal nerve causing hoarseness of voice right the dilated left atrium will compress the recurrent laryngeal nerve whenever the recurrent laryngeal nerve is compressed there will be hoarseness of voice okay that is called as the ortner syndrome then how will you diagnose mitral stenosis diagnosis of mitral stenosis ecg se ab diagnose kar sakte hai kya yes we can diagnose any one of you what will be the ecg finding in ms yes the ecg finding in mitral stenosis is that you will have the p mitral why is this p mitral due to this particular p mitral is due to left atrial hypertrophy right that is due to left atrial hypertrophy so that is what is your p mitral then test x ray ka findings kya hai mitral stenosis mein there will be straightening of the left heart border normally left heart border straight raita hai kya no left heart border you have the curvature but because of your left atrial dilatation the, or left atrial hypertrophy you will have straightening of the left heart border and another very very important finding is double density sign what is this double density sign you see this is one shadow on the right side and this is the second shadow on the right side and this double density sign is also due to what that is also due to left atrial dilatation theek okay? hai then what is the important finding in the 2d echo in the 2d echo you will get this classical hockey stick appearance why is this hockey stick appearance that is due to restricted anterior mitral leaflet mobility you get this hockey stick appearance now can anyone tell me where will you get hockey stick appearance in the ecg where will you get hockey stick appearance in the ecg anyone very good galva that will be the digoxin effect in digoxin effect you will have this hockey stick appear theek okay? hai in ecg a 2d echo mein mitral stenosis right yeah narsima is asking sir which is right atrium which is left atrium theek okay? hai so this is left atrium this is right atrium normally left atrium nahi dikhega aapko kyun left atrium is present behind the sternum in a normal individual 
so left atrium is normally not seen but because of left atrial enlargement you are able to see the left atrium in the right parasternal area and that is giving you the double density then mitral stenosis patients may treatment kya hoga what will be the treatment so treatment is that salt restriction and as well as diuretics kyun because mitral stenosis patients may clinical features kya hoga dyspnea why dyspnea that is because of increase in your pulmonary capillary wedge pressure causing pulmonary edema so you give diuretics next question is very very important any one of you which procedure is being done in the image shown which procedure is being done in the image shown yes which particular procedure is being done right that is nothing but your yes percutaneous mitral balloon valvotomy so what is the indication for pbmv if there is severe or very severe mitral stenosis and along with that there are symptoms of mitral stenosis then it's an indication for pbmv and you should also know what are the contraindications for pbmv agar valve is calcified don't do pbmv if there is left atrium having thrombus don't do pbmv and if ms is associated with moderate to severe mr don't do pbmv so these are the contraindications for pbmv right that is percutaneous mitral balloon valvotomy theek hai right and ye pura conditions mein fir kya karna hai you should directly do mitral valve replacement right you should directly do mitral valve replacement because you cannot do pbmv in those patients so you have to do mitral valve replacement done that is about mitral stenosis the next important valvular pathology is mr mitral regurgitation you should know the important cause of mr the important cause of mr is mitral valve prolapse then the remaining all rheumatic fever infective endocarditis mitral annular calcification or we also have secondary mr secondary mr jo hai it is secondary to coronary artery disease dilated cardiomyopathy restrictive cardiomyopathy papillary muscle dysfunction that will be secondary mr and you know what is the important question in the mvp that is right to call it as mitral valve prolapse right to call it as mitral valve prolapse how much like mitral valves should prolapse into the left atrium by mitral valves should prolapse into the left atrium by how much mm how much mm that is by 2 mm that is a multiple choice question so from the baseline from the baseline of the mitral valve annulus the mitral valve has to prolapse by 2 mm into the left atrium that is called mitral valve prolapse okay right and in mitral regurgitation what will be the symptoms the most co common symptom will be dyspnea why dyspnea that is due to pulmonary venous congestion and there will be fatigue why fatigue because cardiac output kaha hai where is the cardiac output the when the left ventricle is contracting the blood is going into left atrium so cardiac output is reduced so they will have fatigue and these patients with mr they land up in heart failure with reduced ejection fraction so they will have an additional heart sound that is s3 what about the murmur murmur already i have discussed that is pan systolic murmur where will you listen this murmur you will listen this murmur at the apex of the heart where it will radiate to it will radiate to the axilla okay do you have any abnormalities of the heart sounds yes what is that abnormality the first heart sound will be soft and if there is development of pulmonary hypertension even your p2 also can be loud right even there is pulmonary hypertension even your p2 can be loud so soft s1 loud p2 s3 will be there if there is left ventricular failure with pan systolic mark okay so that is about your mr auscultation per mr how will you diagnose diagnosis is by your 2d echo that will be the 
indication uh, that is the first line uh, uh, investigation in mitral valve uh, regurgitation then treatment kya dena these patients are developing heart failure so you give diuretics mitral valve replacement karna hai kya yes you have to do mitral valve replacement there are certain indications for mitral valve replacement what are those indications those indications are when there is ejection fraction of the left ventricle less than 60 percent with mr then you should do mitral valve replacement or when left ventricular end systolic dimension if it is less than 45 mm then also you need to do mitral valve replacement okay so mitral valve replacement ka zurat raiga mr patients when ejection fraction less than 60 percent or left ventricular end systolic diameter i'm sorry left, left ventricular end systolic diameter more than 45 mm right more than 45 mm okay this completes your mr then next important is the aortic valve diseases aortic valve diseases only two minutes i'll finish aortic valve that is as aortic stenosis that is most common cause of aortic stenosis in children first of all how much is the normal aortic valve area normal aortic valve area is 3 to 4 centimeter square when will you call aortic stenosis when the valve area is less than 2 centimeter square we use the word aortic stenosis then what is the etiology children's may aortic stenosis ho sakta hai kya yes what is the most common cause bicuspid aortic valve right and what is the most common cause in adults that will be sclerotic aortic valve Fir, aortic stenosis may what will be the clinical features just remember the mnemonic that is sad sad may kya hai shortness of breath a stands for angina right and s is your syncopal attack okay b stands for dyspnea syncopal attack angina dyspnea right then examination what is very very important if you take the pulse pressure you will have a narrow pulse pressure why you will have narrow pulse pressure because systolic blood pressure is reduced so that is the reason why you will have narrow pulse pressure auscultation may kuch problem hai kya yes the second heart sound it will be soft that particularly a2 component Fir murmur kya hoga murmur will be the ejection systolic murmur murmur will be ejection systolic murmur if the patient is symptomatic what will you do you have to do surgical correction of the valve valve replacement you have to right see these are see these type of some quick pointers you can see on my instagram handle right my instagram handle will be or it is rajesh gubba right so you can follow me on my instagram for this quick pointers of the various topics which will be useful for your final quick revision right so this is about your as aortic stenosis then followed by that last important valvular lesion will be ar aortic regurgitation answer this question aortic regurgitation does not occur in aortic regurgitation does not occur in does not occur in acute myocardial infarction in acute myocardial infarction what you can have is mr but not ar whereas marfan's rheumatic heart disease infective endocarditis you can have aortic regurgitation in fact what is the most common cause of ar the most common cause of ar will be rheumatic heart disease right and your marfan's it's a connective tissue disorder osteogenesis imperfecta ehlers danlos syndrome you can have ar and even some connective tissue disorders like ankylosing spondylitis you can have this aortic regurgitation sexually transmitted disease syphilis can cause this aortic regurgitation aortic regurgitation may important points kya hai very very important is the peripheral signs Perif 
So there are almost like 10 to 15 peripheral signs. But what is very important, I, have, I will just summarize here. Ek hoga Corrigan's pulse, which is nothing but your Warhammer pulse, which is also called collapsing pulse. Next thing is Demoset sign. Demoset sign is head nodding with each cardiac cycle. That is called Demoset sign. Muller sign. What is Muller sign? It is the pulsations in the uvula with each cardiac cycle. That is called Muller sign. Twinkie sign. What is Twinkie sign? Pulsations. Capillary pulsations over the nail bed. That is called Twinkie sign. Then Trop sign. What is Trop sign? Trop signs are nothing but the pistol shot sounds over the femoral artery. That will be the Trop sign. Next thing is Durosi sign. What is Durosi sign? It is the murmur which is heard over the femoral artery. That is systolic and diastolic murmur. That is called Durosi sign. Then the Hill sign. What is Hill sign? Systolic blood pressure in the femoral artery is more than the brachial artery by more than 20 millimeters of mercury. That is what is your Hill sign and hill sign also tells you about the CVRP. Agar systolic blood pressure in femoral artery is more than 60 millimeters of mercury in the femoral artery than compared to brachial artery. Man lijiye, like femoral artery mein systolic blood pressure jo hai, it is something like 200. Right? And brachial artery mein systolic blood pressure is something like 130. It is called severe AR. It is called severe AR. So that is about the important peripheral signs. Actually, you have many peripheral signs. What are very important, I have discussed. And you know what is very important point? All these peripheral signs are present only in chronic AR. You will not have them in case of acute AR. In acute AR, you don't have peripheral signs. You have peripheral signs only in chronic AR. Then how do you treat these patients with AR? These AR, they are, these patients, they are landing up in left ventricular failure. So, the standard treatment of left ventricular failure, diuretics they do, once pulmonary edema is not there, you can give ACE inhibitors or ARBs and then aldosterone antagonists. One question is, can you give beta blockers in AR? Can you give beta blockers in AR? Any one of you? Please tell me this point. Can you give beta blockers in AR? The answer is no. Because when you give beta blockers, the aortic regurgitation will further get precipitated. Why? Because beta blockers will increase the diastolic time. So that is the reason why AR, no beta blockers. Okay? Right. Then, when will you do aortic valve replacement? Aortic valve replacement you have to do when the ejection fraction is reduced to less than 55% or when the left ventricular end systolic diameter is more than 55 mm, then you have to do aortic valve replacement. Okay? So that is done about your aortic regurgitation and this finishes your valvular heart diseases. MS, MR, AS, AR. These four valvular heart diseases are important. And just remember the points what I have discussed that will be more than enough. The next important is the pericardial disorders. So in the pericardial disorders, what is very important is acute pericarditis. And you know what is a very important question? What is the most common cause of acute pericarditis? The most common cause of acute pericarditis, jo hai, it is in viral origin. What is that viral infection? Any one of you? Which particular viral infection? You will have this pericarditis. You have, the most common virus will be Coxsackie A and as well as Coxsackie B virus. Most common. Then followed by that ecovirus. Then followed by that ecovirus. Then pericarditis may, what will be the signs and symptoms? You have a triad. What is the triad? Triad hoga apka. One important point is chest pain and this particular chest pain, it is a pointed pain and this chest pain increases with inspiration. Then on auscultation, you will listen a pericardial rub and 
you have some peculiar ecg findings what will be that peculiar ecg findings let me tell you that now that peculiar ecg findings will be there will be global st segment elevation except avr right and that too it will be concave st segment elevation then along with that there will be pr segment depression that will be global pr segment depression except avr okay so this will be the peculiar ecg findings what will you give treatment it is pericard itis itis is what inflammation so what will you give anti inflammatory drugs what are those anti inflammatory drugs you give high dose aspirin right you give high dose aspirin right agar aspirin se kaam nahi ho rahe the patient is not getting better with your aspirin then fir kya de sakte hai steroids de sakte you can give steroids they are also anti inflammatory drugs so that is about your acute pericard done the next important topic will be the constrictive pericarditis so what is the definition of the constrictive pericarditis the definition of the constrictive pericarditis is that the pericardium it will be thick and as well as scarred thick scarred calcified तो उस वजह से प्रॉब्लम क्या होगा प्रॉब्लम जो है द वेंट्रिकल्स आर अनएबल टू रिलैक्स बिकॉज पेरिकार्डियम इज थिक एंड स्कार्ड एंड कैल्सिफाइड सो डू यू थिंक दैट द वेंट्रिकल्स कैन रिलैक्स नो वेंट्रिकल्स कैन नॉट रिलैक्स इन केस ऑफ कंस्ट्रक्टिव पेरिकार्डाइटिस सो व्हाट टाइप ऑफ डिसफंक्शन विल बी दिस दिस विल बी डायस्टोलिक डिसफंक्शन so then what is the most common cause of constrictive pericarditis most common cause of constrictive pericarditis will be sequelae of pyopericardium sequelae of pyopericardium this pyopericardium can be caused by your tuberculosis as well right this pyopericardium is caused by your tuber pyopericardium is what pus in the pericardium the word pyo means pus pericardium pus in the pericardium that can be caused by your infection that is tuberculosis and if this pus is organized then it becomes constrictive pericarditis now very very important question related to constrictive pericarditis is square root sign what is this square root sign so this particular square root sign it is a cardiac catheterization finding of pressure changes right of pressure changes within the ventricles right within the ventricles that is what is your square root sign okay so whenever the ventricle is relaxing the pressure drops down dip when the ventricular filling is there there will be elevation in the pressure so elevation now ventricle do you think that it can completely relax no 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 because pericardium is thick and calcified so this thick and calcified pericardium will not allow the ventricle to completely relax so immediately there will be a static pressure that is what is called plateau so you will have a dip elevation and then plateau so that is what is your square root sign in cardiac catheterization the next important is the next important is the broad bend sign what is this broad bend sign it is an apex finding how will be the apex in constrictive pericarditis the apical impulse is reduced and it retracts in systole that is what is called as the broad bend sign why is the apical impulse reduced because pericardium is thick and calcified so you cannot feel that particular apical impulse it is reduced and retracts in systole and that is called the broad bend sign theek okay? hai then auscultation mein additional sound kya hoga what will be the additional sound that will be the pericardial knock and pericardial knock is it a high pitched sound or low pitched sound it is a high pitched sound is it a systolic sound or a diastolic sound it is a diastolic sound that is what is your pericardial knock 
then what will be the ECG finding in constrictive pericarditis? Similar to that of restrictive cardiomyopathy. What did you have in restrictive cardiomyopathy? You had this low voltage criteria or low voltage complexes. The same thing will be there even in constrictive pericarditis. Q because pericardium is thick and calcified. Jo bhi electricity develop ho rahe myocardium mein, wo pura transmit nahi ho rahe chest ke upar. The entire electrical activity is not getting transmitted onto the surface of the chest. Thereby you get this low voltage calcification or low voltage complexes. Chest x-ray important hai kya? Yes, it is important. Why it is important? When you do a chest x-ray, you will find this calcifications. Right? You see this? A beautiful calcification that you can... See, for us it is beautiful, right? But for the patient it is very bad, okay? So, that is the calcification that you can make out in the chest x okay? And in the 2D echo, what is that you will find? In the 2D echo, you will find a septal bounds, right? You will find the septal bounds. The septum, it will be bouncing to the right and left, during the inspiration and expiration and you will have this diastolic dysfunction investigation of choice kya hai what is the confirmatory investigation the confirmatory investigation is mri right confirmatory investigation jo hai mri mri mein kya dekhna hai what will you see in mri you will see that the pericardium is thick Criteria kitna hai? How much should be that increase in thickness? Agar 4 mm se zada hai pericardial thickness, right? Agar pericardial thickness 4 mm se zada hai, then it is considered to be constrictive pericarditis. Then it is considered to be constrictive pericarditis. Okay? Right. Then treatment kya dena hai? Very simple. Ye diastolic dysfunction ki wajay se problem kya hoga? Heart failure develop hoga, pulmonary edema develop hoga, you give diuretics, right? Diuretics le liya patient, salt bhi nahi le re patient, phir bhi dysnia hai. Patient is on diuretics, patient is on salt restriction, still there is dysnia, right? Saans lene ke taklif aur bhi hai diuretic lene ke baad bhi. Then what will you do? You have to do pericardiectomy. Right? Strip out the pericardium. So, when will you do pericardiectomy? Only refractory to medical management. Then you will do pericardiectomy. The next important topic in the cardiology will be hypertension. Right? So, what is the most common cause of hypertension in adults? Most common cause of hypertension in adults will be essential hypertension. Almost 85% of causes for hypertension will be essential. Essential bole to kya hai? Idiopathic. We don't know what is the cause. But 15% they contribute to the secondary. Secondary bole to kya hai? There is an underlying cause for the hypertension. Any one of you, most common cause of secondary hypertension? Most common cause of secondary hypertension? That nahi nahi nahi, renovascular nahi hai, renal parenchymal disease hai. Renal parenchymal disease, that will be the most common cause for secondary hypertension. Okay? Then, uske baad hoga aapka causes of isolated systolic hypertension. Isolated systolic hypertension, you will have that in AR. You will have that in case of patent ductus arteriosus. You will have that in case of Thyrotoxicosis, in all these conditions, you will have isolated systolic hypertension. And what are the conditions where you will have unequal blood pressure between the right and as well as the left arm? Unequal blood pressure between the right and left arm, you will have that in case of Takayasu arthritis. You will have that in case of coactation of iota. You will have that in case of Supravalvular aortic stenosis. You will have that in case of aortic dissection. You will have that in case of 
obstructive aorto arteritis right obstructive aorto arteritis these are all the conditions where you will have unequal blood pressure between the right and left arm sir normal blood pressure kitna rahe na normal blood pressure see whatever we are following now is your jnc 8 hmm? what we are following now is jnc 8 according to jnc 8 adults may blood pressure rahe na hai less than 140 by 90 Elderly may blood pressure, elderly bole to more than 60 years. Elderly may blood pressure rhina hai less than 150 by 90. Agar comorbidities hai, then it is not less than 140 by 90, it is less than 130 by 80. Agar patient ko coronary artery disease hai, diabetes hai, CKD hai, then blood pressure should be less than 130 by 80. Theek hai, mera patient ko blood pressure baut zada hai, like he is not accepting that, right? He is not willing to take any medication sir mera patient ko bol rahe ki agar uh, tablet nahi liye to blood pressure aur zyada hoga aur nas phat jayega then what can you advise first what is the first important uh, treatment the first important treatment is lifestyle modification lifestyle modi modification mein kya advise karne hai ek hoga weight reduction is very very important dusra hoga Acquiring the dash diet. Dash diet bole to diet which is which is rich in fruits, which is rich in vegetables, which is like low fat dairy products. That is called as dash diet. Right? Weight reduction honi ke wajay se kitna blood pressure kam ho sakta. Har 10 kg ko 5 to 20 millimeters of mercury kam hoga. For every 10 kg, 5 to 20 millimeters of mercury uh, blood pressure can be reduced. And by adopting the dash diet, the blood pressure can be reduced by almost 8 to 14 millimeters of mercury. TK sir, right? First line management ho gaya, right? Weight reduction kar diya patient or dash diet bhi acquire kiya, phir bhi blood pressure aur zada hi hai. Then you need to start anti-hypertensive drugs. So in blacks, right? The Indian population is considered as blacks. So in blacks, what is the first line drug? Either you give diuretic or calcium channel blockers. If at all, if you are giving diuretic, which diuretic will you give? Hydrochlorothiazide. That is, thiazide diuretics are the first line uh, antihypertensive. And in others, right, in all others, like whites or you take Caucasians, every them, along with calcium channel blockers and diuretics, the first line antihypertensives are ACE inhibitors or angiotensin receptor blockers, right. And elderly individuals, the preferable will be your calcium channel blocker, okay. So, now just remember this table for us. Hmm. This table you remember for us. All ages. What is the first line antihypertensive? Diuretic or calcium channel blocker. Your ACE inhibitor, ARB, they are all second line. Now I am coming up with a very important question. When will you use the word resistant hypertension? When will you use the word resistant hypertension? Any one of you? We use the word resistant hypertension when we are using three antihypertensives and that too full dose of that particular antihypertensives. And in that three, one should be diuretic. Right? In that three, one should be diuretic. Okay? That is resistant hypertension. Then next is refractory hypertension. Refractory hypertension kya hai? Remember, 4% patients may. 4% of patients with resistant hypertension, they can develop refractory hypertension. Refractory hypertension kya hai? Patient is taking more than or equal to 5 antihypertensives, but still the blood pressure is high. That is called refractory hypertension. Okay? Right. That is about your topic of hypertension. The last topic in cardiology will be infective endocarditis. What is infective endocarditis? Infective endocarditis is nothing but the formation of the friable vegetations. Where will be this friable vegetations? Over the valves. Now, the question is, which of the following is the most friable vegetation? Which of the following is the most friable vegetation? The most friable vegetation, you will see that in case of the infective endocarditis. Hmm? You will see that in case of infective endocarditis. So, according to the friability, if you see the uh, 
uh, other conditions where you can have vegetations, infective endocarditis, most friable vegetations. Next will be non-bacterial thrombotic endocarditis. Next, rheumatic endocarditis. And which is the least friable vegetations that will be your, in your SL, that is Lidman Sachs endocarditis. Okay? Then, next important is most commonly caused by bacterial endocarditis is most commonly caused by the most common organism causing bacterial endocarditis, the highly virulent organism that will be your Staphylococcus aureus. Hmm? That will be Staphylococcus aureus. Very important point is prosthetic valve endocarditis. See, uh, prosthetic valve endocarditis, what is that? There is some problem in the valve. Native valve is being replaced by a prosthetic valve. On that, if there is development of infective vegetation, that is called prosthetic valve endocarditis. Is me questions kya puchega aapko? Right? What is the most common organism causing prosthetic valve endocarditis? So remember, eight saal tak, the most common organism is coagulase negative staphylococcus. Right? Ek saal tak, the most common organism is coagulase negative staphylococcus. Right? Ek saal hone ke baad, the most common organism will be streptococcus viridans. Right? Ek saal hone ke baad, the most common organism will be streptococcus viridans. Right? Very, very important question in the infective endocarditis. What is Osler's triad? What is Osler's triad, which is also called Austrian syndrome? You will have pneumonia. You will have meningitis. You will have infective endocarditis. What is the common orga organism causing Osler's triad? That will be your pneumococcus. That is your streptococcus pneumonia. Right? Then, the next important question is, in the infective endocarditis, which one of the following cardiac lesion is at highest risk of occurrence of infective endocarditis? Highest risk. Yes, who will answer this? Right, so the correct answer here will be, no, 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 it is not mitral stenosis. It is valvular aortic regurgitation. You, you need to know this table. Very important table. Please remember it is very, very important. Which are the high risk conditions? Aortic regurgitation, aortic stenosis, mitral regurgitation, tetralogy of fallow, coactation of aorta, patent ductus arteriosus, ventricular septal defect. These are all high risk lesions for the development of your infective endocarditis and even prosthetic valve which are moderate risk lesions. Moderate risk lesions are mitral stenosis, tricuspid stenosis, pulmonary stenosis, mitral valve prolapse with mitral regurgitation. These are the moderate risk lesions. Which are the low risk lesions that will be MVP without MR, right? MVP without MR and then ASD, atrial septal defect. These will be low risk lesions for the development of infective endocarditis. And in infective endocarditis, you need to know some image-based questions. The image-based questions, what is that you will see in the pulp of the fingers? In the pulp of the fingers, the painful lesions, they are the Osler's nodes. Whereas in the palm and soles, these will be the painless lesions. These painless lesions, they are Roth spots. Sorry, Janeway lesions. I'm very sorry. So, Osler's nodes, painful. Janeway lesions, painless. Okay? Then, you can also have the digital infarct. Digital infarct is what you say, ho sakta hai, infective endocarditis patients may, because small, small emboli, they can enter into small vessels. When small emboli enter into the small vessels of the digits, there can be digital infarct. Then, ye image identify, karo please. Please identify this image. Yes, so this will be your Roth spots, right? This will be your Roth spots, okay? Then, what is that retinal hemorrhage in patients with the infective endocarditis, okay? And what is the name of the criteria? The name of the criteria is Duke's criteria. And you should know the Duke staging. Duke staging, we use in carcinoma rectum. Duke scoring, we use that in case of chronic stable angina. So, this is about your, the uh, criteria, name of the criteria. Treatment kya de sakte hai? Infection hai, kya dete aapne? Antibiotic, 
which antibiotic you will give? Ceftriaxone plus vancomycin. Right, ceftriaxone plus vancomycin. This is about your infective endocarditis. This finishes the quick revision of your cardiology. Right, medicine when you compare with other subjects, thoda voluminous hai. Right, you have many topics. Even if you take 5 to 10 minutes for one topic, it will take almost like 2 hours. Okay, because in, in the cardiology, we have nearly around 20 topics. Even if you take 10 minutes each, it will take nearly around 2 hours. Okay, right. So, shall we have a quick break? Shall we have a quick break now? Okay, so you just take a break for 15 minutes. Then we will come and Right, we will come and revise the endocrinology. Hmm? We will come and revise the endocrinology. Okay, right. So, yeah, yes, Abai, the major criteria are the major criteria are the vegetations which is diagnosed by your 2D eco. Next, cultures. How many cultures? More than or equal to two cultures should be positive. These two will be major criteria. And there are five minor criteria. What are those five minor criteria? Presence of fever, right. Then immunological phenomenon, then vascular phenomenon, then the culture which is not meeting the major criteria and vegetations not meeting the major criteria. These will, five will be minor criteria. Okay, right. So, we will just take a break for 15 minutes. Then we will come back and discuss all these endocrinology topics. Okay, right. Thank you. Please stay until end. Definitely, you are going to get 25 marks out of this session. Okay, right. All right. So, the next important topic in the quick revision uh, in your medicine will be the endocrinology. So, in the endocrinology, these are all the topics which I will be discussing. So, the time which is given for your endocrinology will be like one hour. Okay. So, within one hour, I will revise all these topics. Okay, so stay tuned with me. Definitely, you will get five marks in this revision. Right. So, in the first topic, that is acromegaly. The first topic will be acromegaly. So, acromegaly, what exactly is the problem? It is increase in your growth hormone in adults. That is what is called acromegaly. So, how will be the appearance of the individual? So, the appearance of the individual is that they will have this frontal bosing. If you take this is the forehead, so there will be frontal bosing. And how will be the nose of the individual? They will have a broad nose. And how will be the jaw? The jaw will be protruded forward. And what is that called as? That is called as prognathism. And if you see the extremities of these individuals, you see they will have a very broad hands. And if you see the foot, they will have the broad foot. And within the fingers, if you see, they have like swollen fingers. And what will be the overall clinical picture in patients with the acromegaly? So, first of all, what is the important etiology that will cause acromegaly? That is, somatotroph type of the pituitary adenoma. Somatotroph type of pituitary adenoma it is the most common cause for your acromegaly. And that too, which type of pituitary adenoma is that? It is macro adenoma where the size is more than 10 mm. That will be the most common cause for your somatotroph type of pituitary adenoma, which is that macro adenoma. It is not micro adenoma. Micro adenoma can also cause, but which is more common? Macro is more common than compared to that of micro. Now, what are the important clinical features? The important clinical features will be this macro adenoma will cause the local tumor effect. That means it will cause compression of the optic chiasma causing visual field defects. And how will be the extremities? There will be acral enlargement. Hands and foot enlargement will be there. And musculoskeletal manifestations just now we have discussed that is prognathism will be there. Sleep disturbance. Why? Because it's got tongue. If you see the tongue of these patients with acromegaly, they will have an enlarged tongue. This enlarged tongue will can fall over the 
respiratory tree during sleep and that can cause the obstructive sleep apnea and skin manifestations they will have a very thick skin right and the sweat glands they will be hypertrophy so there will be hypertrophy and hyperplasia of the sweat glands so this hypertrophy and hyperplasia of the sweat glands will result in hyperhidrosis where there will be profuse sweating and what will be the gastrointestinal manifestations that will be in the form of gastrointestinal polyps and what are the cardiovascular manifestations that will be left ventricular hypertrophy hypertension and then the cause of death in these individuals will be congestive heart failure all the visceral organs they are enlarged hepatomegaly splenomegaly thyroid enlargement everything will be there and in case of mammosomatotroph type of pituitary adenoma they can also have galactoria and carbohydrate intolerance so blood glucose levels are also elevated so what will be the cause of death in these individuals the cause of death in these individuals will be development of the congestive heart failure now first important question is what is the best initial test any one of you please what will be the best initial test quickly anyone best initial test best initial test will be igf1 levels that will be elevated what is igf1 somatomedin somatomedin levels are elevated then what is the confirmatory test the confirmatory test will be growth hormone suppression test right growth hormone suppression test that will be the confirmatory test that means failure of growth hormone suppression in spite of glucose load is called as the growth hormone suppression test okay that is a confirmatory test and then you have some imaging what is that imaging this is a very very important question so if you take the x ray of the digits what is that you will observe isolated right isolated spade shaped phalanx right isolated spade shaped phalanx okay then what will happen to your heel pad thickness so if you observe the heel pad there will be increase in the heel pad thickness how much is the normal heel pad thickness normal heel pad thickness jo hai ye 13 to 21 mm hai but here in patients with acromegaly that will be more than 21 mm so it will be increase in the heel pad thickness finally how do you treat these patients with the acromegaly the treatment of choice in acromegaly will be transphenoidal surgical resection of the pituitary but what will be the problem because of that the problem is the individual can develop hypopituitary right and the primary treatment is always surgery then coming to the medical management in the medical management what will be the drug of choice any one of you what will be the drug of choice agar surgical treatment ke liye patient taiyar nahi hai then you should give medical management drug of choice kya hai what is a drug of choice drug of choice is very good that is octreotide octreotide then what are the other alternative drugs that you can give the other alternative drugs that you can give is bromocriptin then what is the second line agent the second line agent will be pegvisomant right second line agent will be pegvisomant okay then next important is right terlipressin we don't use here we don't use terlipressin in case of the acromegaly okay right then next important you see this question a patient was prescribed bromocriptin for prolactinoma and responded to her symptoms so what do you think is its mechanism of action what do you think is the mechanism of action of bromocriptin yes so if you take this bromocriptin remember bromocriptin is not a partial agonist to your d2 receptor 
right it is not a partial agonist it is a d2 receptor complete agonist right it is a d2 receptor complete agonist and you know what the bromocriptin will do in case of the prolactinoma in prolactinoma it normalizes the serum prolactin level hmm? it normalizes the serum prolactin level that is what the bromocriptin does it is not a d2 partial agonist it's a d2 complete agonist okay right now let us discuss about the prolactinoma right let us discuss about the prolactinoma so very simple question which of the following is the most common type of pituitary adenoma which is which of the following is the most common type of pituitary adenoma so you have two questions here so if the question is asked the most common tumor the question is asked most common secretory tumor right the most common tumor will be non secretory pituitary adenoma right non secretory pituitary adenoma if the question is asked most common secretory adenoma then the answer will be prolactinoma right the answer will be prolactinoma but it is not been asked here we don't have the option of non secretory adenoma then what would be the best answer here the best answer will be prolactinoma so please remember that's a very very important question okay right now the next important question you see here a 35 year old female presents with one year history of menstrual irregularity and galactoria she also has on and off headache on examination there revealed bitemporal superior quadrant nuclei fundus examination showed there is primary optic atrophy which of the following is the most likely diagnosis in this case craniopharyngioma pituitary macroadenoma uh, your uh, ophthalmic artery aneurysm chiasmal glioma right so what is the answer in this excellent my dear students right so the individual is having galactoria along with that there will be bitemporal superior quadrantanopia that means there is mass effect and even there is headache when will you have a mass effect you will have mass effect when there is macroadenoma but not in case of microadenoma okay right so what is the difference between micro and macroadenoma microadenoma means the size of the tumor is less than 10 ml macroadenoma means the size of the tumor will be more than 10 ml in microadenoma you will have only endocrine manifestations whereas in macroadenoma along with the endocrine manifestations you also have mass effect on the surrounding structures what is that mass effect on the surrounding structures that will be compression of the optic chiasma resulting in bitemporal hemianoma and what is the important differential diagnosis for prolactinoma can anyone answer this question what is the important differential diagnosis for prolactinoma yes any one of you please differential diagnosis for prolactinoma the important differential diagnosis for prolactinoma will be craniopharyngioma right and what is the difference even your craniopharyngioma can also cause hyperprolactinemia but the difference is the mass effect prolactinoma it will cause bitemporal superior quadrantanopia whereas craniopharyngioma it will cause bitemporal inferior quadrantanopia right it will cause bitemporal inferior quadrantanopia that is what you will have in case of craniopharyngeal and okay so that is the difference bitemporal superior quadrantanopia prolactinoma bitemporal inferior quadrantanopia craniopharyngeal okay right the next important is investigation of choice for hyperprolactinemia any one of you investigation of choice for hyperprolactinemia anyone investigation of choice will be 
सीरम प्रोलैक्टिन लेवल्स सीरम प्रोलैक्टिन लेवल्स नॉर्मल वैल्यू कितना होगा नॉर्मल वैल्यू जो है इट इज फाइव टू ट्वेंटी नैनोग्राम्स पर एम एल दैट विल बी द नॉर्मल वैल्यू बट इन प्रोलैक्टिनोमा प्रोलैक्टिन लेवल्स कितना होगा प्रोलैक्टिनोमा में लेवल्स जो है इट विल बी मोर देन टू हंड्रेड नैनोग्राम्स पर एम एल ठीक है फर्स्ट लाइन ट्रीटमेंट क्या होगा वॉट विल बी द फर्स्ट लाइन ट्रीटमेंट राइट वेदर इट इज माइक्रो अडिनोमा और माइक्रो अडिनोमा द फर्स्ट लाइन ट्रीटमेंट विल बी योर डोपमीन एगोनेस विच डोपमीन एगोनेस्ट कैन एनी वन टेल मी विच पर्टिकुलर डोपमीन एगोनेस्ट इज अ ड्रग ऑफ चॉइस विच पर्टिकुलर डोपमीन एगोनेस्ट इज अ ड्रग ऑफ चॉइस एनी वन ऑफ यू दैट विल बी योर राइट दैट विल बी नॉट ब्रोमोक्रिप्टिन इट इज केबर गोलिन राइट इट विल बी केबर गोलिन दैट विल बी द ड्रग ऑफ चॉइस ठीक है नेक्स्ट देन इन प्रेग्नेंसी राइट इन प्रेग्नेंसी द ड्रग ऑफ चॉइस विल बी ब्रोमोक्रिप्टिन राइट इन प्रेग्नेंसी द ड्रग ऑफ चॉइस विल बी ब्रोमोक्रिप्टिन okay and in spite of giving this dopamine agonist if the prolactin level does not decrease or if the size of the tumor does not decrease then you have to consider for surgery then you have to consider for surgery okay right so that was about your prolactinoma then coming to your hypopituitarism so what is the hormone in hypopituitarism what is hypopituitarism it is like partial or complete loss of anterior pituitary function right partial or complete loss of the anterior pituitary function now what is the first question that will be asked what is the hormone that is being reduced earliest what is the hormone that is reduced earliest in hypopituitarism any one of you please the hormone that is reduced earliest anyone very good that will be growth hormone growth hormone is the one which is reduced earliest then followed by that gonadotrophins what are those gonadotrophins that is follicle stimulating hormone and as well as the luteinizing hormone these are the next important hormones that are being reduced now what is the most common cause of hypopituitarism what is the most common cause of hypopituitarism that will be pituitary adenomas right pituitary adenomas that will be the most common cause of the pan hypopituitarism right now whenever you are treating right you will treat the patients you need to supplement all the hormones but what is the most important hormone that has to be supplemented any one of you what is the most important hormone that has to be supplemented a quick question anyone that will be cortisol cortisol is the first important hormone that has to be supplemented okay so three important questions the hormone which is lost i mean which is decreased first in hypopituitarism growth hormone most common cause pituitary adenoma the first hormone that has to be replaced corticosteroid theek okay? hai so we are done with the acromegaly we are done with the prolactinoma we are done with the hypopituitarism and next important now is the disorders related to the anti diuretic hormone theek okay? hai right now what is this diabetes insipidus yes until now is everyone comfortable any problem until here yes is there any problem until here i'm very happy that you people are very much interactive you are answering very nicely in the chat box okay now we'll move on to the next topic that is diabetes insipidus what is diabetes insipidus diabetes insipidus is that where there is deficiency of the anti diuretic hormone right where there is deficiency of the anti diuretic hormone either it is deficiency or it is resistance to the action of the anti diuretic hormone 
डायबिटीज इंसिपिडस में क्लिनिकल फीचर्स क्या होगा द क्लिनिकल फीचर इज दैट दे विल हैव पॉलियूरिया वेन विल यू यूज द वर्ड पॉलियूरिया वेन देर इज अबनॉर्मली लार्ज वॉल्यूम्स ऑफ डायल्यूट यूरिन and how much should be that abnormally large volume of dilute urine if you take for 24 hours it should be more than 3 liters per 24 hours or if you take per kg body weight so it should be more than 40 to 50 ml right 40 to 50 ml per kg in 24 hours right 24 hour urine volume it should exceed more than 40 to 50 ml per kg body weight okay right so that is about your diabetes insipidus and in case of diabetes insipidus i'll just show you a question please answer this let me see how many of you can answer this choose the best lab value for a patient with central diabetes insipidus choose the best lab value for a patient with central diabetes insipidus yes right so diabetes insipidus patients mein what should happen to the serum osmolality increase hona fir urine osmolality kya hona hai patients mein urine osmolality kam hona hai decrease hona hai so what is that answer that will be 50 bar 300 so urine osmolality kam hai aur serum osmolality zyada hai in the first option because normal serum osmolality is how much 285 to 295 milli osmoles and how much is the normal urine osmolality normal urine osmolality will be 300 to 1000 milli osmoles that will be the normal urine osmolality okay right now regarding the etiology we have one important question in the uh, diabetes insipidus regarding the etiology see actually you have etiology causing central diabetes insipidus and you have etiology causing nephrogenic diabetes insipidus okay central diabetes insipidus means where there is decrease in anti diuretic hormone nephrogenic diabetes insipidus means where there is resistance to the action of anti diuretic hormone now the question is the ulfram syndrome can anyone tell me what is ulfram syndrome ulfram syndrome will cause which type of diabetes insipidus ulfram syndrome is nothing but nephrogenic diabetes insipidus right nephrogenic diabetes insipidus ठीक है एंड इट इज आल्सो कॉल्ड एज डिड मोड सिंड्रोम राइट एंड व्हाट टाइप ऑफ इनहेरिटेंस इज योर उल्फ्राम उल्फ्राम सिंड्रोम इट इज मेनली ड्यू टू म्यूटेशन ऑफ डब्ल्यू एफ एस वन जीन म्यूटेशन राइट डब्ल्यू एफ एस वन जीन म्यूटेशन एंड द टाइप ऑफ इनहेरिटेंस इज ऑटोसोमल रेसिसिव टाइप ऑफ इनहेरिटेंस डी आई स्टैंड फॉर डायबिटीज इंसिपिडस dm will be diabetes mellitus oa stands for optic atrophy and the last d stands for deafness the last d stands for deafness please remember ulfram syndrome and you have many other causes okay can anyone tell me what are the drugs what are the drugs that will cause nephrogenic diabetes insipidus any one of you please the drugs causing nephrogenic diabetes insipidus will be lithium cisplatin then what are the other drugs amphotericin b right then next amino glycosides these are all the drugs and next methoxyflurane which is an inhalational anesthetic drug right these are all the drugs which are responsible for your nephrogenic diabetes insipidus okay right very good now what is the investigation of choice already investigations to mai bol diya what is that serum osmolality bad jayega or urine osmolality kam ho jayega urine osmolality will be reduced and what will happen to serum sodium serum sodium also will be elevated Then what will be the investigation of choice? That is the question. Any one of you, investigation of choice, kya hoga? Very good. The investigation of choice will be water deprivation test. Right? That will be the investigation of choice. Okay? Then followed by that 
you see this question a 33 year old lady presents with polyuria polydipsia her symptoms started soon after a road traffic accident six months ago the blood pressure is 120 by 80 no postural drop daily urine output is 6 to 8 liters sodium 130 potassium 3.5 urea 15 sugar 65 plasma osmolality 268 urine osmolality 45 what is the most likely diagnosis right no 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 it is not central diabetes insipidus what is the diagnosis the answer is psychogenic polydipsia the answer is psychogenic polydipsia why because if you take the question plasma osmolality 268 that means decreased urine osmolality 45 that means decreased diabetes insipidus mein kya hoga diabetes insipidus mein plasma osmolality bad jayega increases but here it is decreased where will you have this you will have this in case of <coughs> sorry you will have this in case of psychogenic polydipsia psychogenic polydipsia mein dono kam rehta hai okay next which of the following is the drug of choice for central diabetes sensibility what will be the drug of choice for central diabetes insipidus? The drug of choice for central diabetes insipidus will be desmopressin. Right? A vasopressin analog. What we give? Desmopressin. And this desmopressin, it can be given through inhalational route, can be given subcutaneous route, can be given intravenously. These are all the various routes by which you can give desmopressin. Okay? Then, what is the drug of choice for nephrogenic diabetes insipidus? Drug of choice for nephrogenic diabetes insipidus. Any one of you? Drug of choice for nephrogenic diabetes insipidus will be thiazides. That is hydrochlorothiazide. Right? Then what is the drug of choice for lithium induced diabetes insipidus? Drug of choice for lithium induced diabetes insipidus. Any one of you please? Amyloride, excellent. Amyloride will be the drug of choice for nephrogenic diabetes, lithium induced diabetes insipidus. Okay? So that is about your diabetes insipidus. The next important topic is SADH. SADH kya hoga? It is the condition where there is excessive increase in your antidiuretic hormone. Okay? Right. Now, SADH is associated with which type of bronchogenic carcinoma? Bronchogenic carcinoma is one of the etiology which will cause SADH. But which type of bronchogenic carcinoma? Very good. It is your small cell carcinoma of the lung, which is also called as oat cell carcinoma. Right, which is also called as oat cell carcinoma. And all the symptoms in SADH are due to what? These patients with SADH, they develop hyponatremia. So, hyponatremia ke vajay se SADH mein symptoms raiga. What will be that? Yeah, answer this. All are true regarding SADH except increased levels of antidiuretic hormone. Urine will be hypoosmolar, hyponatremia, adequate hydration state, which is the incorrect statement. Yes, quickly. Incorrect statement. Very good. So, SADH patients may urine will not be hypoosmolar. Urine will be hyperosmolar. Right? Why is that? Because the urinary sodium levels are elevated. That is the reason why urine will be hyperosmolar. So, all the clinical features in SADH are due to what? That is due to hyponatremia. What will be that? Hyponatremia ke vajay se, patient will be in altered sensorium. Patient will be in a, uh, they come, they present to you with seizures. Right? The patient may land up in coma and finally die. So, all the clinical features in patients with SADH is due to hyponatremia. Then, 
SADH patients may investigations kya hoga? Very very important. Please mark this slide as an important which I am about to teach you now. So first and foremost, the serum osmolality kya hoga? Kam ho jayega. Next urine osmolality. What will happen? Increases. Serum sodium. What will happen to serum sodium? Decreases. What will happen to the urinary sodium? Increases. Okay. Then what will happen to blood urea nitrogen and as well as serum creatine? That will be reduced. Okay. Then what will be the investigation of choice? Investigation of choice will be water loading test. What is the investigation there in diabetes insipidus? Water deprivation test. But whereas here it is water loading test. Okay. So that is about here the investigations in patients with the SADH. Okay. Right. The serum being hypoosmolar, that means how much will be the osmolality? Less than 285. Hmm? Less than 285. Okay. Right. Then you see the next question. SADH, all are true except. SADH, all are true except. Which is the incorrect statement. So, in patients with SADH, if you take the urinary sodium, urinary sodium will not be normal. What will happen to the urinary sodium? Urinary sodium is increased. And hyponatremia, yes, it will be there. And what is the drug of choice? Drug of choice will be Vapturns. Which particular Vapturns we give? We give Tolvapton. And this Tolvapton, it is given through oral route. And other Vapturn is Conivapton. Right? So, how do we give this Conivapton? This Conivapton is given through the intravenous route. So, the drug of choice will be Vapturns, that is vasopressin receptor antagonists, right? They will antagonize the V2 receptors which are present at the level of your collecting gun and thereby they are being used as a drug of choice. Actually, previously we were using Demiclocycline, but this Demiclocycline, it was causing nephrotoxicity. So, Demiclocycline was taken off. Now, the new drugs are the Vapturns. So, this finishes your pituitary disorders. So, what all we have finished now? Acromegaly. Hypopituitarism, prolactinoma, diabetes insipidus, SIADH, five topics we are done. Then next we will move on to adrenal gland disorders. So in the adrenal gland disorders, by seeing the image itself you can diagnose. What is this image suggestive of? Lady with central obesity and abdomen skin showing the purple stray. That is what is nothing but your Cushing syndrome. Right, Cushing syndrome. Now, you should know this important group of questions. Hmm? You should know this important group of questions. That is, the most common cause, right? Most common cause of Cushing's. What will be that? Most common cause of Cushing's? That will be iatrogenic steroid supplementation. Most common cause of non iatrogenic Cushing's that will be pituitary adenoma. What type of pituitary adenoma? That is corticotroph type of pituitary adenoma, which will be producing excess amount of ACTH. Then, most common cause of ACTH dependent type of Cushing's that is also the pituitary adenoma. What type of pituitary adenoma? Again, the same thing. Corticotroph type of pituitary adenoma, most common cause of ectopic ACTH causing Cushing's, that will be small cell carcinoma of the lung, which is nothing but the oat cell carcinoma. And finally, what is the most common cause of ACTH independent type of Cushing's, that will be adrenal adenoma. Right, that will be adrenal adenoma. So, these five questions related to the etiology are very important. Now, clinical features, earliest manifestation of the Cushing's, anyone? Earliest manifestation of the Cushing's will be weight gain. Right, and because of this weight gain, 
the individual will develop insulin resistance and will also develop diabetes mainly. Okay. Then next important is the skin manifestation. In Cushing syndrome, you will have this purple striae over the abdomen. There will be also easy bruisability and there will be also hyperpigmented skin. But this hyperpigmented skin, you will have that only in case of ACTH dependent type of Cushing's. Not in case of ACTH independent type of Cushing's. Okay. Next. Then, which of the following features is not seen in Cushing syndrome? Anyone? Which of the following features is not seen in patients with the Cushing syndrome? That will be hypoglycemia. So, hypoglycemia will not be there. In Cushing's, what will you have, my dear students? That will be hyperglycemia that will be there but not hypoglycemia. Remaining all, hypertension can be there, frank psychosis can be there and even hypokalemia can be there. Next, coming to the investigations in Cushing's. Yes, tell me now, what is the first line investigation in the Cushing's? What is the first line investigations in Cushing's? That is, you need to check for 24 hour urinary cortisol levels. So, 24 hour urinary cortisol levels, they are elevated. Right? 24 hour urinary cortisol levels are elevated. That will be the first line investigation in the cushion. Then, what is the earliest biochemical change in Cushing's? What is the earliest biochemical change in Cushing's? The earliest biochemical change in Cushing's will be loss of diurnal variation. Right? Loss of diurnal variation. That will be the earliest biochemical change. Right? What is that? Early in the morning, cortisol levels are high. Late in the evening, cortisol levels are very high. That is the earliest biochemical change. In a normal individual, early in the morning high, late in the evening low. But biochemical change will be loss of diurnal variation. Okay? Then, one important clinical scenario is a 50 year old male presents with history of hemoptysis. He is having truncal obesity and hypertension. Had an elevated ACTH level not suppressible with high dose dexamethasone. What would be the most probable diagnosis? What would be the most probable diagnosis? Any one of you? Right, very good. So, there are two points here. He is a chronic smoker that can predispose to the development of small cell carcinoma of the lung. Next, not suppressible with high dose of dexamethasone. You will have that in case of ectopic ACTH. Okay. Whereas with high dose of dexamethasone, if it is pituitary ACTH, the pituitary ACTH will decrease with high dose of dexamethasone, but not the ectopic ACTH. Okay. Then you should know the treatment. Yeah. Patient having Cushing syndrome due to adrenal tumor. What is the drug to be given? What is the drug to be given? Actually, what is the treatment of choice? The treatment of choice will be surgical resection. But if the patient does not or if the patient is not willing for surgery, the drug of choice will be ketoconazole. Ketoconazole ka mechanism of action kya hai? Ketoconazole ka mechanism of action jo hai, it is an adrenal enzyme inhibitor. And what is the friend of ketoconazole? The friend of ketoconazole is etomidate. The friend of ketoconazole is etomidate. Okay. Even your etomidate, it also, it is also an adrenal enzyme inhibitor, right? It is also an adrenal enzyme inhibitor. And adrenolytic agents are metotene. And drugs that will target the pituitary will be cabergoline. And when you do a bilateral adrenalectomy, you have to give replacement glucocorticoids. And that replacement glucocorticoids is by hydrocortisone. Now, when important question is Nelson syndrome. 
can anyone tell me what is nelson syndrome what is nelson syndrome what is nelson syndrome is nelson syndrome is a condition where when you do a bilateral adrenalectomy right when you do a bilateral adrenalectomy what will happen to the acth levels so the steroid levels will be reduced when steroid levels are reduced acth levels will be increased when acth is increased parallelly msh is also increased when msh is increased what will happen to the pigmentation there will be hyperpigmented skin and this hyperpigmented skin secondary to bilateral adrenalectomy that is what is called as the nelson syndrome okay so this is about your cushings next next important adrenal gland disorder will be the con syndrome next is con syndrome now let me show you a question you see this testing for primary aldosteronism should be done for all of the hypertensive patients except testing for primary hyperaldosteronism should be done for all the hypertensive patients except any one of you right so primary hyperaldosteronism is one of the cause for hypertension so sustained hypertension can be there resistant hypertension can be there right and requirement of four or more antihypertensives can be there but in hyperaldosteronism hyperkalemia will not be there aldosterone will cause potassium excretion so there will be hypokalemia but not hyperkalemia right hypokalemia ho sakta but not hyperkalemia okay then what is the so the answer is d fourth option then most common cause of con syndrome is most common cause of con syndrome is yes quick answer most common cause of the con syndrome is adrenal adenoma most common cause of primary hyperaldosteronism that will be bilateral adrenal hyperplasia right bilateral adrenal hyperplasia that will be the most common cause of primary hyperaldosteronism so most common cause of con syndrome is what adrenal adenoma we use the word cons only for adenoma we don't use that for bilateral adrenal hyperplasia okay then what will be the clinical features in primary aldosterone ka physiological action kya hai it will increase the sodium and water retention it will decrease the potassium levels it will decrease the h plus ion levels so because of increase in sodium and water retention there will be diastolic hypertension and remember they will have polyuria because of aldosterone escape phenomenon and there is no edema and even there is no edema is because of aldosterone escape phenomenon and hypokalemia this hypokalemia will cause very severe muscle weakness right will cause very severe muscle weakness and there can be also development of arrhythmias right there can be also development of arrhythmias and there is increased h plus ion excretion and that will result in metabolic alkalosis that will result in metabolic alkalosis so we have two forms of hyperaldosteronism one is primary hyperaldosteronism the other one is secondary hyperaldosteronism primary hyperaldosteronism is the problem is within the gland secondary hyperaldosteronism what are the etiologies congestive heart failure or cirrhosis of liver and how will you differentiate both of them that is based on the renin levels renin levels in primary that will be reduced 
renin levels in secondary will be increased. So based on renin levels, we can differentiate primary and as well as secondary. Then coming to the investigations. So what is the important screening test for your primary hyperaldosteronism? The important screening test will be aldosterone renin ratio. Right, aldosterone renin ratio that will be increased in case of the primary hyperaldosteronism. That is a screening test. Then, what is the confirmatory test for your primary hyperaldosteronism? The confirmatory test for primary hyperaldosteronism is oral salt solution test. Right, oral salt solution test. And if the individual cannot consume the oral salt solution, then you need to do IV saline suppression test. Okay, IV saline suppression test. Okay, so this will be the confirmatory test for your primary hyperaldosterone. Right, then how do you treat? What is the treatment of choice for primary hyperaldosteronism? The treatment of choice is surgical resection of the tumor. Right, surgical resection of the tumor. But if there is bilateral adrenal hyperplasia, hmm? if there is bilateral adrenal hyperplasia, we don't do surgical resection. In case of bilateral adrenal hyperplasia, the drug of choice will be aldosterone antagonist. And what will be that aldosterone antagonist? That will be spironolactone. Right, and with spironolactone, with spironolactone, what is the important adverse effect with spironolactone? What is the important adverse effect with spironolactone? That will be a tender gynecomastia. So, whenever the individual develops a tender gynecomastia, then in such case, what do we give? We give epilirinone, right? We give epilirinone, okay? And you should know the drugs causing gynecomastia. What are all the various drugs that will cause gynecomastia? I think you are aware of this particular mnemonic, okay? I hope you are all aware of this mnemonic. What is this? D stands for digoxin. What does this I stands for? Isonia Z. S stands for pyranolactone. T stands for thimetidine. T st K stands for ketoconazole. O stands for estrogen supplementation. S stands for still bestrol. Right? S stands for still bestrol. So, these are all the drugs which will cause the gynecomastia, right? Now, one last question on the topic of hyperaldosteronism, right? Prior to testing for hyperaldosteronism, patient should ideally hold all the medications except, that means, which among the following medications need not be stopped before testing for hyperaldosteronism? Any one of you? So, that will be, no, you have to stop diuretics. Hmm? Aldosterone antagonists, you have to stop. Otherwise, you will get the false negative value. AC inhibitors, you have to stop. Otherwise, you get the false negative value because it will suppress your aldosterone formation. NSAIDs, NSAIDs, what they will do? They will decrease the renal perfusion. There will be activation of RAS. So, there will be increase in aldosterone production. But verapamil does not affect the aldosterone synthesis. So, the answer is verapamil. So, holding the verapamil is not required. Okay? So, that is about your con syndrome. Then the next important adrenal gland disorder will be the Addison's. Right? Now, Addison's, what is this? It is adrenocortical insufficiency. So, right, you have primary and secondary adrenocortical insufficiency. 
primary means where is the problem the problem is within the adrenal gland itself whereas secondary means the problem is in the pituitary gland so thereby what will happen to acth levels in secondary reduced what will happen to the acth levels in primary increases because of your inhibition of feedback mechanism or by feedback mechanism the acth levels will be reduced in primary in primary which all hormones will be reduced steroids reduced aldosterone reduced weak sex hormones that is also being reduced whereas in secondary which all hormones will be reduced steroids that will be reduced aldosterone that will remain normal weak sex hormones that will be reduced right weak sex hormones that will be reduced so the difference is what the difference is your aldosterone the difference is your acth levels that is what is the difference between your primary and as well as secondary adrenocortical insufficiency right next what is the most common cause of adrenal insufficiency in india most common cause of adrenal insufficiency in india that will be tuberculosis whereas the most common cause of adrenocortical insufficiency in the west that will be autoimmune adrenalitis right that will be autoimmune adrenalitis that will be the most common cause of adrenocortical insufficiency in the west then what are the fungal infections that will cause addisons fungal infections that will cause addisons will be histoplasmosis then what are the viral infections that will cause addisons viral infections that will cause addisons will be cytomegalovirus right then what is adrenomyeloleukodystrophy adrenomyeloleukodystrophy it is an x linked disorder this is more commonly seen in males rather than females there will be adrenal insufficiency there will be also neurological manifestations in adrenomyeloleukodystrophy and there is also accumulation of fats right there is also accumulation of fats that is what is your adrenomyeloleukodystrophy next what are the infiltrative disorders that will cause addisons the infiltrative disorders that will be causing addisons will be hemochromatosis where there is excessive iron accumulation then sarcoidosis where there is accumulation of non caseating granuloma sarcoidosis right then these are the infiltrative disorders that will be causing addisons then what are the malignancies that will be causing addisons that will be metastasis to the adrenal gland and even lymphoma that can also cause the addisons so these are the malignancies that will cause the addisons then what will be the secondary adrenocortical insufficiency secondary means the problem is not within the adrenal gland the problem is in the pituitary so that will be the hypopituitarism right any trauma to the pituitary okay any hypoperfusion to the pituitary pituitary adenoma all these can cause adrenocortical secondary adrenocortical insufficiency then what will be the clinical features see because of glucocorticoid deficiency there will be hypoglycemia and they can also have hypotension because of mineralocorticoid deficiency there will be hyponatremia right and the individual will have hyperkalemia and the individual will have metabolic acidosis and adrenal androgen deficiency there will be loss of secondary sexual characteristic features that is loss of axillary hair and pubic hair then other features will be pigmentation so if you see the pigmentation in primary you will have hyperpigmented skin in secondary you will have hypopigmented skin and that hypopigmented skin is what is nothing but alabaster skin right 
Now I'll show you one of the important gray. Okay, and where will you have this hyperpigmentation in primary? That is over the palm and sole creases. Right? And you will also have this hyperpigmentation. So this will be the first place where you have the hyperpigmented skin in Addison's disease. And then followed by that, you also have pigmentation which is being distributed around the areola and as well as the axilla. Then even within the groin, then even within the oral mucosa. So these are all the places where you have the hyperpigmented skin. Now I will show you one important personality. Please identify this person. Please identify this person and tell me like what does he have? So he is nothing but a very great personality, John F. Kennedy. John F. Kennedy was the person who had this Addison's. Right, who had this Addison's and hypopigmented skin. Where will you have hypopigmented skin? That is in secondary adrenocortical insufficient. Right, next. Very important is Waterhouse Fredrickson syndrome. Waterhouse Fredrickson syndrome is adrenal crisis where there will be hypotension and death, and organism will be Neisseria meningitidis. That is meningococcal infection, mainly in case of children, right? And what is the drug of choice? Drug of choice will be hydrocortisone. And what will be the antibiotic that you should be giving? That will be ceftriaxone. So, Waterhouse Fredrickson syndrome is that which is seen in children or newborn, secondary to meningococcal infection causing adrenal crisis or adrenal hemorrhage. Then you should know the most diagnostic test. What is the investigation of choice? What is the investigation of choice? Investigation of choice will be right that will be ACTH stimulation test, which is also called cosyntopin test. Right, which is also called cosyntopin test. Right, then what will be the CT scan showing? CT scan shows the moth eaten adrenal gland. That will be the CT picture. Then coming to the treatment. So what will be the drug of choice in primary? Drug of choice in primary adrenocortical insufficiency will be oral hydrocortisone. Because in primary steroids, aldosterone and weak sex hormones, everything is reduced. And we need to give a steroid which has the dual activity. Steroid activity and aldosterone activity. That is there in case of the hydrocortisone. Then... What is the drug of choice in secondary and tertiary adrenocortical insufficiency? You should give a potent steroid and that particular potent steroid will be dexamethasone. Hmm? That potent steroid will be dexamethasone. So that completes your Addison's, adrenocortical insufficiency. Then next important topic is, the next important adrenal disorder will be theochromocytoma. Right, pheochromocytoma. Now, what is this pheochromocytoma? Pheochromocytoma, it's a tumor of the adrenal medulla. Right, it's a tumor of adrenal medulla. And where will this pheochromocytoma originate from? It originates from neuroendocrine cells of the adrenal medulla, which are also called chromaffin cells. And this pheochromocytoma, predominantly it secretes norepinephrine. And this pheochromocytomas, they not only originate from the adrenal medulla, the pheochromocytomas, they also originate from the extra adrenal site. Now, this extra adrenal site pheochromocytomas, they are called paraganglioma or this is also called chemodectoma. Right, paraganglioma or chemodectoma. Can anyone answer this question? Very good. 
that is organ of zucker candle is the most common extra adrenal site of pheochromocytoma and even this paragangliomas they also produce norepinephrine in excess quantity and coming to the clinical features all are the clinical features of pheochromocytoma except any one of you except so in pheochromocytoma you will have increased hematocrit there will be orthostatic hypotension because of blunting of the sympathetic reflexes but low cortisol level is not the feature of pheochromocytoma it is a feature of addisons and there will be impaired glucose tolerance or there will be increase in the glucose levels in patients with the pheochromocytoma okay right and you should know in pheochromocytoma what is the most common symptom the most common symptom in patients with pheochromocytoma will be headache why is this headache that is because of hypertension okay then what is the most common sign the most common sign will be hypertension and these patients they are also prone for arrhythmias because of excessive catecholamines then what is the investigation of choice for screening the investigation of choice for screening will be 24 hour urinary fractionated metanephrines 24 hour urinary fractionated metanephrines that will be elevated then what is the confirmatory test? The confirmatory test for your pheochromocytoma will be plasma catecholamine levels or plasma metanephrine levels. And how many times they, it has to be elevated? It has to be elevated almost four times. Right? They have to be elevated almost four times. Then for localization of the tumor. Right, for localization of the tumor, what is the uh, investigations you have to do? That is gallium 68 dotated scan. Right, gallium 68 dotated scan is for localization of the tumor. That is the most com most sensitive investigation for localization of the tumor. Okay, next. Then your VMA. VMA stands for what? Van Lille Mandelic Acid. Van Lille Mandelic Acid is elevated in which of the following conditions? Primary micronodular adrenal hyperplasia, Pons syndrome, neuroblastoma, tuberous sclerosis. In which of the following condition the VMA levels are elevated? Any one of you? Uh, no, no, no. It is not MRI or it is not your MIBG scan. For localization of the tumor, the sense most sensitive will be gallium dotatate scan. No, no, no. So, we have one student. Abhay has answered it, this question correctly. Very good, Abhay. So, that will be neuroblastoma. Neuroblastoma is also the one which will produce excess amount of vanilla mandic acid levels. So, I'll give you all the conditions where VMA levels are elevated. In all these conditions, the VMA levels are elevated. Right? It is not only pheochromocytoma, it is also increased in neuroblastoma, also increased in ganglioblastoma, ganglioneuroma and even severe anxiety. Then finally, what is the treatment of choice for pheochromocytoma? Treatment of choice for pheochromocytoma is surgical resection of the tumor. But you know one important point, before doing surgical resection, you have to maintain the blood pressure less than 160 by 80. So, how will you achieve this? Right? How will you achieve this? You will achieve this by giving an alpha blocker that is phenoxybenzamine. Right? You have to give phenoxybenzamine for achieving this blood pressure. Right? So, that is about your pheochromocyte. Right? Next. Now, so we are, we are done with the adrenal gland disorders, right? Cushing's, Pons, Addison's and then pheochromocytoma, right? So, how is everything going on until here? So, is everyone comfortable with the class which is going on or is there is any problem? Yes, some quick response in the chat box.
Okay, very good. Yeah, yeah, Shashi, I will discuss even men's syndromes also. Right, now let us discuss parathyroid disorders. So, parathyroid disorders, thyroid disorders, diabetes mellitus, men's syndrome, carcinoid syndrome and then glucagonoma. These are the remaining topics. Okay? Right, now, yes, the commonest cause of primary hyperparathyroidism is Commonest cause of the primary hyperparathyroidism is. So, the commonest cause of primary hyperparathyroidism will be solitary adenoma of parathyroid. Right? The commonest cause will be solitary adenoma of parathyroid. That is the commonest cause. Then you have many other causes. Multiple adenoma is there. A parathyroid hyperplasia is there. And parathyroid carcinoma is also there. But the most common cause will be solitary adenoma. Then we also have secondary hyperparathyroidism. Secondary hyperparathyroidism is what? Secondary hyperparathyroidism is that where there is a hypocalcemia causing increase in parathormone production. Where can you have that? Chronic renal failure, vitamin D deficiency, malabsorption syndrome, medullary carcinoma of thyroid. Then we have ectopic sources of parathormone causing hyperparathyroidism. What are those ectopic sources? That will be squamous cell carcinoma of the lung, adenocarcinoma of the kidney. Now, in case of hyperparathyroidism, what all will be the clinical features? So, whenever parathormone levels are elevated, what the parathormone do, will do will cause bone resorption. So, once there is bone resorption, excessive bone resorption will be there. Once there is excessive bone resorption, the cells of healing will go there and will try to heal the bone. And what are the cells of healing? Fibroblasts. So, within the bone, you will have osteitis fibrosa cystica. Right? Next. And because of increased bone resorption, you have abnormalities within the spine. And that particular spine we use, uh, that you will have in patients with hyperparathyroidism will be Cod fish spine, right, where there is excessive scalloping, right. Next, the another important abnormality within the spine will be rugger jersey spine, right. What is this spine called? Rugger jersey spine. So, why do you get this rugger jersey spine? So, you, you can see this alternate, you can see this alternate white and black, white and black, white and black. So, this alternate white and black, it is giving you the appearance of a rugger jersey. So, that is the reason why it is called a rugger jersey spine. Okay. And you are getting this alternate white and black because of excessive bone resorption by increased parathormone. Hmm? By increased parathormone. Then what is the appearance within the skull? Because of excessive resorption within the skull also, you will have this classical pin head stippling. Right? So, yeah, you, you can see this pinhead stippling or the raindrop appearance and within the dental film. So, you have a structure called lamina dura. What is this lamina dura? Lamina dura is nothing but the mineralization of the mandible. Right? Lamina dura is nothing but the mineralization of the mandible. And in case of hyperparathyroidism, there will be demineralization of the mandible. Right? Whenever you take a dental film, the dental film, you can see here, this is the normal lamina dura, right? This label A is your lamina dura. Then what will happen in patients with hyperparathyroidism? There will be loss of lamina dura or there will be absence of the lamina dura. And why is that? That is because of the demineralization of the mandible by your hyperparathyroid. And in patients with hyperparathyroidism, you also have an important tumor. And this particular tumor will be epilis tumor. This particular tumor will be epulis tumor. Okay. Then how will you diagnose your hyperparathyroidism? That is mainly by localization of the tumor. So, how is that you will do the localization of the tumor? The localization of the tumor can be done by a scan called technetium 99M system EB scan. Right, technetium 99M system EB scan. That will be the localization of the tumor. Then, 
what is the treatment of choice the treatment of choice will be surgical resection of solitary parathyroid adenoma that will be the treatment of choice okay then coming to the medical management see medical management what is very important is the patient will have hypercalcemia because of excessive bone resorption so what will be the first line management for your hypercalcemia you need to give normal saline and you should create a dilution effect you should create a dilution effect then the other important drugs will be the furosemide and this particular furosemide will cause the loss of calcium even even the furosemide will also decrease the calcium and what will be the drug of choice to reduce the osteoporosis because there is bone resorption you want to reduce that bone resorption you can give ibandronate ibandronate is what ibandronate it is a bisphosphonate right it is a bisphosphonate and then calcitonin nasal spray right calcitonin nasal spray so that is about the treatment for your hyperparathyroid coming to the next important topic that is hypoparathyroidism so if you take hypoparathyroidism what will be the etiology that will cause hypoparathyroidism that is mainly the thyroid surgery which will cause acute hypoparathyroidism but we have one important genetic disorder causing hypoparathyroidism what is that important genetic disorder that will cause hypoparathyroidism that is called digeot syndrome so how to remember the components of digeot syndrome the components of digeot syndrome if you see the mnemonic that you have is catch 22 what is this catch 22 c stands for cardiac abnormalities a stands for abnormal feces t stands for thymic absence or thymic hypoplasia c stands for cleft palate h stands for hypocalcemia catch 22 that means the chromosomal abnormality is on 20 now what are the important points in your hypoparathyroidism important points in hypoparathyroidism is that in hypocalcemia that is in latent tetany you have this trojus sign what is that you apply the bp cuff and you increase the systolic blood pressure right increase the systolic blood pressure more than normal and wait for 1 to 2 minutes then you will observe this carpopedal spasm that is what is nothing but a positive trojus sign and the next important sign is the chostic sign now what is this particular chostic sign chostic sign is that you need to tap the facial nerve which is there at the angle of mandible right when you tap the facial nerve over the angle of mandible there will be spasm of the muscles on that half of the face and that is what is called chostic sign these two you will have in case of the latent tetany very very important signs okay next now this particular trojus you have three important trojus in the medicine this is your trojus lymph node where do you get trojus lymph node that is in carcinoma stomach where the carcinoma stomach will metastasize to the left supraclavicular lymph node which is also called virchose lymph node that is what is called trojus sign the next important is the trojus syndrome where will you have this trojus syndrome you will have that in patients with carcinoma of the pancreas right you will have that in case of carcinoma of the pancreas where you have migratory thrombophlebitis so three important trojus please remember trojus sign in hypocalcemia trojus lymph node carcinoma stomach right trojus lymph node carcinoma stomach trojus syndrome migratory thrombophlebitis which is seen in carcinoma of the pancreas okay next then next important is in patients with hypocalcemia you will have abnormality within the bone where there can be development of genu valgum which is nothing but your knock knees or genu varum right which is nothing but development of the bolex 
डेवलपमेंट ऑफ द बोलेक्स ओके जेनु वैरम ओके नाउ हाउ डू यू ट्रीट दीज पेशेंट्स विथ हाइपोपैरथाइरोडिज्म वेरी सिंपल कैल्शियम डिफिशियंसी इज देयर तो कैल्शियम सप्लीमेंटेशन हैज टू बी डन कैल्शियम सप्लीमेंटेशन हैज टू बी डन ओके राइट वी हैव वन मोर इंपॉर्टेंट फॉर्म ऑफ हाइपोपैरथाइरोडिज्म कॉल्ड एज सूडो हाइपोपैरथाइरोडिज्म इन सूडो हाइपोपैरथाइरोडिज्म पैराथॉर्मोन इज प्रेजेंट at adequate quantities then what is the problem then the problem is parathormone receptors are resistant right parathormone receptors are resistant so because of that the individual will suffer from hypocalcemia so what is the treatment calcium supplementation right calcium supplementation why is this parathormone receptors being resistant that is due to gene mutation what is the gene which is being defective the gene that is being defective is gnas gene right the gene which is being defective is gnas gene now in pseudo hypoparathyroidism we have various subtypes type 1 2 3 <coughs> we have pseudo hypoparathyroidism type 1a in pseudo hypoparathyroidism type 1a there is a syndrome called albright hereditary osteodystrophy albright hereditary osteodystrophy so in albright hereditary osteodystrophy you have a classical sign what is this classical sign in pseudo hypoparathyroidism type 1a in these patients with pseudo hypoparathyroidism right pseudo hypoparathyroidism type 1a you have a short fourth and fifth metacarpal bones and that will give you whenever the individual makes a fist you will have a knuckle knuckle dimple dimple sign right knuckle knuckle dimple dimple sign so this knuckle knuckle dimple dimple sign you have many differential diagnosis what is that number 1 down syndrome in down syndrome you will have short third metacarpal bone so that is the reason why you get knuckle dimple knuckle knuckle sign whereas in turner syndrome fourth metacarpal is short So that is the reason why in Turner syndrome you will get knuckle knuckle dimple knuckle sign. Okay, so differential diagnosis for your short third and fourth metacarpal will be Downs and as well as Turners. Okay, so this is about your parathyroid disorders that is hyperparathyroidism and as well as the hypoparathyroidism and as well as pseudo hypoparathyroid. Okay, right. So we are done with the parathyroid disorders. Then we'll move on to the thyroid disorders so what is the most common cause of hypothyroidism in india any one of you most common cause of hypothyroidism in india most common cause of hypothyroidism in india will be hashimotos then most common cause of hypothyroidism globally what is the most common cause of hypothyroidism globally that will be iodine deficiency iodine deficiency is the most common cause of hypothyroidism globally right next coming to the hashimotos so what type of disorder is your hashimotos hashimotos it is an autoimmune disorder right it is an autoimmune disorder and what are the type of cells which will infiltrate into the thyroid gland because it's an autoimmune disorder so it is the lymphocytes which will infiltrate into the gland right what are hurdle cells now what these antibodies will do antibodies will destroy the follicular cells but some surviving follicular cells right but some surviving follicular cells the surviving follicular cells 
दे आर फिल्ड विथ पिंक कोलॉइड and they are called as the hergel cells they are filled with pink colloid they are called as the hergel cells now you should know what are the antibodies the antibodies are basically igg antibodies and what is the name of those antibodies these antibodies we have four important antibodies number 1 anti thyroglobulin antibody then anti microsomal antibody then antibody which is directed against the tsh receptor then you have antibody which is being directed against the colloid so these antibodies what they will do these antibodies they destroy the follicular cells and some surviving follicular cells will be there which are filled with pink colloid that is called the hergel cells okay then next question is there are certain drugs which will cause hypothyroidism can anyone tell me what are the drugs that will cause hypothyroidism the drugs causing hypothyroidism will be amiodarone right the drugs causing hypothyroidism will be the amiodarone okay and many other drugs are there lithium right para amino salicylic acid then we also have an anti neoplastic drug that is sunitinib sunitinib is the drug which is used in the treatment of renal cell carcinoma so these are all the drugs right these are all the drugs which will cause the hypothyroid then <clears throat> what is the most common cause of hyperthyroidism what is the most common cause of hyperthyroidism any one of you most common cause of hyperthyroidism that will be graves right that will be graves disease and what are the antibodies in the graves the antibodies in the graves will be thyroid stimulating immunoglobulins right thyroid stimulating immunoglobulins then what are the drugs that will cause hyperthyroidism what are the drugs that will cause hyperthyroidism that will be amiodarone so amiodarone it can cause both it can cause hyperthyroidism and it can also cause hypothyroidism as well okay yes uh, yes shashibhushan amyloidosis will cause hypothyroidism and amyloidosis is what amyloidosis is an infiltrative disorder that will accumulate in the follicular cells and that can cause the hypothyroidism okay next we have an important form of thyroid disorder that is called de courvain's thyroid what is de courvain's thyroiditis de courvain's thyroiditis it is secondary to viral infections right it is secondary to viral infection and you have a tender or painful thyroid and it is also called granulomatous thyroiditis or it is also called as giant cell thyroiditis right granulomatous thyroiditis it is also called giant cell thyroid and it is secondary to infection so even fever can be there in individuals with the de courvain's thyroiditis okay then in early stages of de courvain's what will happen to your radioactive iodine uptake studies in de courvain's the radioactive iodine uptake studies will be decreased then in early stages there will be hyperthyroidism and in later stages the individual with de courvain's will have hypothyroidism okay and when you do a biopsy in patients with de courvain's the biopsy will show you the presence of the giant cell and that is the reason why it is called giant cell thyroid or it is also called granulomatous thyroid okay so that is about de courvain's and radioactive iodine uptake studies are very very important which are being reduced okay next then next is the two important points you need to know jod based dose and ulf chaikov yes please answer this the occurrence of hyperthyroidism following administration of 
supplemental iodine to subjects with endemic iodine deficiency goiter is known as right so so the occurrence of hyperthyroidism following administration of supplemental iodine yes very good so jot based o is your hyperthyroidism so you see this now a patient with endemic iodine deficiency goiter and you have supplemented iodine so there can be two things that the individual can develop there can be development of hypothyroidism there can be development of hyperthyroidism if there is development of hypothyroidism after supplementing the iodine what do we call this as that we call it as the wolf chaikoff effect whereas after supplementing iodine if there is development of hyperthyroidism that we call it as jot based dose phenomenon right that is that we call it as jot based dose effect okay and this wolf chaikoff effect it is mainly due to inhibition of organification right it is mainly due to inhibition of organification okay so two important things you need to know jot based dose and as well as wolf chaikoff effect okay then some image based questions right what is this sign and in which endocrine disorder do you observe this so what is what do you think is this sign this particular sign is nothing but graves of thalmopathy right this particular sign is nothing but graves of thalmopathy right so where you have lib, uh, lid edema, uh, lid retraction is there you can see that lid retraction is there periorbital edema will be there and even you take the conjunctiva how is the conjunctiva conjunctival redness is there conjunctival injection is there that is called graves of thalmopathy then you see the next what is the dermatological abnormality you are observing over the legs and in which endocrine disorder do you observe this yes so this will be infiltrative dermopathy right this will be infiltrative dermopathy right so this is nothing but pretibial myxedema so you will have this in graves right you will have this in graves so that will be the image based question related to your pretibial myxedema then next important is yeah coming to the beta carotenemia what is beta carotenemia and in which form of thyroid disorder you will have this beta carotenemia so beta carotenemia is that where there is complete yellowishness of the skin right there will be yellowish skin that will be developed and all the skin the entire skin will be yellowish except the eyes the eyes will be normal in these individuals and in which endocrine disorder you will have this beta carotenemia you will have that in case of hypothyroidism in hypothyroidism you will have this beta carotenemia okay the next important is why because in hypothyroidism the beta carotene is not converted into vitamin a and that is the reason why you will have this beta carotenemia and that will be responsible for your yellowish skin and how will you differentiate this from jaundice in jaundice even the eyes are yellowish in color but in case of the high uh, beta carotenemia eyes will be normal okay yeah next question which endocrine disorder do you observe clubbing of the fingers yes in which endocrine disorder you will have the clubbing of the fingers and this we call it as thyroid acropathy so where will you have this thyroid acropathy so where will you have this you will have this in patients with the hyperthyroidism where you have clubbing within the finger right where you have clubbing within the finger that is called thyroid acropathy and whenever you take an x ray right whenever you take the x ray of this thyroid acropathy what is that you will observe you will observe the marked cortical thickening right you will observe the marked cortical thickening that is what you will observe in thyroid acropathy right next then 
if you see the uh, face of patients with hypothyroidism so how will be the face of these patients with hypothyroidism you will have a round and swollen face and you will have the swollen lips and you will have loss of hair in the lateral one third of the eyebrow so that loss of hair in lateral one third that is called marderosis this marderosis is not just only the feature of hypothyroidism this marderosis you will also have that even in patients with the leprosy okay then next important is what are the cardiac manifestations in thyroid disorders the cardiac manifestations you should know what are the cardiac manifestations in hyper cardiac manifestations in hypo so cardiac manifestations in hyper there will be systolic hypertension there will be arrhythmias most common will be atrial fibrillation there can be development of congestive cardiac failure there will be a, a mid systolic murmur and the name of that mid systolic murmur will be means lerman scratch whereas in hypothyroidism what is that you will have in hypothyroidism you will have diastolic hypertension you will have development of pericardial effusion right and there will be also development of first degree av block right first degree av block so this will be the cardiac manifestations in patients with the hypothyroidism right then what will be the neurological manifestations in patients with the thyroid disorder okay yeah tell me this hunger reflex which thyroid disorder you will have this hunger reflex which thyroid disorder you will have this hunger reflex anyone very good so you will have this hunger reflex in patients with the hypothyroidism what is this hunger reflex where there will be delayed relaxation right delayed relaxation of deep tendon reflexes that is called the hunger reflex and this is one of the reliable sign for your hypothyroidism then next important sign you need to know is the pemberton sign right where do you get this pemberton sign you will get this pemberton sign with retrosternal goiter what is this on raising the arms of the individual there will be facial congestion and how will you diagnose this retrosternal goiter that is by ct or the mr next is metabolic disorders yeah which of the following disorder can cause profound hyperlipidemia which of the following can cause profound hyperlipidemia so the condition which will cause profound hyperlipidemia not hyperthyroidism it is your hypothyroidism that will cause profound hyperlipidemia and because of which there will be accelerated atherosclerosis and that can cause coronary artery disease that is what you can see in case of patients with the hypothyroidism right then we have two important extreme forms of thyroid disorders that is thyroid storm and myxoedema coma you should know how to treat this thyroid storm you should give the intravenous beta blockers you should give nasogastric propyl thiouracil what this propyl thiouracil will do propyl thiouracil will inhibit conversion of t4 to t3 and you should also give lugol's iodine lugol's iodine it will inhibit the release of thyroid hormone so these are the drugs that you should give in case of thyroid storm which is extreme form of hyperthyroidism then what is extreme form of hypothyroidism the extreme form of hypothyroidism will be myxoedema coma so myxoedema coma it is an extreme form of hypothyroidism right how do you treat these patients you have to give intravenous t3 or intravenous t4 usually what we give oral formulations but in case of myxoedema coma you should give intravenous t3 or intravenous t4 and you should also give hydrocortisone because the adrenal reserve will be reduced in these patients so you should give the intravenous hydrocortisone should be given okay that will be your myxoedema coma 
then how do you investigate these patients? We use the radioactive iodine uptake study. So if you take this radioactive iodine uptake studies, which radioactive iodine we use? That is iodine 123 or iodine 132 we use. But for treatment, what, which is the radioactive iodine we use? That is iodine 131 for therapeutic purpose. For diagnostic purpose, it is iodine 123 or iodine 132. And you should know all the conditions where there is high radioactive iodine uptake like your graves, toxic nodule, autonomous nodular goiter. And what are the conditions where you have low radioactive iodine uptake? That is subacute thyroiditis, lymphocytic thyroiditis, postpartum, all that. You have low radioactive iodine uptake. Then you should know how to treat patients with hyperthyroidism and how to treat patients with the hypothyroidism. Yeah, a pregnant woman diagnosed to be suffering from the Graves disease. So what do you think is the most appropriate therapy for her would be? Yes, what would be? The most appropriate therapy for her would be any one of you. Right, that will be the propyl thyroidism. So, actually, in case of hyperthyroidism, what is the drug of choice? Drug of choice will be methimazole. Right, drug of choice will be methimazole. But if you take in pregnancy, Right, but if you take in pregnancy, what is the drug you will give in first trimester? What is the drug you will give in second trimester? And what is the drug you will give in third trimester? In first trimester, we give propyl thiouracil. But in second and third trimester, we give methimazole. Why is that we don't give methimazole in the first trimester? Because methimazole is teratogenic. It will cause aplasia cutis. That is the reason why we don't give methimazole in the first trimester. Right? Whereas in second and third trimester, organogenesis is over. That is the reason why we give methimus. Okay. Then, next question. A 40-year-old female who is known case of ischemic heart disease, it is diagnosed of having hypothyroidism. Which of the following would be the most appropriate line of management for her? Yes, any one of you? The individual is having ischemic heart disease. So, you should not start a full dose thyroxine, you have to start low dose thyroxine. Okay. So, if you take the treatment of your hypothyroidism, what we will give? We will give levothyroxine, which is nothing but T4. We have to give orally. Right. When will we give? We give early morning. And that too in a fasting state. Right, that too in a fasting state. And what is the dosage of levothyroxine? The dosage will be 1.6 micrograms per kg you should give. Right, and you should decide what should be the dose. You should divide, decide what should be the dose. So, if there is any cardiac disease, right, if there is any cardiac disease present, then you have to give low dose. If there is no cardiac disease, then you can give full dose of levothyroxine. Then you should give full dose of levothyroxine. Okay. So that is about the treatment of hypothyroidism. So this finishes the topic of your thyroid disorders. Done. The next important topic is diabetes mellitus. Right, next important topic is diabetes. So, now you see this question which of the following endocrine disorder does not lead to diabetes? Which of the following disorder does not lead to diabetes? Theochromocytoma, somatostatinoma, hypothyroidism, acromegaly. Very good. So, hypothyroidism. Right, hypothyroidism, you will not have the development of diabetes. The remaining all, pheochromocytoma, somatostatinoma, acromegaly, there is development of the diabetes. And regarding the diabetes mellitus, what are the other endocrine disorders that can cause diabetes mellitus? The other endocrine disorders that can cause diabetes mellitus is glucagonoma, then apart from these three which has been mentioned here, Hyperthyroidism, 
right? So these are the conditions which will cause diabetes now, right? Now, after having said this, some image based questions we will discuss related to diabetes now. What is this instrument? What is the use of this particular instrument? Any one of you? Yeah, yes, Irfan, very good. Even Cushing's, even Cushing's also will cause diabetes mitre. Right. So, this particular instrument, it is a monofilament test. Right, it is a monofilament test. Okay. And what is the name of this monofilament test? It is a two-site semi-Swinstein monofilament test. And what is the purpose of this? That is mainly to test for peripheral neuropathy. Hmm, that is mainly to test for peripheral neuropathy. Okay. So, this is semi Swinstein monofilament test. Okay. Next. Now, this question has been repeated almost three or four times in FMG exam. Right. In the recent FMG exam also, this particular question was there. Okay. Yeah. What is this sign and in which clinical condition do you see this? Very good. So, this is nothing but your prayer sign. Right, this is nothing but prayer sign. And what is this called? This is also called diabetic chiropathy. What is the problem? The problem will be the individual will have a limited joint mobility. Right, where the individual will have a limited joint mobility. So, this is how it will be limited joint mobility. And when the sugars are corrected, Right, when the sugars are corrected, then the individual will be able to approximate both the hands. That is what is called prayer sign, which is called diabetic chiropathy, or which is we also call this as diabetic stiff syndrome. We also call this as diabetic stiff syndrome. Next important is yeah, which endocrine disorder? Okay, in which endocrine disorder do you see this? What is this? And in which endocrine disorder do you see this? So, first of all, what is this? It is xanthelasma. Right? And which endocrine disorders you can have this? This xanthelasma, it is nothing but yellowish cholesterol rich material. And you can come across this in case of diabetes mellitus. In diabetes mellitus, you will have this development of xanthelasma. Next. Next important is, right? In which endocrine disorder do you observe this particular complication? So, first of all, what is this complication? This complication, it is a neuropathic foot ulcer. Right, it is a neuropathic foot ulcer. You will have this in case of diabetes mellitus. So, how can you tell that it is a neuropathic foot ulcer? Because the edges are clean because the edges are clean and margins the margins they are regular margins and where are they present they are located on the plantar surface of the foot whereas in ischemic ulcers ischemic ulcers they don't develop over the plantar aspect the ischemic ulcers they are located at the toes and ischemic ulcers they have irregular margins but here the margins are regular margins it is like typically punched out appearance right and the lesions are present on the plantar surface of the foot Okay, that will be neuropathic ulcer. Next, we have one more dermatological manifestation. Yeah, what is the name of this dermatological sign and in which endocrine disorder do you observe this? Yes. Right, so this is necrobiosis lipoidica diabeticorum. Right. Okay, so one of my brother, Shamim Akhtar, uh, see, having anxiety is a normal thing at this point of time. If you don't have anxiety, that is abnormal. Okay, so please don't uh, worry about the question paper. Question paper will definitely be an easy paper because you, you won't believe what sort of questions have been asked in your recent INICT exam. Right? They didn't ask what type of acid-base abnormality is your high anion gap. 
right you know the simplest questions have been asked in the recent INICT exam the same will be even for your FMG exam also just just be calm and quiet definitely you will clear the exam and if you are in class 10 Shamim, you are in class 10th. It's a lot of time for you to come here. Okay? <laughs> right. So, what is this dermatological lesion? This dermatological lesion will be Necrobiosis Lipoidica Diabeticorum. So, this Necrobiosis Lipoidica Diabeticorum, where do you come across this? You will see that in patients with the diabetes mellitus. And usually it is seen over the lower legs that is in the lower limbs and it is more common in women and how will be the lesions they are like shiny red brown yellowish patches okay so that will be your necrobiosis lipoidica diabetico and one more dermatological complication that you will come across in diabetes mellitus will be acanthosis nigricans right where you have dark velvety skin right where you have dark velvety skin okay right so right next is you should know this type 2 diabetes mellitus will correlate with which fat reserve type 2 diabetes mellitus will correlate with which fat reserve so it will correlate with the Abdominal fat, central obesity, central obesity is the most common risk factor for the development of type 2 diabetes mellitus. Why? It can cause the insulin resistance. So, what are all the risk factors for type 2 diabetes mellitus? The risk factors for type 2 diabetes mellitus will be number one, central obesity, number two, vitamin D deficiency, number three, smoking. Right, number three, smoking. And next, the next important risk factor for your type 2 diabetes mellitus will be inadequate physical activity. Right, inadequate physical activity. So, these are all the risk factors for your type 2 diabetes mellitus. Now, I'll just show you one clinical scenario. Please answer this. So, a 29 year old male taking oral hypoglycemic drugs. Never had ketonuria in his life. BMI is 20.5. Grandfather has diabetes. Father is also diabetic. Right? Which type of diabetes is this person most likely suffering from? Very good. So, this is a classical case of MODI. So, what is this MODI stands for? MODI, it stands for Maturity Onset diabetes of young so in maturity onset diabetes of young it is mainly due to beta cell dysfunction right it is mainly due to beta cell dysfunction they have very strong family history right they have very strong family history right and minimum two generations will be diabetic and bmi will be absolutely normal in these patients they will never develop diabetic ketoacidosis and it is mainly due to gene mutation and what is the most common gene that is being mutated that will be hnf1 alpha and hnf1 alpha you come across this in modi 3 maturity onset diabetes of young type 3 and what will be the drug of choice that will be low dose sulfonyl urea right low dose sulfonyl urea okay so these are the features of your maturity onset diabetes of young and we have one more important form of diabetes that is type 1.5 diabetes mellitus, which is also called LADA <coughs> that is latent autoimmune diabetes of adults so 
this is seen in adults and it is autoimmune so autoimmune in the sense the antibodies are formed and what are the antibodies these antibodies are anti gad antibodies and these antibodies they destroy the beta cells so what will be the drug of choice drug of choice will be insulin right drug of choice will be insulin so that is what is your type 1.5 diabetes okay then how will you diagnose these patients with the diabetes mellitus by fasting postprandial and hba1c how much is the normal fasting levels less than or equal to 100 when will you call impaired 101 to 125 when will you call diabetes mellitus more than or equal to 126 and how much will be PPBS? Normal value will be less than or equal to 140. And impaired 141 to 199. Diabetes more than or equal to 200. HbA1c normal value will be less than or equal to 5.6. Impaired value will be 5.7 to 6.4. Diabetic range will be more than or equal to 6.5 okay so that is about your how you will diagnose diabetes and hba1c is very very important investigation right it is a retrospective test okay and the value of your hba1c it doesn't get affected by your exercise or food right and what is the importance of hba1c is it is directly proportional to microvascular complication more is your hba1c more is the chance of development of the microvascular complication right more is the chance of development of microvascular complication so hba1c multiplied by 25 will give you average blood glucose levels right will give you average blood glucose levels and how much should be the hb target hba1c the target hba1c in a diabetic patient that will be less than 7. Then yes, what is the gold standard investigation? Gold standard investigation will be OGTT, Oral Glucose Tolerance Test. That will be the gold standard investigation. Okay. Then you see the next question. Early morning hyperglycemia with increased blood glucose of 3 a.m. suggest Early morning hyperglycemia with increased blood glucose of 3 a.m. suggest. So, this will suggest what? Okay. So, this is one important area where the questions will be asked. Dawn's phenomenon, Somogi, all that we will discuss now. So, what are the causes? Of, we will discuss and go back to that question again. What are the causes of? Early morning hyperglycemia. One is fasting hyperglycemia that is due to inadequate insulin. Right, that is due to inadequate insulin. Okay, so how will you diagnose? Because the individual has taken inadequate insulin, both 3 a.m. and 6 a.m. insulin, will, uh, 6 a.m. and your uh, 3 a.m. blood glucose levels will be high. Okay, Dawn's phenomenon. Dawn's phenomenon is due to what? Dawn's phenomenon is due to early morning physiological surge of the growth hormone. Okay, early morning physiological surge of the growth hormone. What the growth hormone will do? Will increase the blood glucose levels. So, 3 a.m. blood glucose levels will be normal. 6 a.m. blood glucose will be high. Why? Because early morning growth hormone surge. Okay. Then Somogi effect. Somogi effect is due to excessive night dose of insulin. Right? Excessive night dose of insulin. So when the individual is taking excessive night dose, what will happen to his 3 a.m. blood glucose levels? Reduces. When 3 a.m. blood glucose level reduces, there will be activation of counter regulatory hormones in the morning and thereby 6 a.m. blood glucose levels will be high. So, this hypoglycemia at 3 a.m. will induce hyperglycemia by increasing the levels of counter-regulatory hormones. What are counter-regulatory hormones? 
glucagon growth hormone steroids thyroid hormone catecholamines these are all counter regulatory hormones so once there is increase in your counter regulatory hormones 6 am blood glucose levels will be high so that is what is your somogi effect so what do you think is the answer in this question now early morning hyperglycemia with increased blood glucose of 3 am suggest so that means early morning 6 am also blood glucose levels are high 3 am also the blood glucose levels are high so where can you have this you can have this in case of insufficient insulin right insufficient insulin this is not dons phenomenon this is not dons phenomenon it is insufficient डॉन्स फिनोमिन में क्या है हरजीत 3 एम ब्लड ग्लूकोज लेवल्स विल बी नॉर्मल 6 एम ब्लड ग्लूकोज लेवल्स विल बी हाई इन डॉन्स व्हाट इज बीन एज अर्ली मॉर्निंग हाइपरग्लाइसीमिया इंक्रीज्ड 3 एम ब्लड ग्लूकोज लेवल्स सो दिस इज व्हाट इज सजेस्टिव ऑफ योर इनसफिशिएंट इंसुलिन ओके इट इज नॉट योर डॉन्स इट इज नॉट योर सोमोग देन नेक्स्ट इज या ए टाइप 2 डायबिटीज मेलिटस पेशेंट Present with fasting blood glucose 180, postprandial 260. What does the management include? What does the management include? So, what is these levels? These levels they are in diabetic range. So, the treatment will be actually the what is the first line treatment in diabetes mellitus? First line treatment in diabetes mellitus will be lifestyle modification, right? And the next important drugs. in the drugs what will be the drug of choice in type 2 diabetes mellitus drug of choice will be metformin right so why metformin is considered as drug of choice metformin is considered as drug of choice because it will cause maximum reduction in your hba1c right and maximum reduction of hba1c that is the reason why metformin is considered as drug of choice and metformin what are the other advantages it will cause weight loss metformin will cause weight loss metformin will never cause hypoglycemia that is the advantage of your metformin okay then coming to the complications yeah what is the most useful uh, investigation in the diagnosis of diabetic ketoacidosis most useful investigation in the diagnosis of diabetic ketoacidosis very good so it will not be your urine ketone bodies it will be ketoninia why because some ketone bodies like beta hydroxy butyrate this beta hydroxy butyrate does not appear in the urine right does not appear in the urine so that is the reason why urine ketone bodies are not the most useful investigations okay so if you take the complications of diabetes mellitus how do we classify the complications we classify the complications into acute and as well as chronic So, what are the acute complications? The acute complications that the individual can develop is diabetic ketoacidosis and hyperosmolar non-ketotic coma, right? And what are the chronic complications? The chronic complications we classify that into microvascular complications and then macrovascular complications. So, in 2021 June exam, they have just asked what are the microvascular complications so that will be diabetic neuropathy diabetic nephropathy and the diabetic retinopathy then what are the macrovascular complications that will be your coronary artery disease cerebrovascular accidents then peripheral arterial disease that will be macrovascular complications so these are basically your chronic complications and you also have avascular complications what are avascular complications that will be skin manifestations just now we have discussed necrobiosis lipoidica diabeticorum and acanthosis nigricans and one more avascular complication will be diabetic amyotrophy right where there will be proximal muscle weakness where there will be proximal muscle weakness and these individuals they can also have development of glaucoma and there will be also development of cataract okay some quick points about diabetic ketoacidosis quick points about diabetic ketoacidosis what is a triad the blood glucose levels will be more than 250 the ph will be acidic ph that means ph will be less than 7.36 
and the ketone bodies will be positive right what are the ketone bodies acetone acetoacetate and beta hydroxybutyrate and what type of uh, metabolic acidosis it is high anion gap metabolic acidosis respiratory pattern is very very important that is husmol's respiration which is a periodic breathing where there will be increase in the depth and also increase in the rate of respiration what will be the first line treatment in diabetic ketoacidosis that will be normal saline followed by that we give insulin and which type of insulin we give regular insulin and what will be the route of administration of insulin in diabetic ketoacidosis that is the intravenous route hmm? that will be the intravenous route okay next one more important uh, acute com and your diabetic ketoacidosis it is more common in type 1 diabetes mellitus rather than type 2 diabetes mellitus that is about your dka then next what we have is honk hyperosmolar non ketotic coma hyperosmolar non ketotic coma it is more common in type 2 diabetes mellitus rather than type 1 diabetes mellitus right so it is a most common acute complication in type 2 diabetes mellitus what about the ketone bodies the ketone bodies will be absent but how much will be the blood glucose levels the blood glucose levels will be more than 600 to 1200 milligrams per deciliter and that is the reason why your osmolarity is increased and what will be the first line treatment that is again iv fluids and which particular iv fluids we give that will be half normal saline and followed by that we give insulin and what is the type of insulin we give that is regular insulin that is what we give right that is the regular insulin that is what we give okay next coming to the microvascular complications Okay, so in the microvascular complications, what is the sensation lost first? The sensation lost first will be the sensory sensations. And within the sensory sensation, which particular sensory sensation is lost first? The sensory sensation that is being lost first will be vibration sense which is being lost first. Then what is the most common type of neuropathy? It is distal, symmetrical, sensory neuropathy. That is the most common type of neuropathy that you will see in diabetes mellitus. And most common cranial nerve that is being affected is third cranial nerve. Followed by that, there will be involvement of the seventh cranial nerve. And in these individuals, there will be also development of diabetic autonomic neuropathy due to which there will be postural hypotension. And what is the drug of choice for autonomic neuropathy causing postural hypotension? That will be midodrin. Right? What is midodrin? It is an alpha agonist. Usually, it is given in the treatment of hypotension. Okay. Next. So that was about your the diabetic complications. You see this question: a patient present with symptoms of hypoglycemia. Investigation revealed decreased blood glucose and increased insulin levels. C peptide is done, which shows the normal levels of C peptide. So, what do you think is the most likely diagnosis in this case? What do you think is the most likely diagnosis in this? So, hypoglycemia is there. Investigation revealed decreased blood glucose, increased insulin, C peptide levels are normal. Right. That will be accidental exogenous insulin administration. Now, why? That is because the insulin levels are high, but the C peptide levels are normal but the C-peptide levels are normal. In case of exogenous insulin administration, you don't have C-peptide. But whereas in these two conditions, the insulin levels will be high and even C-peptide levels are also high because the insulin which is coming from the beta cells, the C-peptide levels are elevated. C-peptide levels are elevated for the insulin which is coming from your insulinoma or accidental sulfonylurea ingestion. And what about metformin? Metformin will never cause hypoglycemia. Will never cause hypoglycemia. So that was about your diabetes mellitus. Now, coming to the men syndromes. That is multiple endocrine neoplasia syndrome. So men syndrome, you take men 1. Okay, men 1, it is also called as Wormer syndrome. What is the uh, tumors of men 1? Three important P's, okay, pituitary, pituitary tumor, parathyroid tumor and pancreatic tumor. 
but which is the most common the most common will be parathyroid tumor which is the second most common that will be pancreatic tumor and which is the third most common that will be pituitary tumor that is prolactinoma coming to men 2a that is also called sipple syndrome so that will be parathyroid tumors will be there adrenal pheochromocytoma will be there and medullary carcinoma of thyroid will be there that is called men 2a which is also called sipple syndrome whereas in men 2b you don't have parathyroid tumors parathyroid tumors will not be there only pheochromocytoma will be there and medullary carcinoma of thyroid will be there and in all these you also have extra endocrine manifestations what are those in case of men 1 you have foregut carcinoid right you have foregut carcinoid and not only that you also have visceral angiofibromas and collagenomas whereas in men 2a which is also called sipple syndrome the extra endocrine manifestations will be hirschsprungs and there will be also development of amyloidosis right whereas men 2b which is also called men 3 the extra endocrine manifestations will be neuromas and the individual will also develop marfanoid habitus right and in men 1 what is the gene mutated men 1 gene and men 1 gene on which chromosome it is present it is present on chromosome 11 in whereas in men 2a and men 2b the gene which is being mutated is ret proto oncogene and it is present on the chromosome 10 it is present on chromosome 10 then you take men 4 men 4 you have reproductive organ tumors right you have reproductive organ tumors and what will be that reproductive organ tumors there will be cervical tumors in females right and there will be testicular tumors in males okay and men 4 what is the gene which is being mutated the gene which is being mutated is cdk n1b that is the gene which is being mutated in men 4 okay then next important question is yeah werner syndrome it is associated with what right werner syndrome is associated with what so werner syndrome is not your men 1 the answer is none so what has been asked for you is werners what is men 1 men 1 is wormers right men 1 is wormers okay what is wormers then wormers is your progeria right wormers is your progeria which is nothing but premature aging right wormers is nothing but progeria which is nothing but premature aging so that is about your wormers okay right so we are done with the right we are done with the uh, men syndromes multiple endocrine neoplasia syndromes and two more conditions i'll discuss that is carcinoid and the other one is glucagonoma right coming to the carcinoid So what are these carcinoid it's a slow growing type of neuroendocrine tumors hmm? it's a slow growing type of neuroendocrine tumors okay and what does this carcinoids produce mainly the serotonin okay so this carcinoid syndrome if you see you have two types typical carcinoid and as well as the atypical carcinoid typical carcinoid is what where there will be increase in your plasma serotonin and there will be elevated 5 hydroxy indolastic acid what is atypical carcinoid in atypical carcinoid plasma serotonin levels will be normal but what is elevated it is 5 hydroxy tryptophan that will be increased that is called your atypical carcinoid and in case of typical carcinoid where there will be increase in your plasma serotonin levels the argentafin will be positive whereas an atypical carcinoid it is argentafin negative because your serotonin levels are normal because your serotonin levels are normal okay that is what is the difference between typical and atypical so in typical serotonin levels are elevated whereas in atypical 5 hydroxy tryptophan levels are elevated and it is argentafin negative so we have a terminology called 
right we have a terminology called carcinoid heart what is carcinoid heart carcinoid heart is that where the right sided valves are commonly affected right and that to which side right which side of uh, which particular valves on the right side tricuspid valve is most commonly affected and please remember the mnemonic tips what is tips that is tricuspid insufficiency tricuspid insufficiency is nothing but tricuspid regurgitation p stands for pulmonary stenosis that is what is your carcinoid heart then not only the heart which is affected in case of your carcinoid even there is also gastrointestinal manifestation in the carcinoid that will be in the form of diarrhea and even respiratory manifestations will be there in carcinoid and this respiratory manifestations will be there in the form of wheeze that is what in the carcinoid and how will you diagnose this carcinoid the diagnosis the typical carcinoid 5 hydroxy indolactic acid levels are elevated in atypical carcinoid 5 hydroxy tryptophan levels are elevated then how will you localize the tumor localization of the tumor is by the octreo scan so octreo scan is the one which helps in localizing this carcinoid tumor but the octreo scan the sensitivity is slightly less so the improved sensitivity that will be your gallium 68 dotatate scan gallium 68 dotatate scan it is very much superior to the octreo scan in localizing the tumor then how do you treat these patients so for symptomatic relief of the carcinoid syndrome what will be the drug of choice drug of choice will be octreotide right drug of choice will be octreotide so what this octreotide will do octreotide will decrease the breakdown product of the serotonin right it will decrease the secretion of serotonin it will decrease the breakdown product of serotonin that is what is the treatment for your carcinoid syndrome and the last important topic in the endocrinology will be glucagonoma glucagonoma has been asked recently in the recent uh, fmg exam uh, uh, this uh, question about the glucagonoma has been asked so glucagonoma as such it is a very rare tumor and where is it originating from it originates from the alpha cells of the pancreas what these alpha cells will do it will produce the glucagon glucagon what it will do it will increase the blood glucose levels so the individual will develop mild diabetes symptom it's a tumor so that is the reason why there will be weight loss in the individual and you have a typically associated rash and the typically associated rash is necrolytic migratory erythema right necrolytic migratory erythema and this glucagonomas are associated with men1 right are associated with men1 so how will you diagnose this glucagonoma you have to do blood glucagon levels when you do a blood glucagon levels the blood glucagon levels will be more than 500 mg per deciliter that is what that is how you can diagnose the glucagonoma right and what will be the drug of choice the drug of choice will be your somatostatin analog that is octreotide so what this octreotide will do this particular octreotide it will inhibit the release of glucagon right will inhibit the release of glucagon now for suppose if you want to selectively destroy the alpha cells selective damage of the alpha cells can be done by two important drugs that is doxorubicin and as well as streptojotocin so this doxorubicin and streptojotocin they selectively damage the alpha cells okay so that is about your glucagonoma so glucagonoma where there will be di mild diabetes mellitus weight loss and ne necrolytic migratory erythema associated with men1 diagnosed based on the glucagon levels drug of choice will be octreotide and if you want to selectively damage the alpha cells you can give doxorubicin and as well as the streptojotocin okay so this finishes your endocrinology right so just before the break we have finished cardiology now we have finished endocrinology so almost each chapter if you want me to discuss in detail it is taking almost 2 hours okay so what i will do here right so we are done with this uh, two important chapters 
Hmm? We are done with these two important chapters. So, like any doubts until here, you can just text me on my Instagram handle as I have said you previously also. That is Rajesh Gubba. You can follow me on my Instagram handle where you will have some quick pointers which will be useful for your upcoming FMG and NEET PG exam. And this particular session, I will stop now. And I will continue the session tomorrow. Right? I will continue the session tomorrow. Tomorrow, same timing at 2.30 p.m., we will continue with the remaining topics in the general medicine. Okay. So, until here. So, if you have any doubts, you can just text me on my Instagram handle that is Rajesh Gubba. Right. And this material I will attach. Uh, I will, uh, this PDF I will attach uh, to my Instagram handle. So, you can just come on to my Instagram handle and, and you can get this particular PDF on my Instagram handle. Okay. Right. Thank you very much. See you tomorrow again at 2.30 p.m. Yes. So, a very good evening everyone and I welcome you all to the part 2 remarkable rapid revision of the general medicine. So, yesterday like we had the part 1 session of remarkable rapid revision of general medicine and the PDF of that remarkable rapid session part 1 it is available on my Instagram handle right and my Instagram handle is Rajesh Gubba. So, on my Instagram handle, in the link is given in my bio. So, you can just download that link or you can open the link where you will get the PDF of part 1. Okay. So, having said this, right. So, having said this, let us start with the part 2 discussion. So, today I will try to revise the uh, neurology pulmonology, then connective tissue disorders and then nephrology and then subsequently gastroenterology. So, now let us start with the neurology first. So, I repeat again. So, for all the students who want the PDF of the yesterday's class, you can just visit my Instagram handle that is Rajesh Gubba. So, in the Instagram handle, like in the link is given in the bio, wherein you can download the PDF of the yesterday's session. And even the today's session also, after the completion of the session, I will just keep the link in the bio of my Instagram handle that is Rajesh Gubba. So, you can download that PDF which will be definitely useful for your final revision of the FMG exam. So, having said this, let us start with the neurology revision. So, the first topic in the neurology will be the glenn barre syndrome. So, quickly answer this question. Right. So, glenn barre syndrome is demyelinating disorder of the central nervous system, demyelinating disorder of the peripheral nervous system, both axonal neuropathy. So, what exactly is your guillain barre syndrome? Any one of you please? So, what type of disorder is your guillain barre syndrome? guillain barre syndrome, it is an autoimmune disorder. Okay. And it is an autoimmune disorder where the antibodies are formed against the peripheral nervous system. Okay. Very good. The antibodies are formed against the peripheral nervous system. And it is what type of the hypersensitivity reaction is another important question related to guillain barre syndrome. So, it is a delayed hypersensitivity reaction. So, when we are using the word delayed hypersensitivity reaction, what type of hypersensitivity reaction will be, will be this? It is a type 4 hypersensitivity reaction. This is a very, very important question. Now, antibodies are actually formed against the microorganisms. Now, among the microorganisms, you see this question. Which of the following is the most common antecedent infection associated with the glenn barre syndrome? Mycoplasma, Epstein-Barr virus, Chlamydia infection, Campylobacter jejuni. So, the most common antecedent infection. Very good. So, the most common antecedent infection which is associated with the glenn barre syndrome is the Campylobacter jejuni. And this Campylobacter jejuni is associated with the gastrointestinal manifestations. And in the clinical feature, you should know what is the earliest manifestation in the glenn barre syndrome? Distal areflexia, facial nerve involvement, acute flaccid paralysis, urinary incontinence. 
So what do you think is the earliest manifestation in Guillain-Barre syndrome? Any one of you? Right. So please remember the earliest manifestation in Guillain-Barre syndrome will be distal areflexia. So which particular deep tendon reflex is lost? That is the ankle jerk is being lost. That will be the earliest manifestation and after the loss of the ankle jerk, all the deep tendon reflexes will be lost and the individual will have classic paralysis of all the four limbs. And the characteristic description of the paralysis in Guillain-Barre syndrome is what? It is ascending paralysis. Okay. So, what type of paralysis is that? It is ascending paralysis. So, that is what you will have in patients with the Guillain-Barre syndrome. Now, the next important point is, these patients with the Guillain-Barre syndrome, ultimately, they will die because of the respiratory failure. Hmm? They die because of respiratory failure. So, what type of respiratory failure? What type of respiratory failure do you see in case of the Guillain-Barre syndrome? Type 1 respiratory failure, type 2, type 3 and type 4 respiratory failure. Which type of respiratory failure do you see? Right. So, whenever there is respiratory muscle paralysis, the type of respiratory failure that you will see in Guillain-Barre syndrome is type 2 respiratory failure. And in patients with the Guillain-Barre syndrome, there is also involvement of the cranial nerve. And which is the cranial nerve that is affected in Guillain-Barre syndrome? It is the seventh nerve which is being affected and that too, bilateral facial nerve palsy will be there. And there will be also disturbance of autonomic function and because of disturbance of autonomic function, the individual will present with postural hypotension. Right, where upon standing, the individual will have fall in the blood pressure. Okay, postural hypotension will be there. And you have the four important forms of Guillain-Barre syndrome. And you need to know which is the most common form of the Guillain-Barre syndrome. Acute inflammatory demyelinating polyneuropathy, miller fischer syndrome, acute motor axonal neuropathy and acute sensory motor axonal neuropathy. So, can anyone quickly answer what is the most common form of Guillain-Barre syndrome? The most common form of Guillain-Barre syndrome, please remember, it is your AIDP. That is acute inflammatory demyelinating polyneuropathy. That is the most common form. And which is the rare form of your Guillain-Barre syndrome? It is the miller fischer syndrome, which is a rare form. And you see this question. See the question properly. Most commonly affected cranial nerve in the Miller Fisher syndrome is most commonly affected cranial nerve in case of Miller Fisher syndrome is seventh nerve, third nerve, sixth nerve, tenth nerve. So, which particular cranial nerve is affected in Miller Fisher syndrome? So, in Guillain Barre syndrome, it is your seventh nerve. But in case of miller fischer syndrome, it is your oculomotor nerve, which is the third nerve. Okay. And what did we discuss in Guillain-Barre syndrome? The earliest manifestation will be distal areflexia. But in case of the miller fischer syndrome, the cranial nerves are affected first. Right. The cranial nerves are affected first. Okay. And which cranial nerve is that? That is the third cranial nerve. That is oculomotor nerve which is affected first. Okay. And these individuals with Miller Fischer syndrome, they are characterized by a triad. And what is a triad in Miller Fischer syndrome? Just remember it as OAA. What is this OAA? That is ophthalmoplegia, right? A reflexia, where there will be absence of the reflexes. And then they will also have ataxia. Okay. So, this is what is your OAA, which is a triad in case of Miller Fischer syndrome. And you should also know what is the antibody, what is the investigation of choice in Miller Fischer syndrome. The investigation of choice in Miller Fischer syndrome will be anti GQ1 antibody. That is what is seen in case of the Miller Fischer syndrome, right? Then, followed by that, how will be the prognosis in patients with the Miller Fischer syndrome? So, the prognosis in Miller, sorry, prognosis in case of Glenn-Barry syndrome, it will be the good prognosis. Within almost 4 to, four to 8 weeks, the individual will recover back. And, but the only thing, the recovery will occur in reverse fashion. That means the upper limb will recover first, then trunk muscles and then lower limb muscles will recover last. And what the very important is the investigation of choice in case of Glenn-Barry syndrome. Investigation of choice in case of Glenn-Barry syndrome will be anti-GM1 antibody.
that will be the investigation of choice okay right and what will be the csf finding in patients with the glenn barry syndrome you have a classical picture that is called albumino cytological dissociation right albumino cytological dissociation that will be the csf picture in patients with the glenn barry syndrome and investigation of choice is what anti gm1 antibody and next you need to know what is the drug of choice so can anyone tell me what is the drug of choice in these patients with the glenn barry syndrome the drug of choice in case of glenn barry syndrome will be intravenous immunoglobulin that will be the drug of choice in case of glenn barry syndrome and another treatment option for your glenn barry syndrome will be plasma pharesis right plasma pharesis so both of them they are equally efficacious but the drug of choice is considered to be the intravenous immunoglobulin so this completes the discussion of the quick discussion of the glenn barry syndrome and the next important topic is a neuromuscular junction disorder that is myasthenia gravis now you see this a question quickly all of the following are neuromuscular junction disorders except which of the following is not a neuromuscular junction disorder lambert eaton myasthenic syndrome botulism congenital myasthenia tetanus yes so please remember the one which is not the neuromuscular junction disorder it is your tetanus tetanus is not a neuromuscular junction disorder now our point of discussion is about myasthenia so if you see this uh, topic of myasthenia myasthenia is caused by dysfunction of pineal gland thymus gland pituitary gland parathyroid gland so what do you think is the answer so please remember myasthenia gravis it is mainly due to dysfunction of the thymus gland and you need to know what are the thymic abnormalities the thymic abnormalities we have two important thymic abnormalities that includes thymic hyperplasia which is seen in almost 65 percentage of patients and thymoma which is seen in almost 10 percentage of patients so please remember thymic abnormalities that to thymic hyperplasia is most common okay right now what are the features of the myasthenia gravis myasthenia gravis is associated with decreased acetylcholine at the nerve endings decreased myosin absent troponin c decreased myoneural junction transmission so in myasthenia gravis the acetylcholine levels they will be normal at the nerve endings but the problem is that the nm receptors are occupied by the antibodies and that is the reason why there will be decreased myoneural junction transmission that is what is the answer in case of myasthenia gravis and please remember these patients with myasthenia gravis they have the hla association can anyone tell me what is the hla association in myasthenia gravis right the hla association in case of the myasthenia gravis will be hla b8 that will be the hla association in myasthenia gravis and we also have hla dr w3 that is another important hla association in myasthenia gravis and these myasthenia gravis it's what now it's an autoimmune disorder so it is associated with other autoimmune disorders what are those other associated autoimmune disorders like graves and it is also associated with rheumatoid arthritis and it is also associated with systemic lupus erythematosus which is also an autoimmune disorder next now followed by that you see another important question on myasthenia gravis all are the clinical features of myasthenia gravis except spontaneous remission absent deep tendon reflexes proximal muscle involvement worsened by exertion so myasthenia gravis once these individuals they take rest there will be spontaneous remission of the activity and proximal muscle involvement will be there in patients with myasthenia gravis compared to that of the distal muscles and the weakness in myasthenia gravis it get worsened by exertion and remember the absent deep tendon reflexes they are not the feature of myasthenia gravis in case of myasthenia gravis the deep tendon reflexes will be normal okay so absent deep tendon reflexes is not the feature of the myasthenia gravis and which are all the muscles which are affected what is the earliest manifestation in case of myasthenia gravis see the earliest manifestation in patients with myasthenia gravis will be ptosis 
mostly it is asymmetrical ptosis occasionally it can be bilateral also but mostly it is asymmetrical ptosis and this will be the earliest manifestation in patients with the myasthenia gravis and what are the other muscles which are affected apart from the levator see why is this ptosis this ptosis it is mainly due to involvement of the levator palpebra superioris muscle what are the other muscles which are affected muscles of mastication due to which the individual will have weakness while chewing facial muscles and due to which the individual will have abnormal facial expression whenever they smile and that is called myasthenic snarl hmm? the individual that is called myasthenic snarl and the muscles of deglutition are affected because of which the individual will have dysphagia so these are the muscles which are affected in patients with myasthenia gravis and not only that there is also involvement of flexors and extensors of the neck and because of the involvement of flexors and extensors of the neck the individual can have neck drop dropping of the neck okay so this is about the muscle involvement in patients with myasthenia gravis now i'll ask you a quick question so we have a 50 year old male presents with complaining of ptosis difficulty in chewing occasional difficulty in swallowing there is no history of diplopia or visual loss on examination there is asymmetrical ptosis mild restriction of extraocular muscles with finger abduction test 60 degrees nerve conduction study shows decremental response in orbicularis only and electroretinography reveals a myopathic pattern antibodies are negative what do you think is the most probable diagnosis in this case what do you think is the diagnosis in this case right so please remember this very very important point it is not ocular myasthenia gravis it is generalized myasthenia gravis why because in ocular myasthenia gravis you have only ocular involvement right there will be only ocular involvement okay in generalized myasthenia gravis apart from ocular involvement you have other manifestation as well so the individual is having difficulty in chewing the individual is having difficulty in swallowing so you will not have that right you will not have that in case of the ocular myasthenia gravis okay so in ocular myasthenia gravis only ocular manifestation will be there and it is characterized by a triad so what is a triad the triad include the ptosis there will be diplopia right and there will be also orbicularis oculi weakness right orbicularis oculi weakness so only ocular manifestations will be there in case of ocular myasthenia gravis and what will be the investigation of choice here the antibodies that you will have is anti musk antibodies and how do you treat these patients with ocular myasthenia gravis we need to give steroids okay so because it's an autoimmune disorder right next then what is the investigation of choice in case of the myasthenia gravis what do you think is the most sensitive test for diagnosis of myasthenia gravis elevated ach receptor antibody repetitive nerve stimulation test positive edrophonium test measurement of jitter by single fiber electromyography so what do you think is the investigation right so no 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 it is not the antibody it is the single fiber electromyography that is the right that is the investigation of choice because if you take the investigations these are the four investigations antibodies repetitive nerve stimulation single fiber electromyography and edrophonium test but among all these the sensitivity is highest for single fiber electromyography for single fiber electromyography the sensitivity is highest okay right then what about this tensilon test whenever you give tensilon what is tensilon it is nothing but edrophonium so whenever you give tensilon there will be disappearance of the ptosis right there will be disappearance of the ptosis but only one uh, one quick thing that you have to take care is when you are giving when you are doing this edrophonium test the individual may develop bradycardia because your tensilon or edrophonium will increase the acetylcholine levels so 
you have to keep atropine ready whenever you are doing this tense long test. Okay. Next, another important test for myasthenia gravis is the ice pack test. So, when you are doing this ice pack, te ice pack test is for what? It is for the myasthenia gravis. And whenever you place an ice pack over the ptosis, right? Whenever you place the ice pack over the ptosis, what will happen to the ptosis? The ptosis will disappear. That is what is your ice pack test. And finally, what is the treatment for myasthenia gravis? What is the drug of choice for myasthenia gravis? Please remember, it is acetylcholine receptor inhibitors. And that is your pyridostigmine. So, pyridostigmine is the drug of choice. But whereas, that is for mild myasthenia gravis. But whereas, in case of moderate to severe form of myasthenia gravis, what we give is steroids. Right? What we give is steroids. Okay? That is about your uh, myasthenia gravis. And one point related to myasthenia gravis is, you need to know about myasthenic crisis. Myasthenic crisis is that where the individual will develop respiratory failure and they will die because of your type 2 respiratory failure. And how is this myasthenic crisis treated? The myasthenic crisis is best managed with intravenous immunoglobulin or plasma pharesis. Right, managed with intravenous immunoglobulin or plasma pharesis. Whereas in myasthenia gravis, we give steroids. But for myasthenic crisis, where there is development of respiratory failure, that is best managed with the intravenous immunoglobulins. And what about thymectomy? Yes, thymectomy should be done in all cases of myasthenia gravis. And what should be the age group when you are doing thymectomy? The age group at which you will do thymectomy is around 15 to 55 years. So, when the age group of the individual is in between 15 to 55 years, you can go ahead with the time term. Okay. So, that is about your myasthenia gravis. And one more neuromuscular junction disorder is what? That is lambert eaton myasthenic syndrome. Which, of, which one of the following is correct regarding lambert eaton myasthenic syndrome? It commonly affects the ocular muscles. Neostigmine is the drug of choice. Repetitive electrical stimulation enhances the muscle power and it is commonly associated with adenocarcinoma of the lung. So, what do you think is the correct statement with lambert eaton myasthenic syndrome? Any one of you? Right. So, if you take lambert eaton myasthenic syndrome, it commonly affects ocular muscles is a wrong statement. It is the proximal muscles which are more commonly affected than compared to that of your the ocular muscles. Whereas in myasthenia, ocular muscles are commonly affected. And neostigmine is not the drug of choice. For lambert eaton myasthenic syndrome, it is 3,4-diaminopyrimidine, which is the drug of choice. And what is the investigation of choice? That is, repetitive nerve stimulation will show you incremental response. That will be the uh, investigation of choice. And it is commonly associated with adenocarcinoma. It is an incorrect statement. It is commonly associated with the small cell carcinoma of the lung. Right? It is commonly associated with the small cell carcinoma of the lung. So, that is about your lambert eaton myasthenic syndrome. And what is the difference between myasthenia and lambert eaton myasthenic syndrome is, myasthenia, it is a post-synaptic defect. Whereas, lambert eaton it is the pre-synaptic defect. And... In myasthenia, antibodies are formed against the acetylcholine receptors which are present on postsynaptic nerve terminal. Whereas in lambert eaton myasthenic syndrome, the antibodies are formed against the calcium channels which are present on presynaptic nerve terminal. So, myasthenia is a postsynaptic nerve terminal disorder. lambert eaton myasthenic syndrome, it is a presynaptic nerve terminal disorder. Okay. So, these are the major differences between these two. And drug of choice is what? 3,4-diaminopyrimidine that we give in case of lambert eaton myasthenics, right? Next. So, after having discussed about the neuromuscular junction disorders, the next important is the brainstem stroke syndromes. In the cerebrovascular accidents, what is very important is brainstem stroke syndromes. Okay. Now, so we have midbrain stroke syndromes, pontine syndromes and then medullary stroke syndrome. Now, let us discuss about the midbrain stroke syndrome first. So, there are totally five midbrain stroke syndromes. 
and what are those all of the following are true about weber syndrome except hmm, the question is except any one of you all of the following are true about weber syndrome except ipsilateral oculomotor nerve palsy diplopia contralateral hemiplegia ipsilateral facial nerve palsy so the question is very simple when i am using the word midbrain in the midbrain, you don't have the facial nerve. Okay. So, in order to have the facial nerve palsy, right, in order to have facial nerve palsy, it should be a pontine stroke syndrome. Right. It should be a pontine stroke syndrome. Now, let me tell you what are all your midbrain stroke syndromes. Just remember the names. Names are very, very important. What are those that includes? Weber syndrome is one of the midbrain stroke syndrome, Benedict syndrome, midbrain stroke syndrome, Claude syndrome, Perinaud syndrome, and one more midbrain stroke syndrome is the North Nagel syndrome. Okay, so you just remember the names, they are very, very important. They will definitely ask you which among the following is not a midbrain stroke syndrome. So you need to remember the names Weber's, Benedict's, Claude's. Perinauts, not Nagel. They are all midbrain stroke syndrome. Okay. Then, now a quick question on the Benedict syndrome. Benedict syndrome, all are true except which among the following is not the feature of Benedict syndrome. So, just now, what did I tell you? Your Benedict syndrome, is it a midbrain stroke syndrome or a pontine syndrome? Just now, we have discussed that Weber's, Benedict's, Claude's, not Nagel. Perinauts, they are all midbrain stroke syndromes. So, Benedict's, the lesion at the level of pons, that will be the wrong state. So, Benedict's is not a pontine syndrome. Benedict's is what? Benedict's is a midbrain stroke syndrome. Okay. Next. Now, let us discuss about the pontine syndromes. So, if you take the pontine syndrome, one among that is Millard Gubler syndrome. Millard Gubler syndrome includes the following, except which among the following is not the feature of the millard gubler syndrome? Fifth nerve palsy, sixth nerve palsy, contralateral hemiparesis. So, yes, any one of you? Right. In case of the millard gubler syndrome, you don't have the involvement of the fifth nerve. You don't have the involvement of the fifth nerve. It is the sixth, seventh, and corticospinal tract. And you should know what are the names of the pontine syndromes. So, these are the pontine syndromes. Number one, Millard Gubler syndrome, where there is involvement of 6, 7, and corticospinal tract. Then, lower dorsal pontine syndrome is a Foville syndrome. And then, upper dorsal pontine syndrome will be a Raymond Sestent syndrome. And one more pontine syndrome we have that is the logged in syndrome. Right? That is logged in syndrome. In logged in syndrome, everything is gone. Only vertical eye movement will be left out. The remaining entire body is paralyzed. And it is a bilateral ventral pontine syndrome. Only vertical eye movement is preserved. Everything is lost. Quadriplegia, unable to speak, right? Horizontal movement, eye movement is limited. There will be only vertical eye movement. But consciousness is also preserved. Okay, these are the pontine syndromes. So, what are pontine syndromes? Repeat with me Millard Gubler, Powell, Raymond Sestent syndrome, and Logged in syndrome. Okay, right. Now, a quick question here. Okay, so answer this question A 65 year old diabetic patient develops weakness in the left side of the face, right arm, and right leg. She also has diplopia of the left gaze. So, what is the site of lesion? What is the site of lesion? Any one of you, please? Yes. Where will be the site of lesion? Right pons, left pons, right midbrain, left midbrain. Okay. Now, you see the structures. How do I divide this? So, the individual is having right arm and right leg weakness. So, corticospinal tract gone. The individual is having diplopia on the left gaze. That means the sixth nerve is gone. Right? And the individual is having the weakness of the left side of the face. That means the facial nerve is gone. So, there will be ipsilateral cranial nerve involvement. 
contralateral corticospinal tract involvement so where will be the site of lesion now the site of lesion very good uh, mayank and irfan so the answer will be the left pons the answer will be left pons so what will be this it is nothing but your millard bugler syndrome which is a pontine syndrome okay which is a pontine syndrome next now let us discuss the medullary syndromes medullary stroke syndromes lateral medullary syndrome is caused by thrombosis of which vessel ica pica vertebral artery basilar artery yes lateral medullary syndrome is caused by thrombosis of right remember yes it is your vertebral artery followed by that pica right and what is another name for your lateral medullary syndrome the another name for lateral medullary syndrome it is also called as wallenberg syndrome right it is also called wallenberg syndrome and similarly you also have medial medullary syndrome so what are your what is the other name for medial medullary syndrome the other name for your medial medullary syndrome it is called degerain syndrome right it is called degerain syndrome and you should not get confused with the degerain rossi syndrome degerain rossi syndrome it is your thalamic syndrome whereas degerain syndrome will be medial medullary syndrome and in this medial medullary syndrome what is the vessel that is affected that is the anterior spinal artery right it is the anterior spinal artery which is affected in case of the medial medullary syndrome so that was about your brain stem stroke syndrome so mid brain stroke syndromes then pontine syndromes and then medullary syndromes so please repeat with me all these syndromes now what are your mid brain stroke syndromes webers benedicts claudes perinots and nothnagel syndrome and what are your pontine syndromes millard gubler povil syndrome raymond sestan syndrome and then logden syndrome and what are medullary syndromes medial medullary syndrome is degerain syndrome lateral medullary syndrome is wallenberg syndrome wallenberg syndrome the vessel most commonly affected is vertebral artery and degerain syndrome the vessel most commonly affected is anterior spinal artery so brain stem stroke, stroke syndromes are very very important part of your exam okay you should definitely revise this before going to the exams okay next then yes you see this clinical question a middle aged patient presents with worst headache of life what is the investigation of choice so the next next things we will go on to the discussion of the stroke so yes worst headache of the life the description is nothing but subarachnoid hemorrhage and what will be the investigation of choice in case of subarachnoid hemorrhage it is your ct brain ct brain is the investigation of choice in case of the subarachnoid hemorrhage and you should know what is the most common cause of subarachnoid hemorrhage the most common cause of the subarachnoid hemorrhage will be the head trauma and can anyone tell me what is the second most common cause the second most common cause is the rupture of berry aneurysms right rupture of the berry aneurysms and what is the most common site of berry aneurysm the most common site of berry aneurysm will be at the junction of anterior cerebral artery with the anterior communicating artery and what will be the csa finding in case of subarachnoid hemorrhage the csa finding will be xanthochromia where the blood will get mixed with the csf and thereby it will give you orange yellow colored appearance which is nothing but xanthochromia and in subarachnoid hemorrhage whenever you do a ct brain what is the finding that you will have remember it should be a non contrast ct scan it should not be contrast enhanced it should be non contrast so you will have the presence of blood within the sylvian fissure right you will have the presence of blood in the sylvian fissure okay see oligoclonal bands they are not seen in case of your subarachnoid hemorrhage where do you see oligoclonal bands where do you see oligoclonal bands oligoclonal bands any one of you oligoclonal bands they are the characteristic feature in patients with the 
multiple sclerosis multiple sclerosis it is not your the uh, subarachnoid hemorrhage then how do you treat these patients with subarachnoid hemorrhage it all depends upon whether is there any midline shift present or not and what is the calcium channel blocker that we give in these individuals the calcium channel blocker that we give is nimodipine okay and what is the purpose of giving nimodipine that is mainly to prevent the vasospasm and to prevent the ischemia we give this nimodipine that was about your subarachnoid hemorrhage then you see another important clinical question a middle aged uh, patient presents with history of the left sided weakness for two days currently the patient is extremely drowsy and underwent a ct brain which of the following is the best treatment for this patient aspirin or clopidogrel mechanical thrombectomy should be done mannitol should be given decompressive craniotomy okay so this is the ct brain of the patient right so if you closely observe right if you closely observe there what is that you are seeing you are observing that there is a midline shift you are observing that there is a midline shift now what is this you are having it is the presence of a large hypodense lesion right it is a presence of a large hypodense lesion and exactly in the which territory is this large hypodense lesion this large hypodense lesion it is present in the mca territory now our patient is having a midline shift so whenever there is a midline shift what will be the best treatment the best treatment will be the decompressive craniotomy should be done right decompressive craniotomy should be done then what about this mechanical thrombectomy and story of the others you take mechanical thrombectomy mechanical thrombectomy should be done in case of when the patient presents within 8 hours but our patient is having this particular weakness since almost 2 days so there is no role of mechanical thrombectomy right and it's a large hypodense lesion with a midline shift so you have to do a decompressive craniotomy in this clinical scenario okay next then so i hope everyone is comfortable with the discussion yes all of you are you happy with the discussion which is going on is there any problem any correction to be done right then we'll move on to the next question what is the window period of thrombolysis in a stroke patient what is the window period yes so the window period of thrombolysis in a stroke patient is what it is 4.5 hours right and what is the thrombolytic agent which you will be using the thrombolytic agent that you will be using is tissue plasminogen activator and what are all the various indications for thrombolysis the indications for thrombolysis is the the individual should be presenting within 4.5 hours of ischemic stroke that is one important criteria and age of the patient should be more than 18 years less than 18 years don't do thrombolysis okay and the next important indication is there should be no hemorrhage or edema right there should be no hemorrhage or edema of more than one third of mca territory why see if the if there is like more than one third of mca territory if there is hypodense lesion you should not do thrombolysis what will happen this ischemia it can turn into hemorrhage if you do thrombolysis when the hypodense lesion if it is present in more than one third of mca territory so the this word is very very important ct scan showing no hemorrhage or no edema of more than one third of mca territory if you do what will happen if there is ischemia like more than one third can you do thrombolysis no if you do thrombolysis that that will get converted into hemorrhage so please remember you should not do okay these are the indications for the, and what should be the blood pressure the blood pressure should be less than 160 by 90 before doing thrombolysis and if it is like more than 180 or like more than 110 diastolic blood pressure it's a contraindication for thrombolysis okay next so another important question on the topic of stroke which of the following complication of the stroke 
need not be treated fever spasticity neglect dysphagia which of the following complication of the stroke need not be treated yes right so please remember the one which does not require treatment is the neglect okay neglect now what about the other options okay first of all what is this particular neglect why does it occur see this neglect it occurs mainly due to blockade of the inferior division of the middle cerebral artery right it is mainly due to blockade of inferior division of middle cerebral artery you have the development of this hemi neglect and where will be the site of lesion for the development of neglect it is non dominant parietal lobe and what will be that non dominant parietal lobe that is the right parietal lobe and in these patients with neg hemi neglect see this hemi neglect it is also called as what it is also called somatognosia right somatognosia so in these individuals with hemi neglect like what will be the problem right what will be the problem in these individuals is the individual will consider only one half the body is present the other half he will neglect and that is what is called hemi neglect or spatial agnosia so why will this develop that is due to blockade of inferior division of middle cerebral artery right that is non dominant parietal lobe lesion okay so the individual will be able to copy only on the right side of the image he cannot copy the left side of the image and this particular neglect is not a serious problem right this is not a serious problem okay right but whereas you take the other options presence of the fever presence of the fever it will further precipitate the underlying manifestations so you need to treat the fever and spasticity has to be treated with the skeletal muscle relaxant and that skeletal muscle relaxant that you should give is the baclofen so baclofen should be given for the spasticity and dysphagia yes you have to treat dysphagia right you have to treat dysphagia why because if dysphagia is not treated the individual can develop aspiration so dysphagia has to be treated so the one which does not require an immediate treatment is neglect that is not a major concern among the options which has been given to you okay so that was about your some part of the uh, cerebrovascular accidents and one important part of the discussion is the aphasia okay so you see this question which of the following is not a feature of right middle cerebral artery territory infarct which of the following is not a feature of the right middle cerebral artery territory infarct right so that is your aphasia why because the right middle cerebral artery it is supplying the right cerebral hemisphere and we don't have the speech areas on the right side we have the speech areas on the left side so that is the reason why right middle cerebral artery territory infarct will not cause the development of aphasia now you have the various types of aphasias like the broca's aphasia so broca's aphasia which area is affected the broca's area is affected yes any one of you yes p uh, i'll be doing the ini ct recall session as well tomorrow on the same channel uh, or on my youtube channel you will be having that ini ct recall session as well right so your broca's aphasia it is not a fluent aphasia it is the non fluent aphasia right it is a non fluent aphasia so you take this broca's area and wernicke's area where is this broca's area present the broca's area it is present in the inferior frontal lobe okay and where will be the wernicke's area wernicke's area it is present in the superior temporal lobe and if you take the broadman areas the wernicke's area the broadman area is area number 22 whereas broca's area it is area number 44 and as well as the 45 right 44 and as well as 
and whenever you take these aphasias see in case of right in case of the wernicke's aphasia it is the sensory aphasia right and these patients they will have normal fluency because the broca's is normal but what is the problem in case of wernicke's the individual will have nonsensical speech or neologisms are present in case of wernicke's aphasia whereas broca's aphasia and it is effluent aphasia your wernicke's aphasia it is effluent aphasia right then coming to the broca's aphasia broca's aphasia it is a non fluent aphasia and it is a motor aphasia right and in these individuals there are no neologisms right there are no neologisms okay right and what about repetition repetition will be impaired in all the types of aphasia now you see another question aphasia which affects the arcuate fibers is called aphasia that affects the arcuate fibers is called right that will be the conduction aphasia where there is arcuate fibers which are being affected okay next question now fluent aphasia with preserved comprehension and impaired repetition is impaired repetition is yes anyone fluent aphasia with preserved comprehension in impaired repetition is right so that will be your conduction aphasia hmm? that will be your conduction aphasia so fluent aphasia what does that mean your broca's is normal preserved comprehension what does that mean your wernicke's area is also normal but there is impaired repetition so your arcuate fibers are gone right arcuate fibers are gone and please remember in all the types of aphasia there will be impaired repetition broca's wernicke's conduction in all of them you will have impaired repetition right so the answer in this question is the conduction aphasia right so that is about your topic of the aphasia yes yeah madam is also answering the medicine questions right so now we'll move on to the next question that is the brown sequard syndrome so brown sequard syndrome what exactly is this it is the hemi section of the spinal cord now you see this question the following are the components of brown sequard syndrome except ipsilateral extensor plantar response ipsilateral pyramidal tract involvement contralateral spinothalamic tract involvement contralateral posterior column involvement so what do you think is the correct answer what do you think is the correct answer very good so <laughs> yes p madam has answered wrongly right okay <laughs> right so the answer is the contralateral posterior column involvement will not be there so please remember brown sequard syndrome is what it is the hemi section of spinal cord and in case of the brown sequard syndrome what will be the motor manifestations motor manifestations will be at the site of lesion right at the site of lesion you will have element paralysis and below the site of lesion you will have umn paralysis and what will be the sensory manifestation in case of brown sequard syndrome the sensory manifestations in case of the brown sequard syndrome is that you will have ipsilateral posterior column involvement and contralateral spinothalamic tract involvement right contralateral spinothalamic tract involvement okay that is what is the discussion in the brown sequard syndrome so you will not have contralateral posterior column involvement it is the ipsilateral posterior column involvement okay and same question yes please answer this type of sensation lost on the same side in brown sequard syndrome pain touch proprioception temperature now you should answer this question 
टाइप ऑफ सेंसेशन लॉस्ट ऑन सेम साइड इन ब्राउन सेक्वर्ड सिंड्रोम यस राइट सो दैट विल बी प्रोप्रियोसेप्शन because proprioception is what it is a posterior column sensation and posterior column sensation what did i tell you they are being affected on the same side whereas the remaining th three options a b d they are your spinothalamic tract sensations they will not be lost ipsilateral they will be lost contralateral okay and one more question on the same that is a ventrolateral chordotomy is performed to produce the relief of pain from the right leg it is effective because it interrupts the it is effective because it interrupts the yes it interrupts the so where do you want to have pain relief on the right leg so if you want to have a pain relief on the right leg which side spinothalamic tract should have been lost very good so what did i tell you in case of the brown sequard syndrome contralateral spinothalamic tract should be gone so the you want the pain relief from the right leg and in the right leg so where will be your the right leg pain sensation uh, fibers coming from they are from the contralateral side so left lateral spinothalamic tract should have been gone okay the next important topic for the discussion will be the disorders of the cranial nerves right disorders of the cranial nerves so you see this question yes any one of you a patient presented with recurrent episodes of sharp pain over his right cheek that is precipitated on chewing between attacks the patient is otherwise normal what do you think is the most probable diagnosis so what do you think is the most probable diagnosis here right so that will be your trigeminal neuralgia so what will be the clinical features in patients with trigeminal neuralgia the individual will have intensely sharp stabbing pain and that will be in the distribution of the trigeminal nerve and which particular distribution it is more common right which particular distribution it is more common it is more common in the distribution of your 5 2 rather than 5 3 that is your your ophthalmic maxillary mandibular so maxillary division the pain is more severe than compared to mandibular or ophthalmic division and these individuals they also have facial muscle spasms and that is the reason why it is called tic dolorox and most of the time the pain will be unilateral and which side it is more common it is more common on the right side rather than the left side and at the same time you should know that these individuals will also have the autonomic symptoms and what will be that autonomic symptoms this autonomic symptoms will be the lacrimation and you will have a red eye right and these autonomic symptoms will be in the distribution of 51 right they are present in the distribution of 51 and what is the drug of choice for trigeminal neuralgia any one of you what is the drug of choice for trigeminal neuralgia right so drug of choice will be carbamazepine and if the patient does not respond we give oxcarbamazepine right if the patient does not respond we give oxcarbamazepine and the other drugs that can be given is even your baclofen and as well as gabapentin can be given okay right then coming to yes next is the facial nerve palsy so which among the cause is the facial nerve which is the cause of the facial nerve palsy which is the cause of the facial nerve palsy right in fact in fact the question any one of you the answer is all of the above hmm? the answer is all of the above very good yogesh sharma so all of these can cause the facial nerve palsy okay and particularly you take ramsay hunt syndrome can anyone tell me which particular ganglion is affected in ramsay hunt syndrome which ganglion is affected in ramsay hunt syndrome it is the geniculate ganglion right it is the geniculate ganglia which is affected in case of the ramsay hunt syndrome okay it is the herpes zoster infection 
right it is the herpes zoster infection of the geniculate ganglion that is what is called ramsay hunt syndrome okay right then the next important is yes you take the upper motor neuron and lower motor neuron paralysis of the seventh nerve can anyone answer this question true regarding upper motor neuron seventh nerve paralysis is true regarding upper motor neuron seventh nerve paralysis is so please remember in case of upper motor neuron paralysis what is the mnemonic that you have to remember in upper motor neuron paralysis upper half of the face will be spared and what is affected in case of upper motor neuron paralysis then it is the contralateral sorry contralateral lower half paralysis will be there so remember in upper motor neuron paralysis the mnemonic that you have to remember is upper half of the face that is being spared right what is affected in uh, seventh nerve palsy uh, umn lesion it is only the lower half of the face that is being affected okay i will show you an image tell me whether the individual is having upper motor neuron paralysis or lower motor neuron paralysis what is this patient having is it umn paralysis or lmn paralysis yes quickly right so if you observe very carefully here right if you observe very carefully the frowning or the folds over the eye uh, the forehead lost the individual is unable to close the eye right yes it is lower motor neuron paralysis and your angle is lost and the individual is also unable to deviate the mouth on the affected side so this patient is having right this patient is having right lower motor neuron paralysis okay right lower motor neuron paralysis okay so remember in lower motor neuron paralysis it is ipsilateral half of the face that will be paralyzed right ipsilateral half of the face will be paralyzed whereas in upper motor neuron it is contralateral lower half of the face that will be paralyzed okay right then one more important condition is yeah answer this element facial paralysis element facial paralysis which is the true statement what is the true statement regarding the element facial paralysis any one of you right so in patients with element paralysis the individual cannot close the eye so cornea should be protected right cornea should be protected then what about the other options you take the melkerson rosenthal syndrome see melkerson rosenthal syndrome it is not bilateral paralysis it is unilateral paralysis and this melkerson rosenthal syndrome it is characterized by a triad what is that unilateral paralysis of the facial nerve there will be swollen lips of the individual and there will be also fissured tongue right there will be fissured tongue so that is what is your melkerson rosenthal syndrome okay it is not bilateral it is unilateral then what about this mobius syndrome see mobius syndrome it is not unilateral it is bilateral so mobius syndrome is what it is caused by absence or under development of the 6th and 7th nerve right under development of the 6th and 7th nerve that is what is your mobius syndrome it is bilateral whereas melkerson rosenthal unilateral okay then prognosis affected uh, before repeat electrical stimulation is a wrong statement right the prognosis is not being affected in patients with your bell's palsy that is element palsy they have the good prognosis right they have the good prognosis okay so that was about your cranial nerve involvement and the next important quick discussion 
is on the topic of the headache. So, very simple question first, most common cause of headache. What do you think is the most common cause of headache? Right. So, the most common cause of headache will be the tension headache. Right. That will be tension headache. So, how do we classify this headache? One is your primary headache. The other one is the secondary headache. So, most common cause of primary headache, that is tension headache. Second most common cause, migraine. Whereas, the most common cause of secondary headache will be the systemic infection. Right. That will be systemic infections. Now, you need to know the description of the migraine. The description of the migraine is very, very important. So, you have to remember this mnemonic that is pound. What does this pound stands for? P stands for pulsating in nature. So, the headache in case of migraine will be pulsating headache. And on an average, it is one day duration. Right? So, the total duration is almost around 4 to 72 hours. But on average, it will be one day duration and it is mostly unilateral. And these individuals, they have nausea or vomiting and it is disabling in character. Right? Disabling in character. So, out of these five, at least four should be there. Right? Out of these five, at least four should be there. Okay? That is what is the description of the migraine. And when do we use the word status migraineosis? When do we use the word status migraineosis? When the migraine is present for more than 72 hours, then we use the word status migraineosis. Okay, right. And this particular migraine is, as everyone is aware of, it is associated with aura and as well as without aura. And if it is present with aura, it is called classical migraine. And if it is without aura, it is common migraine. And among the aura, which form of aura is more common? It is the visual aura, which is more common that you have to remember. And you have various forms of migraine. The other forms of migraine are what? The other forms of migraine are retinal migraine. So, in case of retinal migraine, there can be thrombosis of retinal artery causing blindness within the individual. So, there can be transient monoocular blindness due to thrombosis of retinal artery. Then we have basilar migraine. Basilar migraine is that where there is prominent brain stem symptoms, right? And which vessels are affected for the development of basilar migraine? It is basilar posterior cerebral arteries. And lastly, hemiplegic migraine. Hemiplegic migraine along with headache, the individual will also have the unilateral paralysis. And finally, the treatment. See, what is the drug of choice for acute attack of migraine? If it is mild to moderate, we give NSAIDs. But if it is severe form of acute attack of migraine, then we give Sumatriptan. Sumatriptan is the drug of choice. But what is the question for you here? What is the drug of choice for status migraineosis? Any one of you? Drug of choice for status migraineosis. Anyone? So, drug of choice for status migraineosis will be prochlorperazine. Right? Drug of choice will be what? Prochlorperazine. That is a drug of choice for status migraine. Okay? Right. Then you should know what are all the various drugs we give for prophylaxis. That is another important question that will be asked. So, we give some antihypertensions like beta blockers, calcium channel blockers and occasionally AC inhibitors. But that will not be priority. And antidepressants like tricyclic antidepressants and selective norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors. And we also give some anticonvulsants for prophylaxis that is valproic acid, topiramate and gabapentin. So, these are the drugs that we give for prophylaxis. So, this finishes your migraine. Next. So, a 45 year old man, daily headache, 2 attacks per day for past 3 weeks. Each attack is there for almost an hour and it awakens the patient from sleep. The patient has noticed associated tearing and reddening of the right eye and there is also nasal stuffiness. The pain is very deep, excruciating and limited on the right side of the head. So, the neurological examination is non-focal, most likely diagnosis in this case. Most likely diagnosis in this case. So, what do you think is the answer? Very good. So, that will be the cluster headache. So, what is this cluster headache? 
please remember cluster headache is the one which is more commonly seen in males and it is a unilateral headache and the headache is mainly in the periorbital localization the pain is mainly located in the periorbital area and it is very intense headache right and why is it called cluster because the episodes they appear in clusters and again there will be a headache free period and again they will have the clusters of episodes that is the reason why it is called cluster headache and each attack it will last for nearly less than 3 hours and you should know what is the drug of choice okay what will be the first line treatment yes what will be the first line treatment what will be the first line treatment the first line treatment will be high flow oxygen so you should give almost 12 liters per minute that will be the first line treatment okay and if at all if you want to give the drug you need to give sumatriptan and the other drug that can be given is gabapentin or pregabalin can be given and the drugs that can be given for prophylaxis right that will be your verapamil okay so now this migraine it is a unilateral headache cluster headache it is also unilateral headache and let me just discuss one bilateral headache a woman has bilateral headache that worsens with emotional stress she has two children both are doing badly in the school what do you think is the diagnosis in this case what do you think is the diagnosis in this case right so that will be your tension headache okay so tension headache it is usually bilateral and it is a dull aching headache it's a dull aching headache so this will subside by taking rest or you can give the simple paracetamol for reducing that headache so this is about the discussion of the topic related to the headache next next important topic will be the parkinsonism so parkinsonism we have two forms primary parkinsonism and secondary parkinsonism so primary parkinsonism is mainly due to gene mutation can anyone tell me what is the gene that is being mutated in primary parkinsonism yes what is the gene that is being mutated in patients with primary parkinsonism the gene that is being mutated in primary parkinsonism is park gene right and it is present on chromosome 1 right it is present on chromosome 1 okay then you have secondary parkinsonism secondary parkinsonism is what it is secondary to encephalitis post encephalitis or even it can be secondary to toxins which particular toxin that is your mptp what is mptp methylphenyl tetrahydropyridine and even manganese can cause parkinsonism okay and even carbon monoxide can cause parkinsonism there are certain drugs that is called drug induced parkinsonism drugs that will cause parkinsonism are mainly reserpine phenothiazines butyrophenones and metaclopramide and we have ischemic parkinsonism that is called vascular parkinsonism and this can occur due to decreased blood supply to the basal ganglia and even tumors of the basal ganglia can cause parkinsonism punch drunk syndrome which we which we have seen in our boxer mohammed ali right so this is seen in case of the boxers and even certain infections can cause parkinsonism mainly like hiv and as well as the influenza they are the one which can cause parkinsonism and you should know what is the earliest feature of parkinsonism any one of you what is the earliest feature in parkinsonism the earliest feature in parkinsonism will be yes very good that will be tremors okay resting tremors it is not hypokinesia hmm? it is the resting tremors that will be the earliest manifestation in case of parkinsonism and you should know this triad in parkinsonism what is this rat rat stands for rigidity a stands for akinesia t stands for tremors and that to what type of tremors that you will have that is resting tremors that you will have okay and so this table is very very important so bradykinesia resting tremors rigidity and the gait, the characteristic gait, what is that gait? With stupid posture, that is the festinate gait, these individuals with Parkinsonism will have. And they will have postural instability. And because of postural instability, at one point of time, they are completely wheelchair bound. 
So once they are completely wheelchair bound, that is considered as a red flag sign in Parkinson's. That means it is a severe form of Parkinson's. And in patients with Parkinsonism, they will not only have motor manifestations, they also have non-motor manifestations. And that non-motor manifestations will be in the form of anosmia, where there is loss of sensation of smell and mild sensory loss pain. There can be mood disorder in the form of depression. And what are the other motor manifestations? They will have very small handwriting, micrographia, expressionless face, that is masked faces, reduced eye blink, which is nothing but your Meyerson sign, and you have soft voice, that is hypophonia, and they will have difficulty in swallowing, and they also have this freezing. So these are the clinical features in Parkinson's. Then coming to the treatment. So, what is the first line drug in patients with Parkinsonism? What is the first line drug in patients with Parkinsonism? So, the first line drugs in patients with Parkinsonism, please remember it is your levodopa. Hmm? That will be your levodopa. Okay? Right. So, and but remember when you are giving this levodopa, it is associated with involuntary movement by itself. So, that is the reason why in young individuals, in young individuals, actually levodopa is a first line treatment, no doubt in that. But in young individuals with Parkinsonism, usually it is a disorder of elderly individuals. But in young individuals, if there is development of Parkinsonism, what we give is dopamine agonist. Right? What we give is dopamine agonist. If it is in young individuals, these are the lines directly from Harrison. Actually, first line drug, levodopa. But in young individuals, this levodopa is associated with levodopa induced dyskinesia. That is the reason why in young individuals, we start with the dopamine agonist. Okay? So, that was about your Parkinsonism. So, if you see the summary of the basal ganglia disorder. So, basal ganglia, what are the structures we have? Caudate nucleus, putamen, substantia nigra, subthalamic nucleus, right? And these are the structures and even globus pallidus, right? So, if globus pallidus is gone, then what is the involuntary movement? That is athetosis, which is nothing but a continuous rhythm movement of the hand, arm, neck and face. If there is subthalamic nucleus gone, this is a recent INICT question, subthalamic nucleus gone, then the individual will develop any ballistic. And caudate nucleus and putamen gone, there will be development of chorea. Substantia nigra gone, then there will be development of Parkinson. Okay. So, this table is very, very important. So, which particular structure of basal ganglia gone and what is the involuntary movement that will be developed. Okay. Right. So, that was about your the discussion related to Parkinsonism and basal ganglia disorder. And the next important discussion is on the topic of the meningitis. Okay, so please answer this question. Bacterial meningitis, it is acute purulent infection within the subarachnoid space, subdural space, extradural space, all of the above. All of the above. Bacterial meningitis, remember, it is acute purulent infection within the subarachnoid space. It is not all of the above. It is only in the subarachnoid space. Okay. And you should know what is the most common organism that is responsible for the bacterial meningitis. Most common organism responsible for uh, your bacterial meningitis. Among the options which are given to you, which is the most common organism? Right. That will be streptococcus pneumonia. But whereas you take in neonates, in neonates in India, like what is the most common organism? That will be Klebsiella, right? And followed by that Escherichia coli, right? Followed by that Escherichia coli, okay? Right. Now, you should know which organism will cause post-meningitis deafness. Which organism causes post-meningitis deafness? Any one of you? Right. So, the organism that will cause post meningitis deafness will be, yes, that will be Haemophilus influenza. That is what is the organism that will cause post meningitis deafness. And what will be the important clinical features in case of meningitis? It is high grade fever, headache will be there, 
and neck rigidity will be there and there will be also projectile vomiting and there will be photophobia. So these will be the features in case of meningitis and you have to know the two important signs. What are those two important signs? One is your karmic sign, right? So what is that karmic sign? The, you should make the individual to lie in supine position and you from the passive flexion of the hip and from passive flexion of the knee, right? You need to extend the knee. The knee cannot be fully extended. That is called karmic sign. And the next one is the Brugiski's neck sign. You try to flex the neck, automatically there will be flexion of the knee. That is called the Brugiski's neck sign. Now, in case of patients with meningitis, yes, what is the correct sequence to be followed in suspected bacterial meningitis? What is the correct sequence to be followed in suspected bacterial meningitis? Go through all the options and please answer this. So, first and foremost, what you have to do in a case of meningitis is, you have to draw the blood culture sample. Then, you should give an empirical antibiotic. Then, you have to do neuroimaging to rule out the any intracranial space occupying lesion. Followed by that, you need to do lumbar puncture. So, the answer is A. The answer is A. Okay. So, it is lumbar, uh, sorry, blood culture, empirical antibiotic, neuroimaging and then the lumbar puncture should be done. See, after giving antibiotic, if you take the sample, it will be of no use. The organism will die by the time you uh, take the culture and you are giving the antibiotic first. No. First blood culture, then antibiotic should be done, given. Then neuroimaging, then lumbar puncture should be done. And whenever you are doing lumbar puncture, right, whenever you are doing lumbar puncture, what is the site for lumbar puncture? L1, L2, L2, L3, L3, L4, L4, L5. What is the best site for lumbar puncture? Right, so the best site for lumbar puncture, please remember, very good. So in between L3 and L4, you have to do lumbar puncture. And what is the name of the needle for lumbar puncture? We have Quinky's needle and the other one is the Sprott's needle. These are the two important needles for the lumbar puncture. And you should know the worker, right? You should know the CSF. This table is very, very important, which I am about to discuss. So I'll tell you normal the CSF picture in bacterial, tubercular, viral, and fungal meningitis and even Glen Barry syndrome comparison. Okay. So you take the normal CSF pressure that will be 50 to 180 millimeters of water and normal CSF will be clear like water. Okay. And the number of cells will be 0 to 4 cells per cubic millimeter and it is predominantly lymphocytes and sugars will be two thirds of the plasma sugars and proteins will be 15 to 45 milligrams per cent. And in case of bacterial meningitis, what will happen to this? The CSF pressure is elevated. The CSF will appear turbid. And what will happen to the cells? They are elevated. So more than 1000 cells per cubic millimeter will be there. And it is mainly neutrophilic predominant. And sugars will be utilized by the bacteria for the growth. So sugars will be reduced. And our body will produce antibodies against the bacteria which are nothing but the proteins. So the proteins are elevated. And similar picture you will have in tubercular meningitis but only difference is that the lymphocytic predominant will be there in tubercular meningitis and the glucose will be decreased and proteins will be elevated. Whereas in viral meningitis the CSF pressure will be elevated but the CSF will be clear like water and it is your lymphocytic predominant the glucose levels will appear normal and the proteins are elevated in viral meningitis. And in glenn barry syndrome, everything will be normal, right? But only albuminocytological dissociation will be there. And what is the differential diagnosis for albuminocytological dissociation? Differential diagnosis for albuminocytological dissociation. Any one of you? So differential diagnosis for albuminocytological dissociation will be the Froin syndrome. Right, that will be Froin syndrome. So please remember it's a very important. Next, coming to fungal meningitis, the CSF pressure will be elevated, the CSF will be clear, and how will be the cells? The lymphocytic predominant will be there, 
sugars will be utilized by the fungus fungal growth and your csf proteins will be normal or elevated when you are taking csf in early stages the proteins will be normal but later the proteins are elevated okay right so that is about the csf picture in all the forms of meningitis then please identify this test tube what is this what is the diagnosis so where do you come across this so whatever has been given to you there it is a cobweb coagulum right so cobweb coagulum what does it contain it contains proteins and where do you see this you will see that in case of tubercular meningitis right so cobweb coagulum which contains proteins it is seen in case of the tubercular meningitis okay right and you take the organ uh, your tubercular meningitis what is the treatment that you will give in case of tubercular meningitis we give 2 grams of ceftriaxone it is not 1 gram of ceftriaxone 2 grams of ceftriaxone plus vancomycin should be given and in case of tubercular meningitis we give anti tubercular therapy that is nearly around 6 to 9 months and in case of viral meningitis right uh, the drug that we need to give is the acyclovir and in fungal meningitis the most common fungal infection that will cause is your the cryptococcal meningitis and what will be what will you give for fungal meningitis liposomal amphotericin b should be given in case of fungal meningitis okay so that is about your meningitis now the next important neurological disorder will be the motor neuron disease so the quick question is which is pathognomonic for motor neuron disease yes what is pathognomonic for motor neuron disease any one of you right so motor neuron disease please remember it is only the motor neurons that are being affected right so among the options which has been given to you sensory loss never bladder and bowel involvement never pseudo hypertrophy never and pathognomonic will be your uh, fasciculations okay and the age group at which you see this motor neuron disease is mainly around 30 to 60 years and do you know what is the important risk factor for motor neuron disease important risk factor for the development of motor neuron disease any one of you the important risk factor is smoking right smoking okay and we have three important forms of motor neuron disease what are those three important forms you have some motor neuron disease where there is involvement of both upper and lower motor neuron and that will be your amyotrophic lateral sclerosis and there is a motor neuron disease where there is predominantly upper motor neuron involvement and what is that that is your primary lateral sclerosis and there is predominantly lower motor neuron involvement and what is that that will be your spinomuscular atrophy so spinomuscular atrophy it is predominantly lower motor neuron involvement but among all these which is more common the more common will be amyotrophic lateral sclerosis and finally and how will be the prognosis in these individuals they have like bad prognosis and finally how do they die these patients with motor neuron disease they die because of the respiratory failure so what is the most common cause of death in patients with motor neuron disease that will be the respiratory failure okay next then is there any drug for motor neuron disease yes we have two important drugs one we have riluzol what this riluzol will do actually this motor neuron disease is mainly because of excessive release of glutamate what this riluzol will do riluzol will inhibit the glutamate release right will inhibit the glutamate release so the advantage of this particular riluzol is it will slow the progression of the disease and one more drug we have for motor neuron disease that is idavarone that is idavarone what is idavarone it's a free radical scavenger and even this will slow the disease progression so that is about your motor neuron disease and you should not wind up neurology without discussing multiple sclerosis multiple sclerosis is another very very important topic in the neurology without revising this topic you should not go to the exam now in multiple sclerosis what is that particular drug 
that will cause maximum reduction in the appearance of the new lesions and change in the disease severity in RRMS type of multiple sclerosis. Any one of you? So, which particular drug will cause maximum reduction in appearance of the new lesions? Okay, so maximum reduction appearance of the new lesions that is achieved by your natalizumab. That is achieved by natalizumab. And one quick question, please tell me, multiple sclerosis, it is a demyelinating disorder of peripheral nervous system, demyelinating disorder of central nervous system, demyelinating disorder of peripheral nervous system and central nervous system. What do you think is the correct answer? A, B, C. Yes, please remember your multiple sclerosis, it is a demyelinating disorder of the central nervous system. It is a demyelinating disorder of central nervous system. And for the development of multiple sclerosis, you have a HLA association. And what is the HLA association for the development of multiple sclerosis? That is HLA DR2 gene. Right, HLA DR2 gene that is being demonstrated to be genetically susceptible individuals. Okay, and the other causes include environmental multiple sclerosis. Environmental multiple sclerosis is what that is seen in patients with vitamin D deficiency. And you also have some viruses which can cause multiple sclerosis that is Epstein Barr virus. Even this also can cause multiple sclerosis. And we have the four important patterns in multiple sclerosis RRMS, PPMS, PRMS and SPMS. So, which is the most common type of multiple sclerosis? Any one of you? What is the most common type of multiple sclerosis? So, the most common type of multiple sclerosis is RRMS that is relapsing, remitting multiple sclerosis. And you know which is the rare that is PPMS. Right? Rare and the one with worst prognosis. Okay? Rare and the one with worst prognosis. That will be your PPMS. Okay? Right. And in case of multiple sclerosis, what will be the clinical symptomatology? The most common symptomatology will be the sensory loss and that sensory loss will be in the form of paresthesias. And what is the most common cranial nerve which is affected that will be optic neuritis or optic nerve will be there and because of which the individual can have the visual loss, there can be blindness, there can be color blindness, so multiple visual manifestations are there. And the other features will be weakness, paresthesias, diplopia, ataxia. Ataxia is due to what? That is mainly due to demyelination of cerebellum. Okay, vertigo, paroxysmal attacks and there can be even bladder involvement. And you have to know one important phenomenon. Right, important phenomenon. Yes, Asadullah, tell me this question. Tell me the answer to this question. Uthos phenomenon seen in multiple sclerosis is due to. Uthos phenomenon, what is that? Whenever the individual is exposed to the hot water or whenever the individual is exposed to the hot environment, the symptoms of multiple sclerosis, they get exaggerated. And why is that due to? Very good. That is due to decreased conduction of nerves. It is not due to increased conduction. It is due to decreased conduction of nerve. Okay. And the next important sign is Lermit sign. What is Lermit sign? Lermit sign is that on bending the neck or on flexing the neck, there will be electric shock like sensation down the spinal cord that is called the hermit sign and where is that we bend our neck in front of a barber that is the reason why it is called barber chair sign see in front of the barber you have to definitely bend your neck right in front of the barber you cannot say hum jukega nahi right so that does not work out in front of a barber okay you have to definitely bend your neck in front of a barber to have a proper haircut Okay, so that is the reason why it is called the barber chair sign. And what are the conditions where you can have this uh, Lermit sign? 
that is in case of multiple sclerosis next in case of the subacute combined degeneration of spinal cord that is vitamin b12 deficiency and you can also have that in case of the cervical spondylosis right and you also see that in patients with syringomyelia right syringomyelia is that where you have a dissociative sensory loss so even in syringomyelia you can have this uh, lehermit sign okay right so next now what is the investigation of choice in multiple sclerosis the investigation of choice will be gadolinium enhanced mri right investigation of choice is <laughs> yes ankit pandey so there your barber does like that one yeah? <laughs> okay right so investigation of choice is gadolinium enhanced mri okay so what is that you will see in the gadolinium enhanced mri you will have this fibrotic plaques in the periventricular area and the description is called as the dawson sphere okay that is the investigation of choice and what does the csf analysis show csf analysis in patients with multiple sclerosis that will show you the presence of the oligoclonal bands and what is the name of the criteria in case of multiple sclerosis that will be mcdonald's criteria right the name of the criteria is mcdonald's criteria and we have one rare form of multiple sclerosis can anyone tell me what is this devick's disease which is also called neuromyelitis optica so what is the criteria what is the criteria to call it as the devick's disease so there should be demyelination of more than or equal to 3 vertebral segments and along with that there will be optic neuritis that is what is called neuromyelitis optica or devick's disease right now one quick question here now so we have a 30 year old female presents with complaining of gradual onset weakness of legs of one month with reduction in visual acuity and urinary incontinence for past few days contrast mri shows the periventricular lesion which of the following drugs is not used in these patients which of the following drug is not used in these patients pingolimod beta interferon glatiramer acetate mitotain yes which is that you will not use right we don't use mitotain right where do we use this mitotain we use this mitotain in the treatment of cushings but not in case of see what is the discussion about the discussion is about multiple sclerosis we give pingolimod we give beta interferon we also give glatiramer acetate but not your the mitotain okay and what is the drug of choice for acute attack of multiple sclerosis in case of acute attacks we give methylprednisolone methylprednisolone is a drug of choice for acute attacks of multiple sclerosis whereas what are the disease modifying therapy disease modifying therapy will be your interferon right that is interferon beta okay beta interferons then glatiramer acetate natalizumab fingolimod metoxantron dimethyl fumarate teriflunomide and alemtuzumab but among all these the one which is very much effective in case of rrms that will be your natalizumab okay so that was about your multiple sclerosis right then the next important topic is about the epilepsy So in epilepsy, what is very important here is the drug of choice in various types of epilepsy. Yes, please answer this. What is the drug of choice in case of GTCS or atonic or myoclonic or absent seizures? Anyone? <clears throat> drug of choice in GTCS, atonic, myoclonic or absent seizures. That will be valproic acid. And what is the drug of choice during an episode of febrile seizures? During an episode of febrile seizures. what we give is intranasal right intranasal midazolam or the other drug that can be given is rectal dizepam rectal dizepam but what is prophylaxis that you should give prophylaxis of uh, febrile seizure we give same midazolam but that will be oral midazolam and if it is absent seizures less than 4 years what is the drug of choice that will be etosuximide right that will be etosuximide and in case of infantile spasm what is the drug of choice infantile spasm 
the drug of choice will be adrenocorticotrophic hormone and infantile spasm in tuberous sclerosis the drug of choice will be vigabatrin whereas in status epilepticus the drug of choice will be lorazepam right drug of choice will be lorazepam and in refractory status epilepticus the drug of choice will be midazolam right midazolam so this is about the drug of choice in various types of epilepsy okay then you should know what is the treatment for medically refractory epilepsy so what is the type of diet that you prescribe in case of medically refractory epilepsy what is the type of diet that you prescribe in case of medically refractory epilepsy that is your ketotic diet or it is the ketogenic diet and what is the procedure that you will do the procedure that we do is vagal nerve stimulation vagal nerve stimulation or the deep brain stimulation so these are the treatment options that you have for the refractory epilepsy and the best results are seen even with surgery for temporal lobe epilepsy we do temporal lobectomy we do temporal lobectomy okay right and yeah so for with which particular drug you have this teratogenicity with which drug you have this teratogenicity yes this is one of the important image based question very good these are that is what uh, the individual has developed the cleft lip and as well as the cleft palate so that you will see with the phenytoin which is nothing but your fetal hydantoin syndrome and this will be the hypertrophic gums and hirsutism that can be seen with the adverse effects associated with the phenytoin so this completes the discussion of the important topics in the neurology right important topics in the neurology okay so i hope i have covered maximum topics in the neurology now we'll move on to the next important topic that is pulmonology right pulmonology so the topic first topic will be the ARDS that is acute respiratory distress syndrome now can anyone tell me right can anyone tell me normal pulmonary capillary wedge pressure with pulmonary edema is seen in normal pulmonary capillary wedge pressure with pulmonary edema is seen in yeah sham the pdf i have uploaded on my instagram handle hmm? i have sent a link on my instagram handle that is rajesh gubba which is there in my bio of instagram and once you click on the link you will get the pdf there right very good so the one among the options which has been given to you the one which will cause air so where will you have your normal pulmonary capillary wedge pressure normal pulmonary capillary wedge pressure you have that in case of ARDS that is acute respiratory distress syndrome and among the options which one will cause your ARDS that is your high altitude so high altitude it is associated with the development of pulmonary edema and you should know overall what is the most common cause for ARDS any one of you most common cause of ARDS overall is anyone most common cause of ARDS overall will be sepsis okay and most common cause of direct lung injury leading to ARDS here the answer will be pneumonia whereas most common cause of indirect lung injury leading to ARDS that will be sepsis right that will be sepsis okay so please remember these are very very important points and the next thing is you should know the difference between non cardiogenic and cardiogenic pulmonary edema so non cardiogenic pulmonary edema you have that in case of ARDS where your pulmonary capillary wedge pressure will be absolutely normal whereas cardiogenic pulmonary edema you will have that in left ventricular failure and here the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure will be elevated right and how much is the normal pulmonary capillary wedge pressure that is around 6 to 12 millimeters of mercury but the cutoff what we take is 18 millimeters of mercury right and what is the name of the criteria any one of you 
What is the name of the criteria for ARDS? Anyone? Name of the criteria for ARDS. Name of the criteria for ARDS, it is called the Berlin's criteria. Hmm? It is called Berlin's criteria. So, how can you remember or how will you remember the uh, criteria in Berlin's? Please remember the mnemonic ARDS. What does this A stands for? A stands for acute in onset where the symptoms will develop within one week of clinical insult. R stands for reduced PaO2 by FiO2. Reduced PaO2 by FiO2. And D stands for diffuse bilateral opacities on the chest X-ray. S stands for Swan-Gans catheter showing normal pulmonary capillary wedge pressure. Okay. So, with the help of Swan-Gans catheter, you will measure the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure. Okay. So, that will be showing normal pulmonary capillary wedge pressure. And depending upon your PaO2 by FiO2, we assess the CVRT of ARDS. What is that? If it is like, if the PaO2 by FiO2 is like 200 to 300, that will be mild. If PaO2 by FiO2 is 100 to 200, that will be moderate. And if PaO2 by FiO2 is less than 100, that will be your severe ARDS. That will be your severe ARDS. And what will be the chest X-ray findings in patients with ARDS? This will be the chest X-ray. So, we, dis we describe this as a complete white out lung. Right? We describe these lungs as the complete white out lung. Okay? And what are the quick important points and uh, related to ARDS? So, these are the nutshell points of ARDS. So, most common cause of ARDS is what? Sepsis. And how will be the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure? Normal pulmonary capillary wedge pressure. What type of pulmonary edema? Non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema will be there. And this pulmonary edema is rich in proteins. There will be formation of the hyaline membrane. And there is also intrapulmonary shunting. And how much will be your PaO2 by FiO2? That will be less than 200. Whereas in mild, it can be less than 300 also. Test X-ray, what it will show you? Bilateral white out lung. What is the treatment of choice? Low volume ventilation with continuous positive airway pressure. Low volume ventilation with continuous positive airway pressure. Okay, right. And this is the this this is the chest X-ray that you will have in case of non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema, where you have bilateral whiteout opacities will be there. Can anyone tell me in which condition you will have this particular chest X-ray finding? In which condition you will have? this particular chest x-ray finding. Hmm? You see that uh, opacity, how is it? So, it is like characteristic, right? It is like characteristic bat wing appearance. Hmm? Characteristic bat wing appearance. Very good. You will have this in case of congestive cardiac failure. Hmm? You will have this in case of Pulmonary edema caused by your congestive car. So, left ventricular failure, you have this characteristic bat wing appear. Okay. Right. So, now after having discussed about the ARDS, the next important topic will be COPD. Right. Now, you in the COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, what is the name of the criteria? The name of the criteria is the GOLD criteria. Right. That is Global Initiative for Obstructive Lung Disease. That is what is called GOLD criteria. So, according to this GOLD criteria, when will you call very severe COPD? Any one of you? When will you call the word very severe COPD according to your gold criteria? Very good. So, your PAO2, by, sorry, your FEV1 per, uh, should be less than 30%. When your FEV1 is less than 30%, then we consider it as the very severe COPD, right? And when do we call like the mild, see, when your uh, FEV1 percentage, if it is more than 80%, then we call it as mild, okay. And if your FEV1 percentage, if it is like 50 to 79%, we call it as moderate. And if your FEV1 percentage, if it is like 30 to 49%, then we call it as severe. And if your FEV1 percentage is less than 30%, it is considered as the very severe. Hmm? It is considered as very severe. Okay. This is very, very important. Now, in case of the COPD, uh, like what type of airways which are affected here? 
the airways which are affected in case of COPD is the smaller airways. And what is the definition of a smaller airway? The internal diameter should be less than 2 mm and there should be absence of the cartilage. Right? So, cartilaginous rings are absent. Right? There should be absence of the cartilage. And what are all the various examples of smaller airway disease? It is not only COPD. COPD, bronchial asthma, hypersensitivity pneumonitis, bronchiolitis, mineralless pneumoconiosis. These are all smaller airway diseases. Okay, I'll repeat COPD, asthma, hypersensitivity pneumonitis, bronchiolitis and mineral dust pneumoconiosis. And very, very important question is about the read index. Tell me in which condition the read index is elevated. Yes, which condition the read index is elevated. So, first of all, what is read index? Read index is nothing but it is the ratio of thickness. It is the ratio of thickness of submucosal glands to that of the entire bronchial wall is called reed index and reed index is increased in case of chronic bronchitis and how much is the normal value normal value of your reed index it is 0.44 plus or minus 0.09 and how much is that in case of chronic bronchitis that will be 0.52 plus or minus 0.08 so, read index is elevated in case of chronic bronchitis. Okay, and that is because of because of that the individual will have mucoid sputum. Then, if you take related to emphysema, alpha one antitrypsin deficiency is associated with alpha one antitrypsin deficiency is associated with yes, very not centrius na, not centrius na. Alpha 1 antitrypsin deficiency is associated with panacinar emphysema. Hmm? It is associated with panacinar emphysema. Panacinar means what? It is the entire acinus which is affected. That means your alveolar ducts, respiratory bronchioles, alveolar sac, and even alveoli, everything is abnormally dilated. That is panacinar. You will see that in case of the alpha 1 antitrypsin deficiency. And where will you get this centriacinar uh, emphysema? Centriacinar emphysema, you come across this in case of smokers. And centriacinar emphysema, it is only respiratory bronchioles which are abnormally dilated. Whereas the distal part of the acinus, like alveolar duct, alveolar sac, and alveoli will be normal in case of centriacinar. Whereas paraseptal is what? It is the distal part of the acinus which is affected. That is your alveolar duct, alveolar sac, and alveoli. That is being affected in case of paraseptal emphysema. Okay. And which part of the lung is affected in paraseptal emphysema? It is the peripheral part of the lung which is being affected and that is the reason why the individual can develop pneumothorax as well. Okay. Now, I will show you an x-ray. Please tell me, yeah, this x-ray is suggestive of what? Diagnosis of this x-ray is what? Any one of you quickly? This particular x-ray is suggestive of? So, this x-ray is suggestive of emphysema. So, what will be the picture in case of emphysema? You will have bilaterally hyperlucent lung fields will be there and this vertical or tubular heart will be there. Actually, the heart will not become vertical or tubular. It is the abnormally irreversibly dilated lungs. They overlap the heart. Once they overlap the heart, the heart will be like vertical or tubular and there will be low set diaphragm. So, the diaphragm, they comp the lungs, abnormally irreversibly dilated lungs, they compress the diaphragm. Okay, that is what is called the low set diaphragm. And next important is this particular x-ray. What is this x-ray suggestive of? This is suggestive of chronic bronchitis. So, what is that you will have in chronic bronchitis? In case of chronic bronchitis, you have increased bronchovascular markings. Okay, where the bronchovascular markings will be beyond one third. Right, where the bronchovascular markings will be beyond one third. And as I already have said you, what is the name of the criteria in case of COPD? That is gold criteria. That is global initiative for obstructive lung disease. So, depending upon the CVRT, we give the treatment. When it, Just now we have discussed, when do we call mild COPD? When your FEV1 percentage is more than 80%. We give only short acting beta agonist. When do we call moderate? When it is 50 to 79%. What do we add here? Long acting beta agonists or anticholinergic drugs can be added. Whereas in severe COPD, where the 
if ev1 is 30 to 49% we also add inhaled steroids when if ev1 is less than 30% we also give parenteral oxygen so that is about your cop okay the next important topic is the bronchial asthma and you should know in case of bronchial asthma when do we use the word acute severe asthma so the question is which of the following values is not a feature of acute severe asthma pulses paradoxes partial pressure of oxygen less than 8 kPa heart rate more than 110 peak expiratory flow rate 60 to 70 percentage of the expected value so when do which of the following is not the feature of yes abhay uh, which one you are talking about you have to follow the new guidelines definitely right so which one of the following is not the feature of the acute severe asthma yeah for copd treatment you need to follow the new guidelines hmm, the new one okay right so which one of the following is not a feature of acute severe asthma yes quickly so the feature which is not suggestive of acute severe asthma is peak expiratory flow rate 60 to 70% so how much will be the peak expiratory flow rate in case of acute severe asthma in case of acute severe asthma the peak expiratory flow rate will be less than 40% less than 40% whereas in case of very severe asthma right very severe asthma it will be less than 25% the peak expiratory flow rate will be less than 25% okay right and in case of patients with asthma what will be the clinical presentation it is mainly the wheeze wheeze will be the clinical presentation and apart from wheeze the individual will also have cough with expectoration and the expectoration in patients with bronchial asthma you have some important particles in the sputum one is your kirschman spirals what is kirschman spirals they are like spiral shaped mucus plugs that is what kirschman spirals is they have like creola bodies what is creola bodies they are nothing but ciliated columnar cells which are sloughed from the bronchial mucosa then you have charcot laden crystals what are charcot laden crystals these are slender and pointed at both ends they are called charcot laden crystals and presence of charcot laden crystals tells you that there is an inflammation eosinophilic inflammation okay so it is suggestive of eosinophilic inflammation so what are the other conditions where you can have eosinophilic inflammation you can have that in case of the parasitic infections as well and that is even in parasitic infections you can have this charcot laden crystals okay right then whenever you are diagnosing asthma so this particular asthma is diagnosed by asthma is diagnosed by FEV1 measurement of tidal volume and expiratory flow rate total lung capacity so asthma is also diagnosed right it is also diagnosed it is diagnosed by your FEV1 percentage so just now as i was discussing the peak expiratory flow rate or like your FEV1 when will you call like mild asthma when your fev1 percentage is like more than 70% when will you call moderate asthma like fev1 percentage is 40 to 69% and when fev1 percentage is less than 40% it is considered as severe and when fev1 percentage is less than 25% we call it as the very severe okay right now and this fev1 is also very much important to differentiate copd from bronchial asthma So if you have a doubt whether the patient is having COPD or bronchial asthma you need to do bronchodilator response test what is that you need to calculate the baseline FEV1 value then you need to give short acting beta agonist that is salbutamol or albuterol and after 5 to 10 minutes or 10 to 15 minutes again you have to calculate the FEV1 so if the increase in FEV1 right if the increase in FEV1 is like more than 12% or in more than 200 ml after your salbutamol embolization it is bronchial asthma 
But if the increase is less than 12% or less than 200 ml, then it is considered to be the COPD, right? It is considered to be COPD, okay? And one quick question related to your bronchial asthma. Yes, answer this. A known asthmatic presented to the emergency with severe exacerbation not relieved by salbutamol. The patient was given corticosteroids and aminophilin. What is the rationale of giving corticosteroids along with salbutamol nebulization? What is the purpose of it? What is the purpose of it? So, you have to remember that the purpose of giving corticosteroids, right? The purpose of giving corticosteroids is that corticosteroids facilitate the action of the beta 2 agonist, right? They facilitate the action of the beta 2 agonist, okay? Right? They don't sensitize the adenosine receptor. They don't have the bronchodilator activity and they don't increase the mucociliary clearance. Okay, they facilitate the action of your beta 2 agonist. Okay, right. That was about your bronchial asthma. The next important topic in pulmonology will be your cystic fibrosis. So, cystic fibrosis is what? It is an inherited disorder. Okay, what type of inheritance is your cystic, uh, cystic fibrosis? What type of inheritance is your cystic fibrosis? Any one of you? It is an autosomal recessive type of inheritance and it typically occurs in childhood and the inheritance is autosomal recessive type of inheritance and what is the gene which is being mutated and that has been asked in the recent INICT exam also right definitely they have given it as the CFTR gene but which chromosome it is chromosome 7 and on which location it is your delta right it is your delta F508 mutation and which amino acid it is phenylalanine deletion okay so this is the recently INICT question which particular gene on which chromosome which number which amino acid everything was asked so remember 508 phenylalanine deletion on chromosome 7 and what will be the presentation in patients with cystic fibrosis the neonates they present with meconium ileus and what will you give for meconium ileus? You need to give gastrographin enema. And why these individuals are prone for recurrent pneumonias? Because they have like thick and viscid mucus that is there in the lungs. And that will be the source of infection. And other respiratory infection, uh, respiratory manifestation may be bronchiectasis. Now the question is, which part of the lung you have the bronchiectasis in case of cystic fibrosis? Any one of you please answer this. Upper lung fields, mid lung fields, lower lung fields. Which part of the lung field is affected in cystic fibrosis for the development of bronchiectasis? So please remember, it is the upper lung fields which are being affected. And GIT manifestations in patients with cystic fibrosis will be in the form of the secondary biliary cirrhosis. Why is that secondary biliary cirrhosis? Because there is thick and viscid bile juice that leads to the cholestatic jaundice. And that will manifest as the secondary biliary cirrhosis. And these individuals, they also have osmotic diarrhea. Why is that they have osmotic diarrhea? Because the pancreatic juice normally contain amylase, which is useful for sugar absorption. But here, the pancreatic juice, they be, it becomes thick. Once the pancreatic juice becomes thick, there is fall in the amylase levels. Once there is fall in the amylase levels, glucose absorption will not be there and the glucose will absorb the fluid across the GAT resulting in the osmotic diarrhea. And these individuals, they also develop infertility. So what is the cause of infertility in males? The cause of infertility in males will be azospermia. But why is that azospermia? The reason for azospermia in males is because due to agenesis of the vas deferens, due to agenesis of vas deferens, whereas even in females, there can be infertility. Why is that infertility in females? That is due to increase in the cervical mucus thickness. Once there is increase in cervical mucus thickness, the swimming of the sperms up to the fallopian tube cannot occur. And how do you investigate? So you will investigate the first initial screening test 
will be sweat chloride concentration. So what will be the, how much will be the sweat chloride concentration in case of cystic fibrosis? That will be more than 60 milli equivalents per liter. That should be minimum on two occasions. But what will be the investigation of choice? That is, you need to do genetic analysis. So you have to check for the CFTR mutation analysis should be done. That will be the investigation of choice in these patients. Okay. And what will be the targeted therapy? The targeted therapy that you should give in case of cystic fibrosis is that you have to improve the CFTR gene. And what is the drug of choice there? Which is a potentiator of C your CFTR channel? The potentiator of CFTR channel will be Ivacaftor. Right? That will be Ivacaftor. And in severe stages of cystic fibrosis, what is left out? Lung transplantation is the only definitive treatment. Lung transplantation is the only definitive treatment. Okay? Right. So, that finishes your cystic fibrosis. Now, the next important topic in the pulmonology will be the bronchiectasis. Now, regarding the bronchiectasis, you should know which particular airways are affected in bronchiectasis? Medium-sized airways. Whereas COPD, small-sized airways. And in bronchiectasis, the medium-sized airways, which particular generation? 5th to ninth generation. And you should know which lobe is commonly affected in bronchiectasis. Anyone? Bronchiectasis is most common in which lobe? Any one of you? Very good. So that will be that will be the left lower lobe that is affected in case of bronchitis. That is the most common lobe. Why? Because the airway to the left lower lobe is long and narrow. That can get affected. And followed by the left lower lobe, the next most common lobe which is being affected is the middle lobe. And middle lobe, you have that only for the right lung. So, the middle lobe of the right lung is the next most commonly affected lobe. And if you take the types of bronchiectasis, so we have three important forms of bronchiectasis that is cylindrical, saccular or cystic and then varicose. That is all depending upon the shape of the bronchi which is abnormally irreversibly dilated. And which is the most common form? The most common form will be cylindrical bronchiectasis. And you should know which particular condition you will have mid-lung field bronchiectasis. What is the condition where you will have mid-lung field bronchiectasis? Mid-lung field bronchiectasis. Mid-lung field bronchiectasis is seen in case of mycobacterium avium infection. Whereas the remaining all, that is allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis, tuberculosis, post-radiation fibrosis and cystic fibrosis. In all these, it is the upper lobe bronchiectasis which is more common. And you also have lower lobe bronchiectasis. Lower lobe bronchiectasis is mainly seen in case of aspiration. Recurrent aspirations, there will be lower lobe bronchiectasis. Okay. Right. That is about your upper, middle and lower lung bronchiectasis. Next. Followed by that, you should know how do you diagnose these patients with that bronchiectasis. So, what will be the test x-ray finding in patients with bronchiectasis? You have that classical tram track appearance. So, in this irreversibly dilated bronchi, you have that classical tram track appearance, which is nothing but your railway track. Okay. Next. But what is the investigation of choice? Investigation of choice will be your HRCT, high resolution CT scan. And in the high resolution CT scan, what will be the findings that you can have? You can have that tree in bud appearance or you can have this signet ring sign. You can have this signet ring sign and you can also do bronchoscopy. But what is the purpose of doing bronchoscopy? That is mainly for visualizing the bronchus. And one of the important complication in bronchiectasis is massive hemoptysis. So how will you treat this massive hemoptysis? How will you treat this massive hemoptysis in case of the bronchiectasis? Anyone? So how will you treat this massive hemoptysis is you need to do bronchial artery embolization. Right? You need to do bronchial artery embolization. That is how you will treat the massive hemoptysis. Okay? So that finishes your bronchiectasis. Then the next important topic is the bronchogenic carcinoma. The next important topic is bronchogenic carcinoma. 
So we have four important forms of bronchogenic carcinoma. That is small cell carcinoma, then large cell carcinoma, squamous cell carcinoma and adenocarcinoma. But the important question is, the clubbing is least common in which type of bronchogenic carcinoma? Clubbing is least common in which type of bronchogenic carcinoma? Clubbing is least common in case of small cell carcinoma of the lung. Please remember that is an important question. Right? It is least common in case of small cell carcinoma of the lung. Now, let me quickly discuss some important single liners related to bronchogenic carcinoma. So, the question that can be asked is, what is the most common benign tumor of the lung? The most common benign tumor of the lung that will be hamartoma. Right. And what is the most common cause of recurrent hemoptysis? The most common cause of recurrent hemoptysis will be bronchial adenoma. And what is the most common cause of cancer death? That will be lung cancer. Among all the cancers, the one cancer which can cause death most commonly will be lung cancer. And what is the most common risk factor for bronchogenic carcinoma? That will be smoking. And what is the most common natural risk factor for the development of bronchogenic carcinoma? That will be exposure to the radon gas. Right? Exposure to radon gas. It is an environmental pollutant. And most common rib which is affected in pancos tumor. Where will you see this pancos tumor? You see that in case of adenocarcinoma. And the most common rib that is affected in case of pancos will be the first rib. And what are the most common nerve roots which are involved in pancos? The most common nerve roots will be C8, T1 and as well as T2. Where, where do you come across this pancos? You will come across this in case of adenocarcinoma. Then, what is the most common histological type all over the world? The most common histological type all over the world will be adenocarcinoma. And what is the most common histological type in India? That will be squamous cell carcinoma. Right? And what is the most common histological type that you will see in non-smokers? That will be adenocarcinoma. And what is the most common variety that you will see in young patients? That will be also adenocarcinoma. Right? So, don't worry whether if you are not able to write. I will be sending you this PDF immediately after the class. Okay? Yesterday's PDF, as already I have said you, I have sent that on my Instagram handle, that is Rajesh Gubba. The link is available in my bio. Okay? Right. Now, what is the most common histological variety in females? The most common histological variety in females will be adenocarcinoma. And what is the most common site for metastasis from carcinoma lung? That is to the liver. What is the most common endocrine organ to be involved in carcinoma of the lung? That will be the adrenal gland. Right? That will be the adrenal gland. And what is that particular carcinoma that will be metastasizing to the opposite lung? The carcinoma that will metastasize to the opposite lung will be adenocarcinoma. And most common tumor to metastasize to the heart. Actually from the lung where it will go most commonly? To the liver. Which endocrine organ? Adrenal gland. But for the heart if the metastasis has to come from, it will most commonly come from the carcinoma of the lung. And what are the bronchogenic carcinomas that will cavitate? The bronchogenic carcinomas that we cavitate is squamous cell carcinoma and as well as the large cell carcinoma. And what are the histological varieties which are central in distribution? Central in distribution are squamous cell carcinoma and as well as the small cell carcinoma. Right? SQ stands for squamous cell carcinoma. And which is the type of bronchogenic carcinoma which has peripheral distribution? That is adenocarcinoma. And which is the type of bronchogenic carcinoma which has paraneoplastic activity? That will be small cell carcinoma. Okay. Your uh, small cell uh, carcinoma, it can produce antidiuretic hormone. It can produce atrial natriuretic peptide. It can produce 
the your pushings that is your corticosteroids okay right and you should know what is the bronchogenic carcinoma which will cause hypokalemia that will be small cell carcinoma right that will be small cell carcinoma why because it will produce cushings and in cushings there are more steroids when there is more steroids that will go and activate the enac channels and the type of bronchogenic carcinoma which will cause hypercalcemia that will be squamous cell carcinoma why because squamous cell carcinoma is a source for parathormone that can cause hypercalcemia and the type of bronchogenic carcinoma which is most responsive to chemotherapy will be small cell carcinoma we don't do surgery in uh, small cell carcinoma because it is high tendency of metastasis so surgery is ineffective in case of small cell carcinoma and the one which will uh, respond better to radiotherapy is also small cell carcinoma but among all these types of bronchogenic carcinoma the one which will has the best prognosis that will be squamous cell carcinoma hmm? that will be squamous cell carcinoma and you need to know the two important the tumor markers what are the two important tumor markers the two important tumor markers are carcino embryonic antigen and neuron specific anomalies so carcino embryonic antigen what is it it is a metastatic right it tells you about the metastatic cancer it tells you about metastatic cancer and what is this neuron specific anomalies neuron specific anomalies it is a prognostic marker right it is a prognostic marker in case of the small cell carcinoma okay so that is about the tumor markers in case of bronchogenic carcinoma and this finishes bronchogenic carcinoma and the last important topic in the pulmonology will be your pulmonary embolism and what will be the clinical presentation in pulmonary embolism the most common presentation will be sudden onset dyspnea and other manifestations are syncopal attack hypotension cyanosis and second most common symptom will be pleuritic chest pain the others are cough hemoptysis and palpitation now how will you diagnose so you take the ecg in patients with pulmonary embolism what do you think is the most frequent ecg finding in pulmonary embolism any one of you most common ecg finding no 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 it is not s1 q3 t3 pattern s1 q3 t3 pattern it is present only in 7 to 10 percentage of patients with pulmonary embolism very good right that will be sinus tachycardia sinus yes rajesh natarajan i will just upload with annotations i will upload with annotations don't worry about it okay right sinus tachycardia yes rajesh natarajan this will be more than enough for your entire medicine because i am discussing each and every topic and important points in, in every topic this will be more than enough okay right so the most common ecg finding will be the sinus tachycardia and what are the other findings that you can have right axis deviation can be there p pulmonary can be there right bundle branch block can be there and s1 q3 t3 pattern is present only in 7 to 10 percentage of patients okay right then and this is what is your sinus tachycardia and if you calculate the heart rate in this it is around 150 so 300 divided by number of large boxes between the rr interval if you take there are nearly around two boxes so that will be around 150 or more than 150 and this is what is your s1 q3 t3 pattern s1 q3 t3 pattern is what you will have deep s wave in lead 1 and you have q wave and inverted t wave in lead 3 that is what is called s1 q3 t3 pattern and what is the okay what is the investigation of choice in case of pulmonary embolism anyone what is the investigation of choice it is not chest x ray chest x ray is not your investigation of choice what is the investigation of choice very good so investigation of choice will be ct pulmonary angiogram and you need to know three important findings in the chest x ray one is your hampton sum which is nothing but a wedge shaped infarct then you need to know the palas sign right what is this palas sign palas sign is nothing but prominent right descending pulmonary artery then you need to know the western mark sign and what is this western mark sign western mark sign is nothing but pulmonary oligemia that is what is called western mark sign okay next important is the d dimer so 
डी डाइमर मे बी इंक्रीज इन ऑल ऑफ द फॉलोइंग कंडीशन इन पलमंडी एम्बोलिज्म डेफिनेटली डी डाइमर लेवल्स आर एलिवेटेड बट अपार्ट फ्रॉम दैट द क्वेश्चन इज एक्सेप्ट सो द क्वेश्चन इज इन विच ऑफ द फॉलोइंग कंडीशन डी डाइमर इज नॉट एलिवेटेड इज द क्वेश्चन एनी वन राइट सो दैट इज इन केस ऑफ नो आई डिड नॉट गेट द करेक्ट आंसर फ्रॉम एनी वन ऑफ यू right that will be the anticoagulant therapy see when the patient is on anticoagulant therapy where is the question of the formation of a thrombus thrombus formation will not be there so d dimer is what it is a fragmented part of your thrombus when the patient is on anticoagulant therapy where is the question of thrombus there is no thrombus so if d dimer value is not increased when the patient is on anticoagulant therapy okay investigation of choice just now we have discussed that is ct pulmonary angiogram and what is the second best investigation second best investigation will be vp scan ventilation perfusion scan why because in pregnancy you cannot do ctpa right when you cannot do ctpa the next best investigation you need to know that is ventilation perfusion scan now i'll give you a clinical scenario tell me what is the treatment that you will do in this patient a young patient presented to emergency department with acute pulmonary embolism blood pressure of the patient is normal blood pressure of the patient is normal <coughs> but ecg reveals right ventricular hypokinesia and <coughs> compromised cardiac output the treatment in this patient is thrombolytic therapy anticoagulant with low molecular weight heparin anticoagulant with warfarin inferior vena cava filters yes very good very good medical doctor that will be thrombolytic therapy because see there are two indications for thrombolytic therapy one if there is hypotension you should do thrombolytic therapy or if the individual develops right ventricular dysfunction you should do thrombolytic therapy and that too he is a young individual he can withstand the thrombolysis but elderly patients you should be very much careful enough when you are doing thrombolysis otherwise if there is hypotension or right ventricular dysfunction then you have to do thrombolysis and what is the name of the criteria for your pulmonary embolism the name of the criteria is also a very very important question the name of the criteria is the wells criteria that is modified wells criteria and you have the various parameters parameters itself they can ask you the question so the parameters which are included is the signs and symptoms of deep vein thrombosis then alternative diagnosis less likely compared to pulmonary embolism heart rate more than 100 immobilization for more than 3 days past history of pulmonary embolism or dvt hemoptysis and malignancy these are the parameters of your wells criteria and to consider pulmonary embolism how much should be the score if the score of the individual is more than 6 that is high probability of pulmonary embolism right high probability of pulmonary embolism and if the score is in between 2 to 6 it is moderate probability of pulmonary embolism and if the score is less than 2 it is low probability of pulmonary embolism. it is low probability of pulmonary embolism so that is about your modified wells criteria okay so this finishes your pulmonary embolism and the next important topic is yes sarcoidosis the next important topic in the pulmonology that you should know is the sarcoidosis what is the hallmark see your sarcoidosis it's a non caseating granuloma and it's a multi system involvement and among all these multiple systems the most common organ which is affected is lung and what will be that pulmonary manifestation that pulmonary manifestation the most common pulmonary manifestation will be in the form of the interstitial lung disease or there can be development of pulmonary fibrosis followed by the lung the next most common organ affected in sarcoidosis is lymph nodes bilateral hilar lymphadenopathy is characteristic in case of sarcoidosis and the skin manifestation is very very important can anyone tell me what is the skin manifestation what is the skin manifestation this is called lupus perneo right lupus perneo and apart from this this another important skin manifestation is the erythema nodosum right erythema nodosum and what is the investigation of choice in case of sarcoidosis investigation of choice in case of sarcoidosis will be biopsy and what does the biopsy show 
it is a non caseating granuloma that is what you will see in the biopsy and you should know what is called garland striae and there are many names for this garland striae this is also called as 1 2 3 sign it is also called as pawn broker sign right so what exactly you will see in this garland striae you will have bilateral hilar lymph node involvement and apart from bilateral hilar lymph node involvement you also have right paratracheal lymph node involvement okay so that is what is called garland striae or 1 2 3 sign or pawn broker sign and the next important is the gallium uptake studies right next important is the gallium uptake studies so when you when you give gallium the gallium will be uptaken by the lacrimal glands and as well as the salivary glands when gallium is uptaken by lacrimal glands and salivary glands you get this classical panda sign right you will get this classical panda sign and when the gallium is uptaken by your hilar lymph nodes and paratracheal lymph nodes you get this characteristic lambda sign you get this characteristic lambda sign so you have two important signs one is your panda sign the other one is lambda sign okay then what is the drug of choice in case of sarcoidosis any one of you what is the drug of choice for sarcoidosis so the drug of choice for the sarcoidosis will be steroids that is oral corticosteroids should be given in case of the sarcoidosis okay and if the individual is refractory right that means there is no response with steroids so corticosteroid refractory disease in this case you need to give methotrexate in this case you need to give methotrexate or azathioprine or infliximab can be given so that is about your corticosteroid refractory disease okay so this finishes your important topics in your pulmonology right so now we will just have a break for 15 minutes then we will come back and discuss the connective tissue disorders and the remaining topics as well okay all right so <clears throat> the next important topic yeah one important topic which we have forgot to discuss in the respiratory system will be the pleural disorders that is the pure that is the pleural effusion and as well as the pneumothorax so pleural effusion like what exactly is that where there is excessive fluid in the pleural space so what is very important to be known in case of pleural effusion is the transudate and as well as exudate so in case of the transudate how much will be the protein content that will be less than 3 grams whereas in exudate it will be more than 3 grams per deciliter and how much will be the fluid protein to the serum protein ratio in transudate it will be less than 0.5 whereas in exudate it is more than 0.5 and how much will be the fluid ldh to the serum ldh ratio in transudate it will be less than 0.6 whereas in exudate it will be more than 0.6 so all these three together in case of exudate we call it by a criteria called as the lights criteria right so if any one of the following is there we consider it to be the exudative type of pleural effusion now you need to know one important question that is therapeutic thoracocentesis that is therapeutic thoracocentesis should be performed if the free fluid in the lung separates the chest wall by greater than therapeutic thoracocentesis should be performed if the free fluid in the lung separates the chest wall by greater than any one of you 5 mm 10 mm 15 mm 20 mm very good so it is 10 mm that is 1 cm right that is 1 cm okay so when the distance between the chest wall and as well as the lung if it is more than 1 cm then you need to do therapeutic thoracocentesis and what will be the chest x ray findings in patients with the pleural effusion the earliest finding will be blunting of the costophrenic angle so this is the costophrenic angle that will get blunted that will be the earliest finding and the other findings are the presence of ls s shaped curve right presence of ls s shaped curve and what will happen to the mediastinum the trachea will be deviated to the opposite side so this will be the chest x ray finding 
then you take this chest x-ray suggestive of can anyone tell me what is the diagnosis of this condition can anyone tell me what is the diagnosis of this second chest x-ray so the second chest x-ray it is suggestive of the hydropneumothorax right it is suggestive of the hydropneumothorax so in hydropneumothorax you have the presence of the horizontal line and on auscultation in case of hydropneumothorax what will be the characteristic finding that you will have you will have succussion splash you will have succussion splash that is what you will see in case of the hydropneumothorax okay now another important quick clinical scenario a car accident patient complains of breathlessness on examination blood pressure is 110 by 70 gcs is 15 by 15 the trachea shows deviation in the suprasternal notch and there is reduced breath sounds in the left infraaxillary area and inframammary area first and second heart sounds are normal in intensity and splitting the chest x ray is shown below what is the best step in the management of this patient any one of you so what do you think is this patient developed needle aspiration you need to do pericardiosynthesis you need to do chest tube insertion immediate thoracotomy so what is that you will do in this patient yes so very good so this particular patient has developed the hemothorax right secondary to the road traffic accident the individual has developed hemothorax so how can you tell that the individual has developed hemothorax here because the left infra axillary and infra mammary area the breath sounds are reduced and trachea is also shifted to the opposite side so that tells that the individual has developed hemothorax so when there is hemothorax by doing needle aspiration you cannot take out the fluid right you need to put a chest tube for taking out the blood so chest tube insertion is the answer in this question and when will you do pericardiosynthesis pericardiosynthesis you will do when there is cardiac tamponade so how will you rule out that the patient did not develop cardiac tamponade in case of cardiac tamponade first and second heart sounds will be muffled but our patient tells that in our patient first and second heart sounds are normal that will rule out your cardiac tamponade so pericardiosynthesis is not required okay so what is that which is required here is the chest tube insertion okay next next important pleural disorder which is very very important is pneumothorax and what is the hallmark of the pneumothorax the hallmark of the pneumothorax it is the collapsed lung that is the hallmark of pneumothorax but very important you need to know in the pneumothorax is a tension pneumothorax which is an important medical emergency this tension pneumothorax can occur in the setting of a penetrating trauma it can occur in a setting of a lung infection it can occur in a setting of cardiopulmonary resuscitation it can occur even secondary to barotrauma right but in case of tension pneumothorax what will be the classical picture these individuals they will have hypotension jvp will be elevated the individual respiratory rate will be increased more than 30 per minute and what is the immediate treatment that you have to do immediate treatment that you need to do is wine wide bore needle aspiration right wide bore needle aspiration so that is what you have to do in case of tension pneumothorax okay and preferably like where we need to puncture the pleura you need to puncture the pleura in the second intercostal space according to the recent guidelines they have given like fifth intercostal space but in the clinical practice still we are following the second intercostal space and if it is asked in the exam you can just mention it as fifth intercostal space right then next you need to know that is the catamenial lung disorders what are catamenial lung disorders catamenial lung disorders it is commonly seen in females with pulmonary endometriosis right with pulmonary endometriosis so in these individuals they can have recurrent pneumothorax with every menstruation that is what is called catamenial lung disorders and how will you diagnose pneumothorax you will diagnose pneumothorax by doing a chest x-ray right you will diagnose pneumothorax by doing the chest x-ray so what will the chest x-ray show chest x-ray will show you the hyperlucent lung fields right chest x-ray will show you that there is hyperlucent lung fields 
and what will happen to the lung the lung will be collapsed and what will happen to the mediastinum the mediastinum or the trachea is shifted to opposite side and when you take a chest x ray in supine position when you take a chest x ray in supine position in patient with pneumothorax you have this classical deep sulcus sign you have this classical deep sulcus sign that is what you will get in the chest x ray of a patient with pneumothorax when you take a chest x ray in supine position what is deep sulcus sign it is nothing but abnormally radiolucent costophrenic sulcus right abnormally radiolucent costophrenic sulcus that is what is called the deep sulcus sign now one important question related to pneumothorax is which of the following statements about pneumothorax is true which which statement is a true statement anyone breath sounds are increased percussion note is decreased always need chest tube insertion often needs chest tube insertion yes so please remember in case of pneumothorax it is not always needs chest tube insertion right it is often needs chest tube insertion and percussion note what will happen it will be a hyper resonant note right hyper resonant note percussion note will be increased and what will happen to the breath sounds breath sounds are decreased or absent in case of pneumothorax okay and what is the differential diagnosis for your hyper resonant note differential diagnosis for hyper resonant note will be emphysema so even in case of emphysema you will have this hyper resonant note so please remember they don't always need chest tube insertion they often need chest tube insertion right why is that because if there is small pneumothorax you don't require to keep a chest tube right it will undergo self resolution and the next important topic next to your pleural disorders will be your respiratory failure that was about your pleural disorders pleural effusion and pneumothorax next important topic is the respiratory failure okay so we have four important types of respiratory failure now answer this question all of the following types of respiratory failure they are correctly matched except type 1 hypoxemic respir respiratory failure type 2 hypercapnic type 3 atelectasis type 4 perioperative rate, which is like incorrectly matched anyone right so the answer is type 4 type 4 it is not perioperative respiratory failure so type 4 is what it is secondary to a cardiogenic shock right it is secondary to cardiogenic shock and which is your perioperative respiratory failure then your perioperative respiratory failure it is nothing but type 3 respiratory failure so type 3 respiratory failure is your perioperative and in type 1 what will be the parameters there will be hypoxia and carbon dioxide levels they remain normal or they are reduced whereas in type 2 respiratory failure you will have hypoxia and there will be hypercapnia and type 3 and type 4 you will have the parameters similar to that of type 2 but only thing the etiology is different okay next now you see the next important clinical scenario in icu setting patients patient suffering from which of the following respiratory pathology is most predisposed for carbon dioxide narcosis motor neuron disease asthma emphysema bronchiectasis which of the following is most predisposed to carbon dioxide narcosis right so the patient who is more predisposed to carbon dioxide narcosis will be type 2 respiratory failure so among the options which has been given to you which one will cause type 2 respiratory failure that will be motor neuron disease so motor neuron disease you have type 2 respiratory failure okay right so that is about your the respiratory failure and i'll show you one x ray please tell me what is the diagnosis what are the chest x ray findings and what is the diagnosis in this chest x ray yes so this particular chest x ray it is suggestive of right it is suggestive of no 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 it is not hydronumothorax hydronumothorax you have that high horizontal line and they will have like succussion splash so this is suggestive of 
लोबार न्यूमोनिया दिस इज सजेस्टिव ऑफ लोबार न्यूमोनिया एंड वॉट इज द मोस्ट कॉमन ऑर्गेनिज्म दैट विल बी कॉजिंग लोबार न्यूमोनिया दैट इज यूर स्टेप्टोकोकस न्यूमोनिया दैट इज यूर स्टेप्टोकोकस न्यूमोनिया ओके राइट नेक्स्ट आई शो यू अनदर एक्स एंड वॉट विल बी द रेस्परेटरी साउंड ऑन ऑस्कल्टेटरी फाइंडिंग्स इन केस ऑफ लोबार न्यूमोनिया See on auscultation, the respiratory sounds that you will have is the bronchial breathing. And what type of bronchial breath sounds you will have in case of uh, lobar pneumonia? That is the tubular type of bronchial breath sound, right? Tubular type of bronchial breath sounds. And we have another form of bronchial breath sounds that is called bronchial breath sounds. Bronchial breath sounds you will have that over a cavity. And we have one more form of bronchial breath sounds. that is called amphoric breath sound amphoric breath sounds you will have that in case of tension pneumothorax in tension pneumothorax you have the amphoric breath sounds whereas in pneumonia what type of breath sounds you will have the tubular type of bronchial breath sounds you will have next i'll show you one more x-ray what are the chest x-ray findings and what is the diagnosis in this case okay yes now what are the abnormalities you are having you are having consolidation or you are having opacities but this particular opacities are not confined to one lobe you have right multiple opacities which are distributed throughout the lung multiple opacities which are distributed throughout the lung and where will you come across this you will come across this in case of bronchopneumonia and in case of bronchopneumonia what is the most common organism the most common organism that is causing bronchopneumonia will be your staph aureus okay next i show you one more x ray right so what are the chest x ray findings and what is the diagnosis in this case so if you observe the x ray carefully what is that particular pattern called as this pattern you have that lacy pattern and this we call it as the interstitial pattern and you will have this pattern in case of the interstitial pneumonia or atypical pneumonia and what are the organisms that will be causing interstitial pneumonia just remember this bacteria that is mlc mycoplasma legionella chlamydia right mycoplasma legionella chlamydia and all these viral infections they also cause the interstitial pneumonia right next then next what are the chest x ray findings and what is the diagnosis so now this particular patient presented with dry cough and he has exertional dyspnea and he is also hiv positive and his cd4 count is less than 200 what do you think is this x ray suggestive of so this particular patient the organism causing pneumonia will be that is pneumocystis gerovaci pneumonia pneumocystis gerovaci pneumonia in pneumocystis gerovaci pneumonia in early stages the chest x ray may be normal but as the severity increases there will be classical ground glass opacity right there will be classical ground glass opacity and in case of pneumocystis gerovaci pneumonia what is the drug of choice drug of choice will be trimethoprim and sulfamethoxazole and what is the investigation of choice you need to do bronchoscopy and bronchoalveolar lavage and in the bronchoalveolar lavage you need to pick up the organism and if you want to these patients they have like dry cough and if you want to induce the sputum you need to give hypertonic saline nebulization and after giving hypertonic saline nebulization you get the sputum and that sputum has to be stained and what is the stain we use gomori methanamine stain the stain what we use is gomori methanamine stain that is what we will use in case of the pneumocystis gerovaci pneumonia so these are some of the important points related to pneumonia and in the pneumonia the next important thing you need to know is the cvrt assessment score. that is curb 65 so curb 65 it is the assessment of cvrt risk in case of pneumonia please remember the name of the score that is curb 60 okay next 
then some important points related to the tuberculosis. So what are the various methods of the spread of tuberculosis? One is your droplet infection. So once the droplets, definitely it is the lungs that is the most common organ which is affected. But the question that will be asked is, what is the most common organ in extra pulmonary tuberculosis? What is the most common organ in extra pulmonary tuberculosis? In extra pulmonary tuberculosis, the most common organ will be the lymph nodes, followed by that pleura and followed by the genitourinary tuberculosis. For example, the individual has developed tuberculosis by ingestion. If the individual has developed tuberculosis by ingestion, what is the most common site of tuberculosis within the intestine? The most common site of tuberculosis within the intestine will be ileocecal tuberculosis. Right? The most common site may be ileocecal tuberculosis upon ingestion and vertical transmission. That tuberculosis can be spread even from mother to fetus. And within the baby, which organ is affected first? The organ which is affected first in the baby will be the liver. Okay. The GONS focus is formed in the liver of the baby during the intrauterine life. Then the tuberculosis can be spread even by direct contact. And this direct contact tuberculosis, what do we call this as? we call this as lupus vulgaris, right, which is nothing but skin tuberculosis, right, which is nothing but skin tuberculosis. So, these are the four methods of the spread of tuberculosis. And next important question that will be asked is, what will be the most common site of Bonds focus, okay. So, in primary tuberculosis, the most common site of Bonds focus will be Lower border of the upper lobe. Lower border of the upper lobe, that will be the most common site of Gons focus. And what will be the most common site of Gons focus in secondary tuberculosis? The most common site of Gons focus or the fibrotic lesion in the secondary tuberculosis will be at the apex of the lung. Now, this particular tubercular organism, it spreads to various parts of the body, right? Even within the lung, you have supraclavicular focus, you have infraclavicular focus. So, depending upon the spread, you have the GONS focus in multiple areas of the body. And accordingly, you need to know the names of these lesions. So, we have one particular lesion called pulse lesion. So, what is pulse lesion? It is supraclavicular focus right it will be supraclavicular focus of the chronic pulmonary tuberculosis what is asthma focus all these names are very very important that is infraclavicular focus and what is vigor focus it is the caseating metastatic focus in the wall of the pulmonary vein that is called Wiegert focus. Next is the Simon focus. What is Simon focus? It is the calcified focus of tuberculosis where in the apex. In the apex. And what is rich focus? It is the tubercular focus within the meningitis. That is tubercular meningitis. Right? Tubercular meningitis. And what is the name of the tubercular focus in the liver? That is called Simon's focus. Simon's focus, it is a tubercular focus in the liver. And what is the name of the focus in the joints? That is called Ponset's disease. So, these are the various uh, foci in case of tuberculosis. And you should diagnose this chest x ray. Can anyone tell me what is the diagnosis of this chest x ray? So, you can see the lesions. So, how are the lesions? These lesions, they are the size of the millet seeds. Very small, tiny lesions which are present throughout the lung fields. This is what is called the miliary tuberculosis. Right? Miliary tuberculosis. Okay? And this miliary tuberculosis will give you a classical snowstorm appearance. So, what are all the various conditions you will get this snowstorm appearance? You will get that in tuberculosis. 
silicosis, hemosiderosis, varicella zoster pneumonia, and then pulmonary alveolar proteinosis. These are all the conditions where you will have this miliary tuberculosis. Then, what is the investigation of choice in case of tuberculosis? Investigation of choice in case of tuberculosis will be the gene expert. Right? And this is also called CBNAT. What do you mean by the word CBNAT? CBNAT stands for cartridge based nucleic acid amplification test. The advantage of this CBNAT is that it will also tell you about multi drug resistant tuberculosis. Right? It will also tell you about multi drug resistant tuberculosis. Okay? Now, you should know what do you mean by the word multi drug resistant tuberculosis? Yes, any one of you, please. MDR-TB is defined as resistance to right so what is the correct answer here MDR-TB tells you it is resistance to isoniazid and as well as the rifampicin very good isoniazid and rifampicin okay next not only MDR-TB, like we have what is called XDR-TB. Right. The next important is the XDR-TB. That is, what is XDR-TB? XDR-TB stands for Extended Drug Resistant Tuberculosis. Yes, thank you very much, medical doctor. Right. So, what do you mean by the word Extended Drug Resistant Tuberculosis? Where the organism is resistant to isoniazid, rifampicin, quinolone, and one of the injectable agent. What is that injectable agent? Either capriomycin or canamycin or amicacin. That is what XDR TB, isoniazid, rifampicin, one quinolone, and one of the injectable second line agent. Okay. Then you should know. What are the genes which are being mutated for the development of this resistance? For rifampicin resistance, the gene which is being mutated is RPOB gene. For pyrazinamide resistance, the gene which is being mutated is the PNCA gene. And for INH resistance, the gene which is being mutated is the INH A gene. So, these are the gene mutations which are responsible for the development of resistance. Okay. And investigation of choice is what? Investigation of choice will be your CBNAT. It is not your sputum examination. Sputum examination, the sensitivity and specificity is less. And you should know what are the stains that we use for observing that bacilli. Can anyone tell me what is the name of the stains? What are the names of the stain? The name of this, we have two stains. One is your carbal fuchsin stain, which is nothing but your ZN stain or Zeal Nielsen stain. And the other one is the fluorochrome stain. And what is that fluorochrome stain? That particular fluorochrome stain is the ormine rhodamine stain. So these are the two important stains. Right. Thank you very much, uh, Nescafe Milk. Right. So these are the two important stains. And next important question is, see, you are very much aware of the first line antituberculous drugs and second line antituberculous drugs. But the question that will be asked for you is, what are the new drugs? The question that will be asked for you is, what are the new drugs? Yeah, anyone? What are the new drugs? So, the new drugs are like pre right? Pretominid, then bidaquiline, right? Bidaquiline, and then dilamanid. Okay, so these are the new drugs which are uh, given for the tuberculosis. Okay, right. So this finishes your pulmonology. The next important topic for our discussion will be. The connective tissue disorders. Hmm? The connective tissue disorders. Okay. Right. Uh, okay. This image has slightly overlapped the question and as well as options as well. But anyways, I'll read for you that. So, the question is, 32-year-old man, women, sorry, 
लॉन्ग स्टैंडिंग डायग्नोसिस ऑफ सिस्टमिक ल्यूपस एरिमेटोसिस इज इवेल्युएटेड बाई हर रोमेटोलॉजिस्ट एज ए रोटीन फॉलो ए न्यू मार्मर इज हर्ड एंड वेन इको कार्डियोग्राफी इज ऑर्डर्ड दिस विल बी द और दिस इज द इको कार्डियोग्राफिक फाइंडिंग एंड शी इज फीलिंग वेल नो फीवर नो वेट लॉस देर इज नो प्री एग्जिस्टिंग कार्डियक डिजीज ऑल्सो Which of the following statement is true? Which of the following statement is true? Blood cultures are unlikely to be positive. Glucocorticoid therapy have been proven to be uh, glucocorticoid therapy will improve this condition. Pericarditis is frequently presenting concomitant manifestation. The lesions they have low risk of embolization. so which of the following statements is true so can anyone tell me what is the diagnosis first of all what is the diagnosis so diagnosis in case of sle what are that you are observing here on the mitral valve you can observe that there are hyper intense lesion which are nothing but vegetations so what this individual has developed very good this individual has developed lipman sacks endocarditis and for lipman sacks endocarditis do we give steroids no for lipman sacks endocarditis the treatment will be valvuloplasty right the treatment will be valvuloplasty not glucocorticoids for pericarditis myocarditis we give glucocorticoid therapy but for endocarditis you need to do valvuloplasty and perica so your second option wrong and pericarditis it is not always a con a concomitant feature but whereas if you take what is the most common layer which is affected pericarditis is the most common manifestation in the cardiac involvement but it is not always frequently associated with the endocarditis and these individuals they have risk of embolization right so and what vegetations are these these vegetations they are sterile vegetations so that is the reason why blood cultures are unlikely to be positive so where will you have like uh, non sterile vegetations here non sterile vegetations you will see that in case of infective endocarditis right so here the answer is a blood cultures are unlikely to be positive that means the blood cultures will be negative because these are sterile vegetations okay and so what are the criteria for your sle the criteria for sle there are totally 11 criteria out of this 11 criteria four should be there right and the mnemonic is soap brain md so you can just remember it as you wash your brain with soap you will get an md seat okay so s stands for serositis that is your pleuritis or pericarditis o is oral ulcers a is arthritis but remember it is non erosive arthritis hmm? it is non erosive arthritis and p stands for photosensitivity this photosensitivity question has been asked recently in the inict exam b stands for blood disorders that is in the form of pancytopenia r stands for the renal involvement right that is lupus nephritis a stands for the anti nuclear antibody will be positive and that is the most sensitive antibody i stands for immunological uh, criteria that is anti smit and anti ds dna out of which which is most specific anti spit is most specific neurological involvement can be there in the form of seizures and psychosis and m stands for malar rash d stands for dyspoid rash okay and what is very very important in case of right what is very very important in case of the sle is antibodies so what is the most sensitive marker for sle that will be anti nuclear antibody and what is the most specific antibody that will be anti smith right that will be anti smith and drug induced sle what is the antibody that will be anti histone antibody and what is the antibody that is responsible for recurrent thrombus formation in sle causing recurrent abortions that will be anti phospholipid antibody syndrome and what is the antibody in sle that is responsible for psychosis that will be anti ribosomal p 
right anti ribosomal p and what is the antibody that is responsible for causing photosensitivity that is anti rho right and what is the antibody that is responsible for cns lupus the antibody that is responsible for cns lupus will be anti neuronal antibody right that will be anti neuronal antibody okay so that is about your sle and what is the drug of choice for sle in acute episodes that will be steroids right that will be steroids but steroids we don't give in all the forms of sle right the form of sle where we don't give steroids is endocarditis in lupus endocarditis we do valvuloplasty right we do valvuloplasty we don't give the steroids okay right so after having discussed about the sle which is one of the connective tissue disorder the next important connective tissue disorder is the ankylosing spondylitis yeah yes ankit pandey in pregnancy where there is recurrent abortions because of apla what we give is aspirin along with aspirin we also give anticoagulants that is low molecular weight heparin is given hmm? low molecular weight heparin and aspirin is given if there is development of the apla syndrome and if there is psychosis what we give for psychosis we give haloperidol right we give haloperidol and for photosensitivity what is that we will advise to the patient is sunscreen and we also give hydroxychloroquine right hydroxychloroquine okay so this will be the treatment in case of sle now after having discussed about the sle the next important topic in the connective tissue disorders will be ankylosing spondylitis so ankylosing spondylitis what is the hla in ankylosing spondylitis that will be hla b27 and in ankylosing spondylitis there are two important articular manifestations right the two important structures which are affected is the spine and the next important structure which is being affected will be the sacroiliac joint so these are the two important articular manifestations that you will see in patients with the ankylosing spondylitis okay and this ankylosing spondylitis it is a zero negative arthritis it is not zero positive it is zero negative arthritis and what are all the other conditions where you have hla b27 the other conditions where you will have hla b27 will be just remember this mnemonic pair right what will be this pair that is psoriatic arthritis ankylosing spondylitis then inflammatory bowel disease and then reiter syndrome or reactive arthritis hmm? reiter syndrome or reactive arthritis these are all the conditions where you will have hla b27 okay right then schober sign is used to evaluate so these individuals with ankylosing spondylitis there will be fusion of the vertebra right there will be fusion of the vertebra so when there is fusion of the vertebra the flexion of the lumbar spine is affected the flexion of the lumbar spine is being affected so to assess the flexion of the lumbar spine we need to do the schober sign okay and in these patients with ankylosing spondylitis not only the joint manifestations you also have extra articular manifestation so what are the extra articular manifestations in ankylosing spondylitis the extra articular manifestation the most common extra articular manifestation that will be in the form of anterior uveitis anterior uveitis is the most common extra articular manifestation okay then followed by that there will be lung involvement in the form of upper lobe fibrosis cardiac involvement will be there and this cardiac involvement is in the form of aortic regurgitation ischemic heart disease and third degree heart block and even there is spinal cord involvement in the form of cauda equina syndrome and git involvement will be there in the form of inflammatory bowel disease and skin involvement will be there in the form of psoriasis so this will be the extra articular manifestation in ankylosing spondylitis and when you do yes abraham that syllabus and the topics are uh, more or less same even for neat pg and as well as fmg so this particular revision will be enough even for neat pg or even fmg as well okay right i am trying to cover all the topics and that two important points in all the topics okay this will be more than enough even for your neat pg as well right next so coming to the x ray finding so x ray finding in the spine 
you will have the fusion of the vertebra and that will give you an appearance of the bamboo spine. And in the recent FMG exam, what they have asked you is about the dagger sign. What is this dagger sign? This particular dagger sign is due to ossification of the supraspinous and as well as the interspinous ligaments. Right? Super, su, supraspinous and interspinous ligaments. Okay? So, that is what is your dagger sign. Next. How will be the sacroiliac joint? There will be destruction of the sacroiliac joint because even that is also gone. Then coming to the treatment of ankylosing spondylitis. So what do you think is the first line treatment for ankylosing spondylitis? The first line treatment in ankylosing spondylitis will be the NSAIDs, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. And those individuals where there is no adequate response, right, where there is poor response to NSAIDs, right, where there is poor response to NSAIDs, there we give TNF-alpha inhibitors. So, NSAID resistant ankylosing spondylitis, we give this TNF-alpha inhibitor and we have some new drugs for ankylosing spondylitis. So, what are these new drugs for ankylosing spondylitis? That is interleukin 17A inhibitors and what will be that interleukin 17A inhibitors? That includes Secuki Numab and one more drug will be Ixeki Zumab. Okay, so these are the two important new drugs for your ankylosing spondylitis. Okay, so this finishes the ankylosing spondylitis. The next important topic is the rheumatoid arthritis. So, without discussing rheumatoid arthritis, your connective tissue disorders becomes incomplete. So, which of the following HLA association is specific to the rheumatoid arthritis? Any one of you? Very good. So, that will be the HLA DR4 association. HLA DR4 association. And one quick question in ankylosing spondylitis, which we missed is what is the cause of death in ankylosing spondylitis? What is the cause of death in ankylosing spondylitis? So, the cause of death in ankylosing spondylitis is the fracture of rigid osteoporotic spine. Right, the fracture of rigid osteoporotic spine. That will be the cause of death in patients with the ankylosing spondylitis. Please remember this. Next, coming to the rheumatoid arthritis. So, in rheumatoid arthritis, what is the HLA association? That is the HLA DR4 association. Okay. Next, then followed by that, in, in rheumatoid arthritis, what are very, very important that you need to remember is the deformities. So, in chronic cases of rheumatoid arthritis, the two important deformities is swanneck deformity and buttonhole deformity. In swanneck deformity, you will have the hyperextension of the PIP and there will be flexion of the DIP. And in buttonhole deformity or botanase deformity, it is exactly opposite. Where you have the hyperextension of the distal interpharyngeal joint. Okay. Then, now one important differential diagnosis. One important differential diagnosis for your swanneck deformity will be mallet finger deformity. So, mallet finger deformity is not seen in rheumatoid arthritis. So, this is due to rupture of extensor tendon. So, how will you differentiate that from swanneck deformity? In swanneck deformity, you will have hyperextension of proximal interphalangeal joint. But here, the proximal interphalangeal joint will be absolutely normal. Right? But here, the proximal interphalangeal joint will be absolutely normal you will have flexion of the distal interphalangeal joint. That is what is your mallet finger deformity. Okay, right. Then the other deformities are Z-line deformity and as well as the ulnar deviation. And in case of rheumatoid arthritis, please remember even the spine is also affected. The spine which is affected in case of rheumatoid arthritis will be C1 and C2 vertebra. Right, C1 and C2 vertebra. That is, atlanto-axial dislocation will be there in case of 
the rheumatoid arthritis and because of which the patient will present with spastic quadriparesis. Okay. Then, in case of rheumatoid arthritis, do you have extra articular manifestations? Yes, there is also extra articular manifestation. What are what will be the most common extra articular manifestation? The most common extra articular manifestation will be the presence of nodules or the extensor surface of the forearm, and this will be non tender. And you have many other extra articular manifestations. And what will be the other extra articular manifestations within the eye? There can be development of jaw grins and scleritis. Within the lung, there can be development of pleural effusion, interstitial lung disease. Within the heart, there can be pericarditis, myocarditis and endocarditis. And the most common valve that can be affected is mitral valve causing mitral degurgitation. And kidney involvement will be in the form of membranous glomerulopathy. Endocrine involvement will be in the form of hypogonadism. Skin involvement will be in the form of rheumatoid nodules. And even the cervical spine is affected, that is cervical myelopathy. Hematological manifestation will be in the form of normocytic, normochromic type of anemia. Right? So, this will be the extra articular manifestation. And you should know what is the cause of death in these individuals. The cause of death in patients with rheumatoid arthritis, that will be the coronary artery disease. Okay? Next, you see the next question here. A 45 year old coal mine worker presents with cutaneous nodules, joint pain and occasional cough with dyspnea. Chest radiograph shows multiple small nodules in bilateral lung fields. Some of the nodules shows cavitation and specks of calcification. Most likely these features are diagnostic of. Very good. That is your Kaplan syndrome. So what is Kaplan syndrome? Kaplan syndrome is nothing but rheumatoid arthritis plus coal workers pneumoconiosis. Right? Rheumatoid arthritis plus coal workers pneumoconiosis. And you should know finally, what is the investigation of choice in case of rheumatoid arthritis? Anyone of you? What is the investigation of choice in case of rheumatoid arthritis? Investigation of choice in rheumatoid arthritis will be anti-CCP. Right? That is anti-cyclic citrullinated polypeptide. That will be the investigation of choice. And when you take an x-ray of these joints, when you take x-ray of these joints, that will show you that there is periarticular osteopenia. Right? Periarticular osteopenia. It is not rheumatoid factor. Rheumatoid factor is non-specific. Right? That is not the investigation of choice. Investigation of choice will be anti-CC. Okay? Right. So, periarticular osteopenia is the X-ray findings that you will see in patients with the rheumatoid arthritis. And finally, you should know what is the drug of choice for rheumatoid arthritis. What is the drug of choice for rheumatoid arthritis? That will be methotrexate. Right? Methotrexate will be the drug of choice. Okay? Right. So, that is about your rheumatoid arthritis. The next important connective tissue disorder, that will be Behcet's syndrome. Now, Behcet's, you need to know very, very important question. All of the following are the features of Behcet syndrome, except which of the following is not the features of the Behcet? Which of the following is not the features of the Behcet? Recurrent after stomatitis, multi system involvement seen only in tropics, common in youngsters. So, Behcet, yes. Seen only in tropics is an incorrect statement. It is seen both in tropical and subtropical countries as well. Right? Tropical and subtropical countries. And what is the hallmark of the Behcet's? The hallmark of the Behcet's is there will be recurrent after stomatitis. Multi-system involvement will be there in this Behcet's also. And it is very common in the youngsters. And what is another name for Behcet's? The another name for Behcet's is Oroculogenital syndrome. Right? The another name will be oroculogenital syndrome. Okay. And the age group at which you see this biceps, it is commonly seen in youngsters. That is around the age group of 20 to 30 years. And I said you already they have HLA association. 
So, what are the HLA associations? That will be HLA B5 and HLA B51. That is what you will see in case of biceps. And in which country you will see this biceps most commonly? Most commonly, it is seen in Turkey. Right? Most commonly, you see this in Turkey. And what are the characteristic manifestations we have discussed? That is aphthous ulceration. So, this aphthous ulceration is the hallmark or sine qua non for the diagnosis of biceps. And whenever the ulcers appear, they are almost 3 to 5 in number. And it is recurrent ulcers. And this ulcers in the mouth, that will be the earliest manifestation. And they are very painful ulcers, right? They are very painful ulcers, okay, right? And how will you diagnose these biceps? In the biceps, the pathology test will be positive, right? The pathology test will be positive in case of biceps. And how do you treat these biceps? One is your colchicin and then you can give topical steroids. Topical steroids, they will reduce that mucocutaneous finding. And the other one is the epremilast. Epremilast is what? It is a selective phosphodiesterase 4 inhibitor. Right? Selective phosphodiesterase 4 inhibitor. And it is FDA approved for the treatment of the oral ulcers in case of the biceps. Right? Which is nothing but orooculo genital syndrome. Okay? So, this completes the discussion of some important topics in the connective tissue disorders. Right? So, with this, I will wind up this session. Nephrology is there, gastroenterology is there. I will discuss this nephrology and gastroenterology in some other time. In this two or three days, I will discuss even nephrology and gastroenterology. But except for nephrology and gastroenterology, this completes the discussion and you just revise these notes. That will be more than enough for your FMG exam. Right? So with this, I will wind up this session. Please give me your feedbacks on my Instagram handle. And my Instagram handle will be the Rajesh Gubba right and the annotation notes with annotations will be available on my instagram handle that is rajesh Bhupa, right so thank you very much and i wish you all the best for your exam within another two three days i will revise your nephrology and as well as gastroenterology as well thank you very much see you again